afternoon and welcome to our June 27th board business meeting. Welcome to our board members, MCPS staff, and members of our community who are joining us here in person and those who are watching this meeting via live stream. Now let us begin by standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I will call the roll to recognize board members and establish that we have a quorum. Starting with Mr. Kim. Good afternoon, Arvind Kim, student member. Good afternoon, everyone. Lynn Harris, I use she, her pronouns. And this is our last meeting with our 45th student member of the board, Mr. Kim. It's been a privilege to sit next to you this year. I will miss you. And I also want to say hello to our 46th student member of the board, Sammy Saeed, who is with us. Good afternoon, Shepherd Evans, District 4. And I'll save my comments for Mr. Kim for the swearing in. Good afternoon, Brenda Wolf, District 5. I too will wait. Good afternoon, Buenas tardes, Grace Rivera Oven, uh, District 1. Good afternoon, Julie Yang, District 3. Now we can begin the meeting with the approval of the agenda. Can I get a motion? So moved. Second. All in favor, raise your hands. And that's unanimous. Okay. Now we're going to move on to agenda item number three, human resources and development uh, recommended appointments. Dr. McKnight. Thank you. So today we do have a number of recommended appointments. And the first appointment up is appointment of Ms. Pamela B. Wheeler Taylor as Chief Safety Officer in the Office of the Chief Operating Officer. Ms. Wheeler Taylor comes to Montgomery County Public Schools with more than 33 years of experience in law enforcement and youth and family engagement. She looks forward to working with stakeholders to support a safe, equitable, and productive learning environment for all students, their families, and employees in all MCPS schools and facilities. She would also like to give a shout out to her mother, Barbara Wheeler, who is watching online. Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hands. And that is unanimous. Thank you. Our next appointment is appointment uh, for Ms. Margarita Borquez as a director in the International Admissions and Enrollment in the Office of Wellbeing, Learning, and Achievement in the Office of the Deputy Superintendent. Ms. Borquez has been employed with MCPS for 25 years as an English for Speakers of Other Languages teacher, English for Speakers of Other Languages resource teacher, instructional specialist, and most recently as supervisor in the International Admissions and Enrollments Office. She looks forward to continuing her work with the International Admissions and Enrollment Office. Shout out to her um, many family members who she thanks and the International Admissions and Enrollment Office and Potter for their support. Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hands. And that's unanimous. Our next appointment is appointment of Mrs. Tamara Hewlett in, as the director in the Department of English Learners and Multilingual Education in the Office of the Chief Academic Officer in the Office of the Deputy Superintendent. Joining her today is her husband, Ira, and her children, Zaire, Zion, and Zen. Mrs. Hewlett has been employed with NCPS for 17 years as a teacher, staff development teacher, instructional specialist, curriculum specialist, coordinator, and most recently as supervisor for English, elementary English for speakers of other languages. Mrs. Hewlett looks forward to continuing to serve in the Department of English Learners and Multilingual Education in order to support and elevate the promise of our linguistically gifted students who are adding English to their linguistic repertoire. Shout out to her sister, Tanya, and her mother who are back at home in the Virgin Islands and viewing online. She would also like to thank her family, friends, and a few of her mentors and teams who've been instrumental in her leadership growth. Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hands. And that's unanimous. Congratulations and thank you. Next appointment is appointment for Mrs. Jewel A. Sanders 
as a director in the Office of School Support and Wellbeing in the Office of the Deputy Superintendent. Mm -hmm. Joining her today is her husband, Demetrius, son, Miles, daughters, Jada and Gia, her mother, Joyce Hill, and her sister, Tracy Mickens Hudley. Ms. Sanders has been employed with MCPS for 24 years as an English teacher, English resource teacher, staff development teacher, assistant principal, and most recently as principal at Rosa Parks Middle School. She looks forward to joining the Office of School Support and Wellbeing to support school communities and their impact on student achievement and well-being. Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hands. <laughs> That's unanimous. Thank you. Our next appointment is appointment of Mrs. Stephanie D. Brandt as a director in pre-K through 12 curriculum operations and support in the Office of Curriculum and Instructional Programs in the Chief Academic Officer's Office in the Office of the Deputy Superintendent. Joining her today, she is with her husband, Damien, and children, Aiden and Isabella. Mrs. Brand has been employed with MCPS for 16 years as an assistant principal, principal intern, and most recently as principal at Woodfield Elementary School. Mrs. Brandt looks forward to joining the Office of Curriculum and Instructional Programs in the critical work that they do for our school system. Shout outs to those joining online, specifically her parents, family, colleagues, and friends who have made her the leader that she is today. Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hands. And that's unanimous. Yeah. Thank you. Next up, we have appointment of Dr. Joel Beidelman as principal of Paint Branch High School. Joining him today are his sons, Dylan, a graduate of Sherwood High School, and Dean, a junior at James Hubert Blake High School. Dr. Beidelman has been employed with MCPS for 16 years as a teacher, assistant principal, principal intern, and most recently as principal of William Farquhar Middle School. Dr. Bottleman is excited to join the Paint Branch community where his varied experiences will add value to the community he is so eager to serve. Move approval, very proudly. All in favor, raise your hand. And that's unanimous. Thank you. And our final appointment today is we are bringing forward Mrs. Michelle Fortune as principal of Snowden Farm Elementary School. Joining her today is her husband, Mickey, and daughters, Ileana and Zara. Mrs. Fortune has been employed with MCPS for 20 years as a special education teacher, content specialist, assistant principal, and most recently as principal of Benjamin Banneker Middle School. Mrs. Fortune looks forward to joining the Snowden Farm community. Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hands. And that's unanimous. Congratulations, that completes the appointments. Agenda item number four, recognitions. Dr. McKnight. Our first recognition is recognition of distinguished Hispanic scholars. The Hispanic Alliance for Education recognizes Hispanic high school seniors who have been identified as distinguished Hispanic scholars through academic achievement, community engagement, and leadership. The Hispanic Alliance for Education has awarded scholarships to 27 distingu distinguished Hispanic scholars from our 26 high schools and John L. Gilner Regional Institute for Children and Adolescents in Montgomery County Public Schools. MCPS honors and supports the many contributions of Hispanic American students to our schools, our community, our state, and our country. The Montgomery County Board of Education celebrates MCPS for holding a high standard of academic excellence and recognizing the outstanding achievements of Hispanic American students. Now, therefore, be it resolved that on behalf of the superintendent of schools, staff members, students, and parents and guardians of MCPS, the members of the Montgomery County Board of Education would like to congratulate the recipients of the 2023 Distinguished Hispanic Scholars Award. Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hands. And that's unanimous with those present. 
Thank you. And I see some of our staff who are supporting our students in those scholarships are standing. Thank you for being here. And our students uh, who received the scholarships names are also up on the screen. So if we could just please make sure we note them. And if you know them, yes. personally congratulate them. But students, we are extremely proud of you. Our next recognition is uh, recognizing Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity Incorporated Scholars. The Gaithersburg Rockville Alumni in Maryland, Alumni Chapter of Cap Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity Incorporated, Kappa Youth and Community Foundation has awarded eight scholarships to Montgomery County Public School students. The Gaithersburg Rockville Alumni Chapter of Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity Incorporated, Kappa Youth and Community Foundation's primary focus is to provide opportunities for young black or African American students who dream of going to college a reality. The Gaithersburg Rockville Alumni Chapter of Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity is committed to providing encouragement and support to young black or African American students so that they may see a future for themselves, which includes a college education. The Montgomery County Board of Education is proud that MCPS continues to celebrate the many accomplishments of its diverse student body and its community partners. Now, therefore, be it resolved that on behalf of the superintendent of schools, staff members, students, and parents and guardians of MCPS, the Montgomery County Board of Education congratulates the class of 2023 Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity Incorporated Kappa Youth and Community Foundation Scholarship recipients. And Move the recipients approval. are on oh, the sorry. screen. I'm sorry. <laughs> Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hands. And that is unanimous with those present. Thank you. And congratulations to those students who are scholarship recipients. Our next recognition is recognition of the National Association of the Advancement of Colored People Scholarship Award winners. The Montgomery County branch of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People awarded at its annual Freedom Fund Dinner 27 $1,000 scholarships to Montgomery County Public School students. The National Association for the Advancement of Colored People selected This is Power as the theme of its 48th Freedom Fund Dinner held on Sunday, May 21, 2023, to recognize black or African American students for their positive contributions to our schools and community. MCPS recognizes and celebrates its students' academic excellence and community service achievements that make a difference to our county, our state, and our country. The Montgomery County Board of Education takes great pride that MCPS honors the many contributions of black or African American students. Now, therefore, be it resolved that on behalf of the superintendent of schools, staff members, students, and parents and guardians of MCPS, the members of the Montgomery County Board of Education would like to congratulate this year's National Association for the Advancement of Colored People Scholarship Award winners. And their names are indicated on the screen as well. Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hands. And that's unanimous. Congratulations to our students. And our final recognition is recognition of our Maryland Vietnamese Mutual Association Scholars. The Maryland Vietnamese Mutual Association, also known as the Association of Vietnamese Americans, awarded $1,000 scholarships at the 32nd Annual Academic Award Ceremony held on Sunday, June 4th, 2023, to two Montgomery County Public School students for their excellent academic performance, outstanding leadership skills, and stellar community involvement. The Association of Vietnamese Americans for the past 35 years has recognized outstanding Vietnamese American students attending MCPS to assist Vietnamese American students in achieving their higher educational goals. Montgomery County celebrates the many accomplishments of Vietnamese American students. The Montgomery County Board of Education is proud that Montgomery County Public Schools continues to recognize the academic achievements of Vietnamese American students. Now, therefore, be it resolved that on behalf of the superintendent of schools, staff members, students, and parents and guardians of MCPS, the members of the Montgomery County Board of Education would like to congratulate the recipients of the 2023 Association of Vietnamese Americans Academic Awards and Scholarships. And our students are noted there on the screen as well, also with their schools indicated. And we are so proud of all of our students who have received scholarships and are preparing for the next phase of their lives. Agreed. Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hands. And that's unanimous. Thank you. Our next agenda item is public comments. Public comments is one of our opportunities to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. 
Board members will take your comments into consideration, but it is not our practice to take action at this time on issues that are raised. We encourage public input on policy, program, and practices. This is not the proper avenue to address specific student or employee matters, so we encourage everyone to utilize existing avenues of redress for complaints. This is a public meeting, and we expect the conduct of all speakers and members of the audience to be within the bounds of proper etiquette. Inappropriate personal remarks, rude retorts, and other such behaviors out of order and will not be tolerated. Those who demonstrate disruptive or disbehave, disrespectful behavior during public comments may be asked to leave the room. Please check our website for information about upcoming board meetings, hearings, and work sessions, including any changes to our meeting start times. We have 15 people that have signed up to provide in-person testimony. Each speaker will receive two minutes for comments. When your name is called, please approach the table, speak clearly and directly into the microphone. 30 seconds prior to the expiration of a speaker's time, a yellow light will go on accompanied by a beep. A red light and a buzzer signal that your time has expired. Please push the flat button below the microphone to turn it on and begin speaking. Push the same button once more at the sound of the buzzer to turn it off. In addition to our in-person speakers today, we have one person signed up to provide audio testimony and four people signed up to provide video testimonies. We will play these submissions once the in-person testimonies have concluded. Copies of the testimonies can be found on board docs where they are posted with other materials for this meeting. So we will have the first three speakers please come forward to the table. Johanna Halu, Christine Handy, and Laura Stewart. Johanna Halu. Johanna H A I L U. Carmela, you may begin. Hello, um, my name is Harmela Johannes. Um, I'm a recent college graduate and a member of the young adult community in the Montgomery County area. Um, I am a Christian. I'm a follower of Christ. I'm an ambassador of Christ and his coming kingdom. And I'm here to challenge you guys to let you know that your authority is indeed asserted by God and God alone. And I'm here to challenge you guys to say that what the decision that we make about what children get to hear and at the age that they're introduced to certain things before, you know, developmentally, they can decide what they truly believe. Uh, those decisions, they are in your hands and it will be accounted for from your life. It will be accounted for these decisions that you make. So I'm here to urge you guys saying that your authority indeed comes from God. And I want you guys to, to consider that, right? Uh, you have a responsibility to the community. Um, the immigrant community, I am an immigrant. A child of immigrant parents, they don't know about how they can make their voice heard. Um, they don't know exactly what you know. What are the specific steps? But this is indeed what they believe, and that's what all those people outside are there to speaking about and protesting for. Um, so I'm urging you that that there is a community out there that is not represented rightly. Um, but I'm here telling you this is what they believe. Um, and I'm urging you saying that your authority comes from God. Consult God. Consult God because it can be taken away by God because it was given by God. Um, so that's all I wanted to say. Thank you so much for hearing me. Thank, Thank you. you. Christine Handy. Stay here. Good afternoon. 
As the president of MACAP, I sit here before you today for the purpose of advocating for the well-being and safety of our schools. Incidents at some of our elementary schools this year have caused concern amongst our dedicated leaders who have expressed worry about their personal safety. For example, a male parent invaded the personal space of a female principal in a threatening manner and had to be banned from the property. And in future interactions, she had to call her cluster security leader to assist when this parent was picking up his child. Another female assistant principal was threatened by a male parent who noted, I know that you work late. We have witnessed a rise in disgruntled or irate parents and community members who have displayed increasingly aggressive behavior towards our staff, especially our school leaders. Currently, we have full-time security assistants in place in our middle and high schools. Our 136 elementary schools do not have security assistants. While roving security assistants and cluster leaders occasionally visit these schools to conduct checks in areas and address areas of concern, I am deeply concerned about the safety of our staff members at certain elementary schools. MCPS has recently added 10 additional security assistants to the operating budget, although it remains unclear where they will be assigned. I strongly advocate for a portion of these new security personnel to be allocated to certain elementary schools. Our teachers and staff strive to provide a secure and nurturing learning environment for our students. However, their ability to do so is compromised when they feel threatened or unsafe. It is imperative that we prevent our schools from becoming places where visitors can intimidate or endanger our dedicated staff members. Therefore, MACAP urges MCPS to conduct a study of elementary schools and what measures are in place to keep the students and staff safe in this study. In this study, I want you to consider the voices of our elementary school-based leaders to assess their safety and security needs. Thank you. Thank you. Laura Stewart. My name is Laura Stewart, a member of the new Coalition for Inclusive Schools and Communities. This coalition of allies and the LGBTQ plus community came together after the last BOE meeting because we realized how harmful this debate had become to our MCPS families, staff, Board of Education members, and community members. Yet MCPS has a wide breadth of support in Montgomery County for inclusive texts. This was shown by the community's outpouring of support for the letter of support for MCPS's inclusive curriculum that an MCPS student leader and alum will read today. In 10 days, we now have over 2,200 signers, 90% from Montgomery County. We realize that allies must get more involved because some LGBTQ plus members who have been doing the heavy lifting for many years have been worn down by aggressive forces strategically spreading disinformation about MCPS policy from outside the county. After respectful conversation we had at the last rally with a leader from out of state, a video of it was retweeted by Elon Musk and it became a political target. Several LGBTQ plus activists and families have reached out to me about being uncomfortable with how heated the debate have, has become. One had their car vandalized here in the parking lot during the rally last two weeks ago, so they stayed home today. And another stayed in their car last time because of intimidation that had previously occurred. And another decided to mo remove their name from the sign-on letter due to safety concerns for them and their children. Moms for Liberty is active here and has been labeled a hate group. Yet I have had respectful conversations with families about this issue. I have empathy for all families that worry about their children's well-being and only want the best for them. I hope we can work together to increase engagements with MCPS about curriculum, something that the MCCPTA Curriculum Committee has advocated for in the last year. Thank you. Thank you. If we could have the next three speakers please come to the table. That's Zainab Chaudhry, John Gear Baig, and Ali El Koshari. Sign up, you may begin. 
Good afternoon, Dr. McKnight, members of the Montgomery County Public Schools Board of Edu Education. I don't need to reintroduce myself. You all know who I am. I have been here before. You know very well which organization I represent. Outside, there are over 1,000 parents in the pouring rain demonstrating families, not just parents, also children, demonstrating for their right to be able to have a say in when and how children are exposed to content that conflicts with their sincerely held religious beliefs. Here within your own body, within the Board of Education members, Members, there have been comments made, including by Ms. Lynn Harris, that have directly affected and hurt many members of what not just within the Muslim community, but also interfaith communities that have been working to restore opt-out within MCPS. This is the only school system that my organization knows of in the entire country that has created such sweeping policies by revoking opt-out that affect every single child within the school system. Even states like California that have very liberal school systems, every single school system to our knowledge in California currently allows opt-out. And the, the de debate here in Montgomery County has become so heated and so contentious with different forces, with political agendas who are trying to pit communities against one another and fuel culture wars, and it's created an unsafe climate for people on both sides of the divide. The way that you have been handling the situation is reprehensible. It is absurd, and elected officials who have a right, who have a responsibility to represent the interests of all of your diverse communities, must acknowledge that the only way that we can move forward and make sure that every community's interest and well-being is represented and acknowledged within the school system is by restoring opt-out. In the testimony that you have before me, which I have deviated from because there's a lot of stuff that needs to be said, and the only way it seems that we are able to say this is through these public comment hearings because our request for meetings has gone unheard. If you listen, if you read this testimony, we, we are receiving an uptick in the number of cases of children who are being bullied and harassed within the Muslim community and other communities. And hearing the testimony previously, these are children on both sides that are being affected. Thank you. Thank you. So I urge you to consider the testimony and to restore opt-out so we can have some semblance of peace and calm within our county. Thank you. Our next speaker, John Gear Baig. Hi, um, my name is Zion Baig. I've been here a long time. I've been, I've been here since this first happened, the opt-out. I've been here since day one, and I'm going to be here till the opt-out is back. Uh, we've had this issue in our country arise many times. We had this happen in the 20s, the 50s, the 70s. It goes to the Supreme Court. And in the end, opt-out is restored. Roe v. Wade, uh, we, could talk, we could talk about all those cases, but in the end, the religious right was restored. I mean, look, I know you all don't have the same mind, but obviously you know who on your board has been saying what. It's reprehensible. How can you say that? How can somebody come out here and look, I see the Latino community, I see a lot of communities represented here except for ours, the Muslim community. But that's not your fault, that's, that's a vote. But what about talking to you guys? When do you talk to us? We heard about a couple phone calls, a couple phone calls lately, but before that, wasn't nobody coming to ask about us? It's 100,000 of us in this community. Where were y'all at? Y'all don't talk to us. You only talk to your own people. And, and look, I know, you know, nowadays, even in Ohio, they talk about calling the FBI. Look, you, you know what happens with us. It's not, a, it's not a secret. You know, they got special places for Muslims where they're going to take us. So call them. Tell them Zion Beg is waiting at his house for the FBI. Whoever you want to call, I'm not worried about it. I'm going to be here for my kid. This is my kid. And you're going to make us take this all the way to the Supreme Court when you don't already know what happened at the Supreme Court. Every time we go to Supreme Court, they restore the religious right. Opt out is that inclusion. You telling me, I talked to the vice president of the Montgomery County Council. He told me, if the argument is, which is, which is what I hear after every meeting from a certain member of the board, you know who it is, spreading dogma, this, that, that type of talk. They told me, if that's the argument, that that child is going to be sad because your child walks out. He said, that's not an argument because he got some sense in him. He knows that's not an argument. That's not an argument. See, look, when my kids are arguing over something, I say, you can have this toy, you can have that toy. And he said, no, I want his toy. I say, you can't have his toy. That's what opt out is. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Ali El Kashari. Good afternoon. Hey, there you go. You're good, you're good. You're good. Good. good afternoon. My name is Ali El Kashari. So many people like me are watching you, Dr. McKnight. You have spoken so eloquently on so many occasions, and we are watching to see how this board handles this dispute. You are, in essence, community leaders, and leadership is, above all, 
about influence and it is difficult to persuade and build a community if you don't possess skills that inspire confidence from your community. Leadership is more than just being about book smart. It's about possessing the emotional intelligence it takes to work effectively through disagreements. Being able to negotiate and mediate effectively is crucial to anybody that hopes to buy in from their community and it starts with empathy. Our interfaith community is asking you to listen to our position with empathy. Although some of you may oppose our position, I request that you view our arguments in their best light, not to block us out simply as opposition. We are, inter we are interfaith community, we are your neighbors, we are your coworkers, and we are your friends. We will be watching how you respond to the tens of intelligent and heartfelt testimonies that came before you. We will be watching how you respond to nearly a thousand community members that are currently outside who have taken the time from their work to come for this opt out. We will be watching how you respond to the numerous written requests that have been submitted to your office for this opt out. You as community leaders have to ensure that our voices are not trampled on because they are not in line with the dominant narrative. It doesn't require you to agree with us or share our perspective. It does require you to spend a few moments in our shoes, learning about our point of view. With reasonable, emotional, intelligent leadership, we can find a way for the coexistence of varied points of view in Montgomery County. This dispute and how you handle it will ultimately determine the legacy you leave at MCPS. Thank you. Thank you. If we could get our next three speakers to please come forward. Salim Peter, Samira Hussein, and Saida Wasti. Before I walk out, I do just want to say that all we, of us are sitting calmly thank around you. the table. And there are people outside Thank you. They are not hateful people. They are not hateful Thank you for people, your comment. And their voices matter. Thank you. Salim Peter, you may begin. Thank you. I'm Salim Peter, a concerned parent of elementary and middle school students in Montgomery County. I urge you to restore transparency and parental right by restoring opt-out option. Parents have the right to decide on the values and teachings they impart to their children while Inclusivity is important. It's equally crucial to respect and accommodate the cultural and religious values of diverse families. Introducing sexual behavior and preference at an early age raises legitimate concern for us parents. Parents should have the freedom to decide when and how they address those topics based on our cultural, religious, and personal beliefs. School must be sensitive to this varying perspective, creating an environment where children are not distressed or conflicted by conflicting messages. The mental health and well-being of all students must be considered. In certain, if a certain curriculum content causes anxiety or conflict for children, it's vital to address those concerns and find the balance that respects the value and beliefs of different families. Removing the opt-out option in the name of inclusivity is not that option. If you ask me, it's misguided and defeats its purpose. Teaching children about sexual behavior contradicts the culture and religious beliefs on, for some parents who advocate, dis, advocate discussing sexual and at a certain age. Is the board implying that there is no space for my children where they can be themselves, freely embrace their beliefs? Uh, Without being shamed, are you suggesting public school is not unsuitable for parents and children who prefer not to discuss sex and sexuality during elementary or middle school? I'm asking you, do we not have space? Are we not being heard? Aren't you hearing the cultural values? This is a question I leave with us. Thank, Thank you. you. Samira Hussein, your mic on. Can you please turn your mic on? Good afternoon, uh, Dr. McKnight, Ms. Silverstreet, and uh, ladies and gentlemen around the board and, and the audience. 
Um, my name is Samira Hussein, and I'm a community advocate and a, a former for um, students of MCBS. Uh, today, June the 27th, is the holiest day of the year for Muslims. It's the day of mercy and forgiveness. It precedes the biggest holiday of the year, the Feast of Sacrifice, Eid al-Adha. Muslims around the world, including in America, we honor by donating meat and gifts to needy families. We fast, everybody's outside this fasting, and we get together to celebrate with our families and friends. Why I'm saying this? Because it's very similar to Yom Kippur, Christmas Eve, and, uh, um, I'm sorry, uh, Christmas Eve and um, Easter. All our religions from one God, no discrimination. Why I'm saying this? An April Board of uh, Education meeting was also scheduled on the day of Eid, the evening, in the last day of Ramadan. So I'm hoping that we have some considerations in the future to take care of this part. I'm talking about uh, safety, uh, following up with Ms. Handy, what she uh, brought up, safety of student, uh, safety of, of staff, but I'm talking about safety for students. I happened to be in one of the schools as a six-year-old refugee was brought to the principal's office and I was asked to, to, if I spoke his language. Well, basically what I found that he was uh, kicking and he was, with the little English that he spoke, I found that he hides under the table. Why? Being a refugee myself and a, a product of survivor of wars, I knew that the loudspeakers and the noise were the warning for uh, war and uh, warning for, um, you know, uh, emergency. So, sorry. Thank you. You have Happy my full, uh, Thank you. Martin, is, safety is a big concern to me for all the kids. Thank, Thank you. you. Saeed Wasti, you may begin. Hi, my name is Sayeda, and I am a Muslim parent. I have an 11-year-old son who had to be removed from public school due to bullying, and he was a gifted student. I want to mention here. After reporting the cases to the school principal and board of education and not getting any results, we decided to take our son out of his school and homeschool him last year. We are fortunate enough to homeschool our son, but there are many parents who can't homeschool their kids, and I am here for them today. I'm afraid to say that we are failing as a society where we are concerned about serving one community's emotional and physical well-being while ignoring the same needs for the other communities. We have kids that are being bullied by students and staff for standing up for their religious beliefs. Every single child deserves to feel safe, respected, valued, and seen. MCPS celebrate Pride Month. You accept people beliefs about their gender identity, but then why do you marginalize other for their religious beliefs? This is oppression and it will not be tolerated. MCPS must be better than that. I strongly urge you to allow the opt out. It is the only way to ensure the first amendment of our constitution is respected for all students and families in our school system. Please make schools welcoming environment for all kids. Please teach kids to think, not what to think. Thank you. Thank you. Our next three speakers are Jocelyn Geyer, Jeffrey Gans, and Fasika Damtu. And Jocelyn, you may begin. Hi, my name is Jocelyn Geyer. Just push the mic. Hi, my name is Jocelyn Geyer. I'm the mom of four kids. With my husband, I have 35 years of MCPS experience between us. I'm here today because of my concern about the safety of our LGBTQ students, and this is personal for me. In 2018, my older daughter, who is transgendered, was subjected to vicious, vicious bullying. MCPS responded, thank you, um, and they expelled the bully. But that wasn't the end of it. He returned, he illegally re-entered school grounds trying to find her for revenge. When he couldn't find her, he instead followed her best friend home, a friend who was also transgendered. He chased to this child and ultimately physically assaulted them. A crowd of other students joined in, they danced around, they laughed, 
They shouted anti-trans slurs, and they videotaped it so they could put it on social media. So yes, I am very concerned. I am beyond concerned about student safety as this ugly, ugly debate intensifies. It is sending an extraordinarily damaging message to our LGBTQ kids that their very existence, and you pick the word, is so, it's complicated, it's controversial, it's against God, it's sinful, I don't know what the word is, you pick the word. But that message is extraordinarily damaging to them. And apparently so much so that MCPS is supposed to sanction it when parents want to protect their children from the reality that my daughter exists, she exists. If this were truly about teaching kids at too young an age about sex, then I would get it, but it's not. The book Prince and Knight is no more about gay sex than Cinderella and Snow White are about heterosexual sex. So I want to thank you for the position that you've taken so far and urge you to stand strong against the request that you sanction a deeply stigmatizing policy. Thank you. Jeffrey Gans, you may begin. Good afternoon. Today I come before you not only as a concerned citizen, but also as an MCPS graduate, an MCPS parent, and a proud gay man. My purpose here is to advocate keeping the current inclusive policy regarding the English arts curriculum and the LGBTQIA books. I urge you not to allow an opt-out policy, recognizing the significance of an inclusive educational environment that embraces diversity and fosters acceptance is crucial. Those advocating for an opt-out policy often claim to do so on religious grounds or in the name of family values. Some argue that their children are not mature enough to be exposed to these books, and they assert that their stance does not come from a place of hate. However, I must call out this assertion as baseless. Some organizations supporting the opt-out policy have been designated as hate groups by the Southern Poverty Law Center. Moreover, during the last board meeting, I was taken aback by protesters chanting, protect our kids. Protect them from what or who, I ask. Interestingly, both sides were chanting, protect our kids, but with completely different meanings. And I was also notified today that these supposedly not hateful groups are outside pushing and shoving people as they were coming into the room this afternoon. If an opt-out policy is allowed, where will it end? Will these same groups start advocating for opting out of classes taught by gay teachers? Or worse yet, will they push for a parental rights and education bill similar to the one in Florida? We cannot risk the erosion of an inclusive education system based on individual comfort zones. Education is about preparing our youth for the diverse world they will inherit. Providing comprehensive and inclusive education does not infringe on personal beliefs, rather is a crucial step towards creating a more compassionate and accepting society. It ensures that all students including LGBTQIA plus youth feel safe, seen, and celebrated. To those advocating for an opt-out policy, I can assure you with absolute certainty that I'm not gay because of a book. I'm not gay because I interacted with a gay classmate or engaged in a conversation about being gay. I am gay because I was born this way. And I don't know of any LGBTQIA plus individual who can attribute their identity to anything other than being born that way. I implore you to maintain the inclusive curriculum without an opt-out policy, guaranteeing every child, regardless of their orientation, and gender identity can grow and learn in an inclusive and supportive environment. Thank, Thank you. you. Sika Damtu, you may begin. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Fasika Damtu, and I have two children. I'm here to voice my concern as a parent. I'm a Montgomery County resident and happy to live in such a diverse county. As a Christian, I always teach my children to show love and give respect to all. I believe we are all equal in the eyes of the Lord and the law. With the recent decision of the board introducing LGBTQ materials and not granting parents the right to opt out, I had to visit the board's policy. It states the curriculum value, uh, the curriculum value one's heritage and the heritage of others. And it says respect value, respect value and celebrate diversity. Now, my simple request is why not abide by the same policy you've written? Where is the inclusion? Where's the, div the, the, diver the diversity and where's the respect? Or does inclusion and respect only apply to a specific group? As you know, the aim of literacy curriculum is to advance students' ability to read critically and write clearly. However, these introduced books have no unique, I stress unique, 
pedagogical value in teaching literacy to students. To the contrary, they wholly focus on sexual preferences of a certain group of our community. The texts do not focus on teaching how to live among people with different sexual identities in harmony or respecting others. They do not even ask students to read these texts critically, debate, and share their opinions about it, which is the aim of a literacy curriculum. Instead, it tells uh, students to accept some ideas and feelings, even if they don't make sense. It tells teachers to educate children how to express their sexual preferences and aims to teach the opinion and belief that dictates, that dictates it's okay and good to change gender. The policy takes away my first and my 14th amendment rights to raise my kids with my value. These books and curriculum are frankly age inappropriate and forcibly Thank promote one-sided voice. I'm done. For this reason, I respectfully demand an opt-out. Thank you. Our next three speakers can please come forward. Bridget Howe, Alisa Picard, and Samira Munshi. Alisa Picard. Oh, okay. Uh, let's see. Okay, we have uh, Hermela Johannes. Yes. Billy Mogus. 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 Bridget, you may begin. Good afternoon, my name is Bridget Howe. I grew up here in Montgomery County, attended MCPS schools from K to 12. I started kindergarten uh, 45 years ago at Rock Creek Forest Elementary School. That year, when I was five, my favorite book was Corduroy by Don Freeman. As you might recall, Corduroy is a book about a stuffed bear in a department store whose overalls are missing a button and his adventures before he's bought by the young girl who loved him. Why was it my favorite book? It was because when I first read that book, the little girl, Lisa, who takes corduroy home, reminded me of me. She was a reflection. She lived in an apartment like I did. Um, like me, her mom told her that money was tight when she wanted something. Like me, she lived with just her mom. Uh, by kindergarten, I knew that my family was different than most of the kids at school. My mom hadn't been married um, when I started school. She was a lot younger um, and a lot prettier than the other moms. <laughs> she and I had, a diff had different last names, which made my principal principal really mad. Um, she wasn't accepting of that. Um, we lived in a rent-controlled apartment. She worked. Deep inside, I knew and I feared that my family being different meant that I was different too, that I wasn't as valuable as some of the other kids. Meeting Lisa, her mom, and Corduroy in a 20-page picture book with a simple story of love and acceptance made me feel seen. In the 1970s, there were people who thought my mom's decision to raise me as a young single parent were, was immoral. It went against their religious beliefs. I couldn't necessarily describe that motivation back then, but I felt their disapproval. And I lived with that awareness of how we were different. A few years back, an MCPS teacher introduced me to the literacy concept of mirrors and windows. This awareness has expanded my own reading habits as well as my son's. I'm grateful for the worlds I get to enter. Um, seeing yourself in a mirror is important. It's also important to have those windows into other people's lives. Please, please continue to prioritize an ELA curriculum that includes mirrors and windows, books that reflect the beautiful diversity of the families and students in our system, and books that allow our kids to learn about families and students whose lives are different than their own. The curriculum in question is not sex ed, FLE, or health, where opting out is allowed. These are ELA book selections updated to include. Samira Munshi, you may begin. Bismillah. Good afternoon. I'm Samir Munshi. I work with the Coalition of Virtue, a Muslim led nonprofit based here in Maryland, and I want to address the board on the issue of opt out. I firstly want to acknowledge, like Sister Hussein did, that today is the day of Arafah. It's the holiest day of the year for Muslims. And many of us are fasting, yet we came out to stand in the rain and to voice our concerns because for us, this is genuinely an issue of faith, not hate. And we reject the implication that acting on our faith's principles is a willful means of harming others. In fact, we see it as a point of bigotry that some only care for our community and will only protect our rights when we assimilate to their way of life and ways of thinking. Just like it's a point of bigotry when some refuse our women's right to wear hijab and to pray, Condemning us for our views on this issue is in, in itself another act of bigotry like the ones Muslims and immigrants have faced in this country for years. 
The same religion that causes Muslims to care about environmental justice, food insecurity, or ending anti-black racism is the same religion that causes us to care about this issue. Our faith is not partisan, and our people are not backwards. Part of the American dream of our people is that they pass on their values to their children. But members of this school board have mocked our values and have said we cannot be allowed to opt our children out precisely because they want to end that dream. Our constitutional right to religious freedom and to raise our children precisely protects that dream. Many of our families don't have much of a choice whether to place their children in this public setting. So we ask that we at least have a choice uh, for our children not to be forced to participate in celebrating or normalizing views that contradict our religion. These children will learn about same-sex couples and trans-identifying people, whether, they are whether they learn these things in school or not. And the conversations that they will have with these members of our community will serve as education on these matters later in their lives. But we're asking that our children not be strong-armed at such a young age into believing certain ideas about gender and sexuality, or that the school system insists on turning our children against the religious values that we hold. Thank you. Yes. Billy Mogis, you may begin. Thank you. Today I sit before you to discuss a, a fundamental principle that lies at the heart of a harmonious society, the importance of respecting religious freedom. In an era marked by diversity and pluralism, it is crucial that we recognize and honor the rights of individuals to practice their faith freely. Religious freedom is, is not merely a matter of personal belief, it is a fundamental human right, and it must be protected and cherished by all. Respecting religious freedom means acknowledging that each person has the autonomy to choose and practice their own beliefs without fear of discrimination, hate, violence, and attacks. It, it recognizes the inherent dignity that every individual, regardless of their religious affiliation or lack of, the right to religious freedom ensures that societies remain inclusive, tolerant, respectful of different worldviews. When we respect religious freedom, we foster an environment of understanding and dialogue. We open doors to conversations that enable us to learn from one another, to appreciate, to appreciate diverse perspective, and to build bridges of compassion and empathy. As educators, administrators, and responsible members of society, we and you have a duty to create an environment in which all students can thrive academically, emotionally, and socially. As a community leader, parents, hundreds of parents come to me saying how their kids are scared, terrified to go to public schools because they're forced to learn things that they choose not to. Teachers, principals, and students forcing children to learn things they don't want to, and they don't want to speak out because they are scared of retaliation. As lawmakers, it is a responsibility of you to make everyone feel safe, heard, and seen. So I ask you to please restore the opt-out option. Thank you. Yes. We, have, we have one audio testimony. Please play the audio testimony from Michael Solomon. Good afternoon, Dr. McKnight, President Sylvester, and members of the board. My name is Michael Solomon. I'm a 2020 graduate of Springbrook High School and a rising senior at the University of Southern California. Some of you may remember me from my frequent advocacy with MoCo for Change during the district-wide boundary analysis in my high school days. I'm honored today to present this statement on behalf of the Coalition for Inclusive Schools and Community Members. As Montgomery County students, families, school staff, and community members, we support MCPS's ongoing efforts to make its curricular offerings more inclusive to better reflect the rich diversity of our county. We're grateful to live in a community that respects and values difference, including in its public school curriculum and content. An opt-out option of MCPS's approved books or curricula would hinder these efforts. Schools are often children's first exposure to the diversity of their communities. For many children, kindergarten may be their first experience getting to know people who look, believe, or dress differently than their families. When students get to know someone who's different from them, it humanizes those differences, and that exposure may help reduce hate crime. 
anti-bullying and other educational programs may help improve the general social climate for LGBTQ plus people and in the process reduce the biases that spur those hate crimes. Research shows that when people feel connected to a supportive school community, they do better socially, emotionally, and academically. Exposure to the existence of individuals with different experiences via curricular and supplemental materials is an important part of preparing students for participation in American society. Selective opt-outs of books and content are harmful to all students, not just those who could very well feel rejected or invisible when any of their classmates are forbidden from attending a class, but also those who could very well feel excluded and singled out when they're removed from one. We support MCPS's efforts to be transparent with their curriculum and instructional materials, as well as encourage families to engage in their own discussions, informed by their particular culture or beliefs. MCPS has a review process, which is the proper avenue to determine its curricular materials for all students. Thank you. Thank you. We have four video testimonies. First up is Jennifer Martin. Please play the video. Greetings. As MCEA's president, I'm here today to inform you and the community of our unwavering support for including LGBTQ-related texts in MCPS classrooms. To be properly educated and nurtured, students must have texts that reflect the many identities people have and the many ways there are of being a family. A recent study by the Trevor Project reported that 45% of LGBTQ youth seriously considered suicide in the previous year. Nearly one in five transgender and non-binary youth have attempted suicide, and LGBTQ youth of color reported even higher rates of suicidality. It is tragic that before their lives have even begun to unfold, any of our children would believe that the world holds no place for them. It is not a choice to believe in LGBTQ people. They exist and always have in every community around the world throughout history. In fact, what is comparatively new to humanity is a restrictive code on gender and sexuality. Society has been moving in a more accepting direction, but today there are increasing threats to those who fail to conform to a rigid set of expectations. The good news is LGBTQ youth who found their schools and communities to be LGBTQ affirming reported lower suicide attempt rates. Only through honest discussion will our children grow into adults who are safe and secure in their bodies and identities and who have empathy and understanding for others. Allowing children to opt out of such learning is damaging to everyone in the classroom, from the queer student who see they are perceived as a threat to the child who is pulled out of the room due to unfounded parental fears. MCEA stands with MCPS leadership in affirming the importance of materials and curricula that fully reflect for our students the diversity of human experience, identity, and self-expression. Up next, we have we will hear from Jennifer Braveman, and please play the video. My name is Jennifer Braveman. I'm the mother of a seventh grader at Silver Spring International Middle School. I'm submitting this testimony in support of the Board of Education's decision to end the opt-out policy and maintain that educators can choose from a variety of inclusive supplemental reading materials for the ELA curriculum. Allowing parents to remove children from classroom discussions about LGBTQ plus people sends a harmful message indicating that these identities are not worthy of respect and inclusion and are not accepted by their peers. Moreover, the students who are opted out learn that LGBTQ plus people are devalued and this creates a dangerous school environment. This has been proven to be true because prior to the opt-out being lifted, I learned from a group of LGBTQ plus students at Sims that they experienced bullying and harassment on buses and in the school building, all because they identify as LGBTQ+, often on a daily basis. Students and staff often do not use people's correct pronouns and names, and teachers often do not address the harassment and bullying that they witness. I know of several LGBTQ plus students who have had to change schools or go to private schools because the schools were unwilling or unable to create a safe environment for these children. The only way to create safe schools for our LGBTQ plus students and staff is to provide in-depth high quality education, ensure that LGBTQ plus people are represented in our curricular materials, provide effective training so that teachers and staff properly address biased and unsafe behavior, 
ensure that the school administration addresses bullying and harassment of LGBTQ plus students and staff appropri appropriately and according to MCPS policy. The adults in the school building must convey the message that hateful, disrespectful, prejudicial behavior does not belong in the school. Thank you for your time and consideration of my remarks. I urge you to keep the policy as it stands. Up next, we will hear from Sandy Lancaster. Please play the video. Good afternoon. My name is Sandy Lancaster, and I am here today because of the health and safety complications stemming from Poolsville High School being located on an active construction site. I am the parent of a PHS student. I am not an environmental health expert. Dr. Laura Andrico, co-director of the Mid-Atlantic Center for Children's Health and the Environment, is an environmental health expert. She has served on a number of federal advisory committees. Dr. Andrico was consulted by the MCPS medical officer regarding the ongoing toxic exposures at PHS, and she provided the following feedback. Quote, the mounting number of hazardous exposures offers increasing concerns about the short and long-term health effects on the learning community at Poolsville High School. It is unclear why the construction needs supersede the health needs when there are workable solutions to mitigate health risks and complete the construction. We strongly recommend that the Board of Education consider alternative scenarios, e.g. off-site learning, that would remove the students from harm's way of the indoor and outdoor air pollution being produced by the construction and other construction materials deemed hazardous to health. The EPA offers several publications about environmental exposures in schools, including safety considerations during renovations. I suggest those accountable for the learning community's health become familiar with these recommendations and take action." End quote. As a parent, I am very concerned about the unhealthy exposures that my child has already received, and the fact that the current plans are for my child to have another year of exposures is alarming. It is not helpful to be given assurances by MCPS that the construction site is safe for children when expert opinion is that it is not. Dr. Andrico has offered to help MCPS find a path to safeguard the health and safety of the PHS community, as she has done with other school systems. Her contact information is in my written testimony, along with the letter she wrote to the Board of Education. Thank you. Our final video testimony comes from Gaith Abdo. Please play the video. I am Gaith Abdo from the Islamic Society of the Washington area. I have been living in Montgomery County for the last 38 years. I have four children and four grandchildren. I'm brought here only to confirm and reiterate what the other speakers articulated about our constitutional and religious right of parents from all religious and ethnic backgrounds, but to ask all the members to take a deep breath and pause for a minute and open their eyes and minds to the large number of scientists and professionals who have been voicing their strong opinions against the entire issue of transgender and, and sex affirmation that found its way to affect our children of all ages, let alone the very young children who are very exposed to what appears more pornography than science. What makes you think that half the world population, 2.8 billion people who accept Judaism, Christianity, and Islam as their religion are all wrong and LBGQ advocates are right? How can we accept that a very young child can diagnose themselves without a professional help as someone trapped in the wrong body and start treating them with aggressive, invasive treatments and hormones that can change their lives forever, when we do not allow them to do much less like drinking, tattooing, smoking, and otherwise. How do we logically accept that drugs and surgeries can change the sex of a person when that is part of their cellular structure down to the chromosome level in their brain cells? Please stop this madness that is seriously affecting our future generations and killing the most sacred unit of society, the family. You owe it to yourselves first and to this country to wake up and take a stand on principles and moral values coming from the Creator, 
no matter what your religious or beliefs are. Thank you. This will conclude our public comments. The next business meeting of the Board of Education for public comment is July 20th, 2023. Sign us for public comment will open on Thursday, July 13th, 2023 at 6 p.m. In addition to the online signups for public comment, we allow for in-person same-day signups when space allows. Unallocated slots may be filled on a first-come, first-served basis on the day of the meeting. In order to sign up in person, please arrive 15 to 20 minutes before the start of the open session and sign the form. In-person signups will close 15 minutes before public comment begins or when all slots are filled. I will all uh, turn to my comments to see if there's any comments or questions for the superintendent. If not, we can move on with the agenda. Okay. So we will move on to our next agenda item, which is item number six, action on board policies. And I will turn uh, to Ms. Madrowski to lead us through this discussion. Yes, thank you. Um, before I start, I do want to um, actually just say that I wanted to acknowledge that um, past board member, the Honorable Jill Ortman Faust, while she was not able to get into the building, um, was here. And um, I just wanted to share that because we always recognize our elected uh -huh. officials, past and present. Um, with that, I will say, um, we are going to start with policy ABC, parent and family involvement. Um, just for back reference, um, the board um, it took tentative adoption um, in February on February 7th of 2023 and sent it out for public comments on February 9th through May 12th. Um, the pa policy management committee reviewed the public comments at its May meeting and is now recommending that the board take final action on this policy today. Um, there are a couple of points that I'd like to raise, um, uh, and I ask staff to walk us through the policy. Um, I wanted to um, acknowledge that several of my colleagues, myself um, as well, had expressed a desire to see policy language um, specifically geared to language access. Um, and I wanted to let you all know that to that extent, this policy does uh, to the extent that this policy does not address your concerns, um, we will be adding the policy committee work plan for next year. We've already added it and explore a separate policy to address this. And I think they've already started working on that as well. Um, the other thing I wanted to acknowledge before we get started with staff was um, I wanted to thank um, MCCPTA for sending uh, the board their feedback on it on the policy. We received it. Uh, unfortunately, after the shortly after the comment period was over, so it was not um, included in the final um, alterations to the policy. However, as we walk through it today, I'm going to raise some of their proposed revisions so that we as a board can um, consider them, adopt them, some of them if we would like to, um, with staff's recommendations, um, and you know go through that. So. Uh, with that, I will turn it over to Ms. Stephanie Williams to walk us through it. Thank you, Ms. Mondrowski, members of the board. Um, as Ms. Mondrowski said, we will start today with policy ABC, which was sent out for uh, public comment from February 9th through May 12th. In that time period, 64 comments from the public were received. And uh, a number of them have been uh, incorporated into, or a number of the concerns and sentiments of the, of the comments have been incorporated into the policy. And uh, Ms. Mondrowski has mentioned the MCCPTA letter, which we will talk about in the collaboratively. <laughs> OK. A um, couple of housekeeping things I'd like to share with you. You will notice in the policy that uh, updates that have been made since the policy was last before you for tentative action. Um, those uh, changes are highlighted in gray. And updates that were made at the specific request of the Policy Management Committee are shaded in gray and underlined. Um, also, you will notice the addition of some text boxes in the, some of the margin in certain sections of the, of the policy. And we did that to um, communicate to you and to the, to the public that some of the language has been either 
um, it not, it, even though it shows in a redacted format um, on the draft, that doesn't mean it's been deleted in its entirety. Either the language was moved elsewhere in this policy or to policy ABA, which is sort of a companion to this policy, which was finalized by this board in, in February. Okay, with those uh, housekeeping matters out of the way, um, I will start you on page um, three at the bottom. And this, uh, these edits here were primarily to um, clarify that in all contexts throughout the, the, the um, policy, when we use the board, we incorporated the use of the board's preferred term of personal characteristics um, from policy ACA, which specifically outlines um, uh, identifies all of the personal characteristics in language, religion, race, um, ethnicity, and so forth that is in ACA, so we are incorporating that language. On page four, some edits were made um, to, um, and, and you'll see that ACA edit personal characteristics language a few times. I won't bring it out each time. Um, as referenced here on page four. Um, but they're also on page four, the section three, where uh, public comment um, referenced the need to ensure that the family engagement activities are of high quality and, and relevant. And that language was seen to be more appropriate than the language that you see redacted there. Beginning at the bottom of page four, we start making some additions to the section on communicating with uh, communicating effectively. In particular, the policy management committee wanted to emphasize a goal of promoting early and thorough awareness for families in all of its in, uh, in uh, regular, meaningful two-way communication. So that early communication was important. Public comment, um, through public comment, the uh, concept of including um, service learning requirements and opportunities, as well as industry recognized career credentials um, in the college to career ready uh, um, requirements that are referenced here in this section, in addition to those that were here previously. On page six, at the top, um, Ms. Mandrowski? Yeah. I just wanted to um, point out here at this point that um, the bullet number two from MCCPTA, um, uh, they asked that the language be modified uh, to read as follows. Um, and we're looking at um, number one now, so line 139. Um, to identify and develop enhancements and alternatives to traditional practices to better include identifiable groups for meaningful family engagement. Um, so I just kind of asking my colleagues if they have thoughts about that and if staff, if you want to say anything about that. Did you say 139? Line 139. Page six? Yeah, page six, top of page six, line 139 of the policy. So you're asking us to amend it? The, I'm, I'm providing with you the recommendations that were provided to us through MCCPTA to determine whether or not um, these are things that want to be incorporated into the policy. So um, to in order so that we can um, finalize this policy without having to go back and forth to the committee again. Sorry, I, I really hesitate to make edits at the board table. Um, okay. I don't even have that in front of me uh, currently, so I, I cannot. Um, so would it be best for me to request that we send it back to committee to review these, um, Ms. Sieber? If, you, if you'd like to take the MCCPTA feedback into consideration and you don't want to do all of they they provided several, the organization provided several um, bulleted, six or seven places in the policy where they suggest some changes, um, and they sent it after public comment closed. So if the board would like the committee to consider that feedback, 
even though we received it a little bit late, we could take it back to the committee, but it wouldn't be until the fall. That's right. So I'll leave it to my colleagues. <coughs> um, I would like to see the comments mm -hmm. and um, get some perspective about what was submitted. So I, I don't think it's a good idea to try to modify anything from the table. So I would recommend bringing it back to the policy <coughs> committee at the next meeting. Thank you. Is that you. for you okay? Is that okay? It's not going to cause a problem in terms of um, the final vote well, on it? Well, it certainly it is your discretion, and um, we would want <coughs> to uh, have the stakeholder I back if I'm on the committee, I agree as well, especially if you said there's about six or seven sections. Yeah, and they're, and they're decent recommendations. Yeah. Okay, so let's just take it back. Yeah, yes, I agree, because I'm reading this and it says completely different things. So yes. we need some time to read. I, I totally agree. So, all right, we're, I'm going to request then that we um, review this policy and its recommended um, suggested changes at the next policy committee meeting. It should be a quick discussion, um, I would think, and um, bring it back in the fall. Okay. So then that leads us to policy BLB. Um, this is the policy that addresses the procedure for board appeals. Um, the proposed amendments to this policy um, really are just in reference to adjusting certain timelines for appeals, clarifying key terminology, enhancing consistency of language throughout the document in response to the Board of Education's request, requested changes to procedures. The Policy Management Committee reviewed these amendments at its May meeting, and we're recommending tentative adoption of this policy today. Um, before I ask staff to proceed, because I was just going to have her sort of answer questions if any board members had any, um, I do understand that there's one um, added proposed change um, by staff. And if you want to just speak to that just before the board makes a decision as to next steps. Sure. And, and I, I recognize the conversation we just had about making changes at the table. Um, this one I think you may consider. Um, it's uh, on page 7 um, at line 167. We are recommending that uh, that it says where it says for purposes of this paragraph, the failure of the superintendent of schools to act upon an appeal within 60 calendar days may, at the option of the appellate, be deemed a denial by the superintendent of schools for purposes of appeal to the board. That's the language as it reads. We are recommending changing 60 days to 45 days. So the only edit is the number 60 to 45. And the reason we're bringing this up. Um, to, to you is we are also working with members of the MCCPTA and other members of the community to make edits to um, uh, our regulation KLARA, which is the complaint from the public process. Mm -hmm. And this timeline of 60 days to act if um, there is no response from the superintendent in that regulation, we've kind of noted it being disjointed, the 60 days, mm -hmm. as and so in that regulation, we're recommending changing it to 45 days. So we thought for consistency, mm -hmm. we would change it from 60 days, which decreases the time that um, an issue um, is going to be in an unresolved status um, for parents it will or others who, who submit a complaint. It will shorten the time that this uh, uh, um, action can be taken if there is no time from the superintendent increases the response time. So I'm going to um, be moving that we take tentative action on this policy as amended with the 45 days and ask if my colleagues have any questions or concerns or comments that we move them forward before we vote. I have no comment. I'm, I'm satisfied with that. Great. Is there going to be a, are you going to walk us through the slides? Oh, did you want them to? We were uh, in the uh, in the um, interest of time. Thank you. That's right. we were uh, assuming you all have looked at the policy and what. But if you want them to go through the slides again, I I for the sake of the people at home would like mm -hmm. to do okay. through the slides. Okay. Okay. So um, the. The purpose of the, um, this policy, BLB, it lays out the steps 
that um, set forth for when there is an appeal to the board. And we'll talk about in a moment, there are three different categories of, 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 of appeals that come to the board. And most of the, the substantive edits that are being proposed today um, have to do with clarifying the definition of a simple three-letter word, and that is day. Um, and so we will see that um, when we're looking at times, uh, not we will see, we have learned um, when we're implementing, there's confusion about how, which, what means, what constitutes a day. So that's our main objective in this, um, uh, in the edits to, these, to this policy. If we could change to the next slide, please. And I, um, so in trying to resolve and define day, um, because day is not explicitly defined in the statute specific to these appeals, we looked to el elsewhere in the Maryland rules, which set forth the definition and the use of the word day for responding in other um, uh, contexts in, in, in other legal and administrative um, proceedings. And so we've used that as our resource for defining day in, in the context of this uh, a policy. So within the Annotated, Annotated Code of Maryland, uh, Maryland rules as with respect to time, um, they when, when uh, a response is required in seven days or fewer, the days are defined as work days. If it's more than seven days for a response, they use the term calendar days. And um, our request, in addition to the seven, more than and less than seven days, we also request that the board take in consideration when information is required from school-based personnel. Um, sometimes there are records or um, well, records of various sorts from um, that school personnel must supply, so that if the response requires rest, resp uh, information from school-based personnel, that we use school day. So we've got work day, calendar day, and school day. Um, the the these edits are found primarily on pages eight and nine of the policy. And you'll see, um, starting at um, li uh, line 203, it previously said within two days after the submission of the information. Um, and this speaks to the superintendent's response. It's not, not changing any timeline. Um, it's just clarifying the superintendent's response. And so we speak to when the appeals from decisions related to policy JEE, stu student transfers, it's 10 school days that the superintendent has to respond. Uh, for all other appeals under Section 4205, which is the general um, appeals, that's any decision rendered by the superintendent, the school, um, by, the, by the superintendent of schools, she, may res she or he may respond to the board office within 15 calendar days, um, and then if the superintendent's response requires participation of a school office on days when schools are closed, those days, the days that schools are closed, are not counted. And in section F, which starts at line 230, um, and it provides the option for the board or the board's designee to exercise discretion in extending the time limits for either party. And it sets forth compelling reasons that the board or the board's designee should um, consider whether in deciding whether or not they want to um, extend that timeline. Um, the most, the rest of the of the edits throughout the policy are primarily, you know, adjusting the days, the designee, you know, grammatical um, or technical edits. The substantive edits are here on eight and nine. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, um, thank you for explaining work day, calendar day, school day. We got three different kind of things to keep track of here. <clears throat> so I'm a teacher by training. I go by school days. So is it really uh, important that we have to have three different 
concept of days, or can we just make it one school day since we are a school system? So the state law right. also sets forth certain um, timelines for response. And so mm. school day was definitely something that we explored, um, as well as work day or calendar day. Can we just make it one day? You never thought one three-letter word would be so complicated. Mm -hmm. but, but yes, there are statutory um, timelines for certain aspects of the um, response period that we could not align with uh, distinguish between because the statute said it. And sometimes it says workday, sometimes it just wasn't very helpful in defining this three-letter word. Um, so this was <laughs> the, our, our best effort and to um, just clarify it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, does anybody else have any questions or anything? Then I'm going to recommend that we take tentative action on this policy and send it out for public comment. Is that Okay, everyone good with that? Do I need a vote? As amended. As amended, yes, exactly, thank you. I had already said that in before, but okay. So yes, I'm going to recommend we take tentative action, sending this out for public comment, as amended, all in favor. Did you have no. an issue? Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Um, our next item for discussion is item number seven on our agenda, student well-being and safety update. This is um, a very important conversation for our schools, as we heard some public testimony um, from Dr. Handy today and many others. Um, safety and security is integral to what we do to promote teaching and learning in our schools. And so I will pass it on to Dr. Binay to get us started on this presentation. All right. Good afternoon and good evening again, everyone. Um, very excited to bring forward this conversation on student well-being and safety. And I started to look around the room. I know we are a little bit ahead on the agenda, but I believe we're going to have some uh, members from our police department join us at some point. Am I correct? Yes, okay. Um, join us at some point because as we've been coming forward and giving this presentation over the last couple of years, we've highlighted the importance of the relationship between the two um, as we con continue to think about the well-being of students and how we have to have partic particular infrastructures in place to support the safety needs. And as we often talk about, the needs that have been uh, very different since COVID-19 um, that we have to provision for. So today, our conversation is pretty much going to be focused on our commitment to ensuring that not only are our students well, but they are also in safe spaces in their classrooms, within our schools, and um, making sure that, quite frankly, our students feel well. But in addition to them, our staff members, as they come into schools, they need to feel safe. Um, and we want our families to feel safe sending their children with two schools. I know every single day uh, when my son walks out the door, I want him to return back safe and sound in the way that he goes out. And so that is the intent and the, the necessity. Oh, there they are. Welcome. Um, <laughs> uh, the, the necessity that they, uh, they, they come back home and safe. And so in thinking about how the day starts with them feeling that way and how the day ends with them feeling that way, takes much consideration, many lessons learned, and us paying attention to the things that they are alerting to us that we have to create in, in the space. So um, I, I share that because we can't do that alone as a school system. Oftentimes when I'm talking about the work that we have to do and I continue to make this commitment to the board and to our community, MCPS will exhaust itself in trying to do the right thing, but we can't ever be successful in doing that alone. We have to do it with partners. And those partners always are parents in terms of hearing from them, our students who are stakeholders who are having those experiences, our police department um, um, as they are experts in this area, and um, so many other mental health agencies and supports that we've established so many relationships, quite frankly, with over the last few years that have just brought to the forefront the importance of us having having a well-rounded system that supports the very variety of needs of our students. And just to give you a few examples of how we're acknowledging where we are today. Um, when I started my teaching career earlier in the 2000s, um, you know, I think about the things that, you know, we would put in place and what existed within the school system that took care of needs. 
We always had the school nurse. We've always had the counselor. Um, and then, of course, the other staff that's been traditionally there. But we've recognized that we've had to make some very different moves and decisions. Uh, last year was the first year that we hired our uh, official medical officer within the school system. And I tell you, it was one of the best decisions I believe I made, especially with the person that we have in Dr. Kapunin, because, you know, beyond provisioning for all the needs of the pandemic, um, it really is about how do we build systems to develop the whole child. And so that is the work of our medical officer, and she works in collaboration with all the offices to ensure that we coordinate that in how we approach our work. Um, you know, as the medical officer, you, you would think that, you know, yes, yeah, she, she is very skilled and she knows what to do and how to direct us in those medical spaces. But when we get into our team meetings, we're having conversations about how do we become more a more proactive school system and what does that look like in terms of the needs of the teacher? What does that look like in terms of how we engage community to figure out the things that are um, at the top of their minds? You know, Dr. Kapunin um, collaborates with all of the other leaders. Like, for instance, we see Ms. Davison, uh, Ms. Edwards here at the table, um, you know, who represents the Office of Operations. And so they're often having conversations about, well, what does this safety and security piece look like in staffing um, and how we're provisioning for supervision of students? What does it look like in infrastructure? What does it look like in capital projects that we have and as we're building out facilities and all of those pieces? And we've heard comments about that. So those offices working together to take that into consideration to develop more um, processes and systems to receive feedback, but most importantly to, to repair um, the environment for our students is what they have been doing. Um, and so we'll continue to do that because, again, this idea of safety and security has to continue to be developed in our school system in a way that we've built. Um, you've also heard me say a number of times over this year that bullying and hate incidents have no place in our schools. And I will continue to say that. Um, every day that a child comes to school, they need, they need to feel safe. They need to feel that there is a trusted adult, that if something is wrong, that they can go to. Um, and so we have to continue to stamp out harmful behaviors and also revise processes and procedures that, one, make our students feel comfortable reporting when those things are happening, but then also making sure that we can react in a swift response. We continue to hear from our community, and I know board members, you've heard when, as you've gone out in the community and had sessions, you know, our parents want to know, you know, if my child is in harm's way, whether it is through an interaction with another student or if something happens in that community, how quickly can I be notified? And what can I know about what the situation is entailing so that I can make an assessment as a parent? Um, you know, what needs to be done or is my child truly in a safe situation? And so we're going to continue to talk about how we coordinate our approaches to accomplish that. And having a Montgomery County Police Department here as a part of this presentation um, this year and in the previous years allow us to continue to say how does the across agency work look like that helps us to achieve that. And a call out Montgomery County Police Department is always a pleasure to work with Chief Jones and his staff. I know he was planning to be here today. At some point, he probably will come in. Um, but we are invested in doing this. And as I talk about Montgomery County Police Department, they're not the only partners. Department of Health and Human Services. We have built uh, you know, partnerships with them in ways over the last few years. And Mr. Monteleone is shaking his head in which you know, we can't actually see how we build these systems without them. Um, and so we will continue to do that and work with our um, agencies around how we build safe systems for our students and make sure that we most importantly communicate what those systems are to our students and to our families so that they can feel that these processes are ones that are ensuring the best for our students. Um, I'll just kind of end before I turn it over to the staff by saying, you know, this year we were faced with a number of emergency and crisis incidents. Um, things that you know, we didn't anticipate and, and things that we had to say, you know, what's going to be our, our response to this and how are we going to involve the community? And, and some of the incidents, you know, led to some unfortunate um, outcomes. But I also think in responding to a, a crisis situation means that we have to have all hands on deck. Uh, we're collaborating with partners here in Montgomery County, but also know that we're collaborating with other school systems across the nation. There is, I have not yet found an issue that we are trying to solve in the school system 
that is one that is isolated here just in Montgomery County Public Schools or in the state of Maryland. And so that outreach will continue to happen, and um, I feel absolutely confident that the more outreach and collaboration that we do, we are sure to find the right answer for us. And so I want to assure you that that collaboration will continue, and I want to thank the staff for um, really implementing um, that that collaboration that we always speak about, but actually living that out in how we do our work. So I appreciate you all for that, and um, I look forward to us having this conversation today on student well-being and safety. And um, Ms. Edwards, I think I'm going to turn it over to you. Good evening, everyone. Um, hope everyone is doing well. So I'm excited to be here this evening to really talk about student well-being and safety, um, our update. This is our first time doing this this year. Um, we've had smaller conversations as well as we as well as we've provided a uh, memo to the board, but this is our first time actually providing the update at the end of the year, but also looking forward to next year in terms of what we can build off of. If we go to the next slide, just want to uh, remind the board of a few times throughout the year where we've talked about slices of this work um, through the lens of from last year leading up to this year, just around our school safety and school climate back in February. We're going to spend some time today talking about the first year of implementation of our CEO 2.0 program. And so that was introduced at the end of last year to prepare us for this year. We also brought information forward in the opening of schools and then through Throughout the year, we have heard from our teams around mental health and well-being innovations, as well as wellness and restorative practices. And so all of these pieces will come together today as we really talk through, if we go to the next slide, three kind of distinct areas, well, four actually, the well-being in schools and school health, um, and we'll hear from Dr. Kapunin um, around that because that'll be our foundation as we think about, as students live within our schools, think about our communities and how that plays out all together. School safety, bullying, and student well-being. I shared our CEO program, and then we'd like to bring it all together to hear from one of our schools, Brown Station Elementary School, in terms of how things move from theory to actual action on a daily basis. Um, and so that will be our discussion today. I'd like to uh, have Dr. Kapunin now share with us around just well-being in schools. Thank you, Ms. Edwards. Good afternoon, everyone. Dr. McKnight, President Silvestri, members of the Board of Education. Um, my uh, job today is to frame this discussion about well-being and safety in its historical context so we understand why these particular aspects of student support have become so critical to our educational mission, more complex over time, and how we can work together to meet the needs of our students and the adults, caregivers, staff uh, who support them. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so we know as educators and we know as health professionals that there are characteristics of a child's environment that can strongly influence both health and educational outcomes. In the medical community, we call these social determinants of health. Um, the National Center for School Met for school mental health calls these social influencers of health and education because as it turns out, the social determinants of health strongly overlap with non-academic factors that impact student achievement. And during the pandemic, many of these factors um, were accelerated for everyone, but uh, especially for racialized communities. So things like homelessness and food insecurity um, increased across the board nationally, uh, interruptions or loss in employment, um, as well as disproportionate impacts directly of COVID infection, hospitalization, and death. Um, so the pandemic um, really changed the landscape of how these social influencers of health and education appeared uh, in how our children engaged in their lives. Uh, and as schools, um, you know, school itself was interrupted, uh, the connectedness, uh, the importance of connectedness has become increasingly recognized as critical. Schools, why schools? So schools are well positioned to identify and mitigate the impact of detrimental, the detrimental impact of social influencers of health and education. But as Dr. McKnight said, we cannot do this alone, right? We need to do this in partnership with the community. It's an all hands on deck effort, not just externally with our community, but internally uh, within the school system itself. Uh, 
addressing, recognizing, mitigating social influencers uh, that may have a negative impact uh, is not just important, it's essential to our educational mission and our, and our long game of having every student live their best life. Uh, the theme that you'll hear is community connectedness, and you can look at each of one of these domains and understand when people are connected to resources to each other, um, these are ways that we can get through uh, and really make an impact on these other aspects that may be beyond families, uh, educators, and health professionals' control. Next slide. So, you know, that was speaking to the external environment in the community, but um, speaking about like a framework internally upon which to hang uh, efforts that are directed towards health and well-being, I'll present the uh, CDC's whole school, whole community, whole child uh, framework. Um, you know, one thing I learned uh, uh, in this new position is that so many folks across the system already work every day to support the safety and well-being of our students. When other docs ask me, like, Hattie, that seems like a big job. I'm like, well, I don't do it alone. There's 25,000 people uh, doing it with me, right? Uh, so it's an all-hands-on-deck effort, so it's important to have a common framework uh, and uh, work from the same definition of well-being. We, we all know kind of what well-being means, or we feel like we know what it means. You know, students need to arrive healthy, feel well, learn healthy behaviors. We know that they do better when they're more resilient, when they feel safe, uh, when they're able to manage emotions, conflict, stress, and when they feel connected to peers and trusted adults. But what does the school environment look like that, uh, that makes this possible? So this particular framework um, has five uh, student-centered, youth-centered tenets. Um, and it defines a healthy school environment as one in which youth are healthy, safe, engaged, supported, and challenged. So I think those, you know, if you look at them each separately, real, really align with the breadth and scope of work. It feels big because it is big. <laughs> um, and then the, the 10 components in the circle in the blue describe uh, 10 areas of work. Um, it's a little bit hard to see on the side, but if you look on your handout, things like the physical environment, um, health education, community engagement, um, uh, <laughs> social emotional climate. Uh, these are all areas of work that are not silos, uh, but places where uh, different folks work and can work together. Uh, so for example, today you'll hear updates on um, safety and security. Uh, that's not just the physical environment and physical safety, right? Safety and security is also about social emotional climate. It's also about the people in your environment. Um, bullying and hate also um, crosses many of these uh, or multiple of these domains. And when we look at something as uh, complicated as crisis response, it really encompasses a lot of these, right? Not just... Um, uh, community and family engagement, employee wellness, student supports after an incident. Um, so you can see just in these two slides the impact of the pandemic in the form of how it's impacted our communities, violence, homelessness, trauma, um, has expressed itself in a way that the way we support children and their families is very different now. Um, and looking at uh, the work we do in a school system as more complex, uh, I think all the things that we talk about today are related to that, uh, related to the way we work together and with the community in what Dr. McKnight referred to as a more comprehensive vision of, of child health and wellness, which is absolutely foundational uh, to them being able to engage in education. Um, and with that, I will hand it over to uh, Ms. Edwards to get started on safety and security. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kapunin. Um, one thing that has been highlighted, if we go to the next slide, is we had the we came out of the pandemic last year, and so we knew coming into this year, we wanted to really have a coordinated effort around safety and security, and really kind of think through how do we structure those opportunities to really um, think about what are the needs of students, what are the needs of staff, and what are the needs of the community. So we put together on the next slide really five ways in which we approach approach this from the safety and security standpoint. Um, as we went into this year and the previous um, operating budget, the board provided additional staffing um, for us to really think about the security rovers, but also, and they really service our elementary schools. We heard Dr. Handy testify earlier around the need in the elementary schools, and we, we implemented this innovative option for the rovers to be able to have touch points and move between our elementary schools 
schools. This year, our rovers have been to about 3,300. They've had 3,300 touch points at our elementary schools, proactive opportunities, but also opportunities where they may have been needed for a safety and security issue. Combined with our uh, uh, cluster security coordinators, we've had about 7,500 touch points with schools. And it's really important that we're there when needed and there when not needed, because we're building that sense of community, we're learning and understanding the school. One of the critical components is we wanted to make sure that our staff received ongoing professional development. We often hear about our uh, SEIU employees who don't really gain the PD that's needed. So weekly, we met with our security team providing PD around the things that they need to do their job every day, but also through personal relationship building, um, equity, bias, intersectionality were many things that we elevated and then what it does look like within the particular job. One thing that we noticed was that our retention of employees was higher and it decreased our vacancies. Last year we had anywhere between seven to ten security vacancies throughout the year. This year we averaged maybe two at any given time. And so we, we attribute that in talking to our staff of that they had a touch point every week to be able to gain information that they could apply to their actual job. One, another position that was critical was that we did hire a trainer for security, and that trainer was helpful in really not only that weekly PD, but also their state training that our security assistants um, need to take, and we've heard about that state training throughout the year. This year, we had about 71 of our school-based staff take that training, and we have had 23 that just completed it within the last week. It is our goal when people are hired that they are placed into this class and they can complete this class in order to kind of meet that state mandate. We did take a, a, an approach to make sure all of our staff, our students, and our families were aware around what does the incident command structure look like if we have an emergency situation at a school. And we did training in the fall and spring to have a clear vocabulary, a clear way in which we were able to approach that work. Toward the end of the presentation, you'll hear more about our community partnerships and our physical infrastructure. There's not one thing that we can do if we are not working very closely with DHHS, our street outreach network, as well as our police partners. And so we pride ourselves in being able to have that collaboration at any given time if there is a need and we like to remain as proactive as possible. And then today we will talk about physical infrastructure within our buildings. Coming out of Uvalde, Texas, we made sure that all of our police partners have the key fobs to be able to in, you know, come into our buildings at any given time. Um, and so they do have that. So if there is an emergency situation, they don't have to wait to be left let into the building. And so that does bring um, a sense of calm. And then the elementary school camera project was a project that we worked on making sure that we had elementary schools that did not have cameras or they had between one and two cameras. So at the end of the year, we have completed 37 schools that did not have cameras. We have uh, 22 that will be completed by the beginning of the year, and then by January we'll have 37 that have between two to four cameras where they will have the full outfit of cameras. So now we've created equity in terms of just what our elementary schools have in comparison to our middle and high schools, which has been really, really important in my opinion. Um, someone actually came up and gave me a huge hug at Smokey Glen behind it, and I said, well, we're supposed to do this, So, but I thank you for the hug. Um, so I did want to give you an update on that because that was funding that the board identified. Um, I, uh, we did use a balance of funding from the board. We also received a grant to do it uh, from the state because we felt it was really important to have that available. And then finally, we had some pilot programs that we looked at in some of our schools. We had six of our high schools implement the vape detection systems within their restrooms this year. And it was important to do a pilot because we wanted to know how things actually worked out for us to make a decision uh, for the coming year. And we also did ID badges. So we were flexible in our approach this year, but we also had to be very coordinated and very concentrated to make sure things work. On the next slide, I'd like to share with the, with the board some data. And so as we put our plan together moving into this year and we, we looked at the flexibility, um, 
I want to call your attention on the right hand side to some of our serious incidents. And so earlier in the year, we did go to a council and we shared some of these incidents with them. And when we talk about serious incidents, the serious incidents on this page or in general are those that could include some level of risk or harm that could disrupt school operations. And so we are aware of those. They come into our offices. We are aware so that we can respond in a coordinated effort, making sure that we work with our partners to think about not only the situation, but also if there's a situation where we need to provide any social emotional support, students, staff, and families at any given time. From last year to this year, for the categories that are listed there, we had about 1,758 um, serious incidents last year. And then here you see we have about 1,708. So there's a the small decrease from last year to this year in what we're seeing in terms of our serious incidents, um, with medical assistance being one of the very highest ones we have. And that ranges for our students who receive an EpiPen um, within the school, which we do want to categorize that to sometimes where we do need to call for medical assistance um, in terms of bringing someone in for an ambulance for a student who may be experiencing excuse me, um, maybe have a, um, an allergic reaction, a seizure, um, or if students um, have been involved in any type of situation where they have been taking an illegal substance. So that's when medical assistance captures in that particular area. Our second um, highest would be fighting but uh, for students and or if staff may be involved in breaking up fights and keeping the area safe. And then we have had situations with drugs and alcohol and, and weapons throughout the year. And so I wanted to share these with the board because as we work throughout the year and recognizing what our incidents are, you'll hear how we have um, been flexible in terms of how we've approached it, but also being mindful of the need and working with our CEO partners as well as our partners in outside agencies. Another data point that is also there is the student arrest data. And so the student arrest data that you see is the student arrest data in our work um, that we have had with our CEO partners um, throughout the year. It's ongoing work. Um, this is tied to any of our MCPS schools or school events where our students may be arrested um, for different reasons. Some of our thing that will be the difference is you will notice on this data, um, when our police partners capture data, they don't capture data the same way that MCPS captures data around race and ethnicity as well as service area. And so as we work together, one of the um, ongoing work that we have worked on is as we receive this data, we then take our students and we look very specifically to understand which of our race and ethnicity categories our students fall into and the service groups so that we can be very designated in how we approach that work. And so as we go through that data that is in an individual person going through, being able to identify it, and then going back and working specifically around those data points. Okay. Next. <laughs> Mine's clarifying. Um, those groups in that last slide, the groups that it was broken down by, so that chart there, you're saying that's all of the student arrest data because so the Hispanic, for example, um, is not listed up there. Are we saying that they're, they were not arrested at all or how did we come to that? So this... So this is the arrest data that we receive from um, our police partners. What we then do is we take this information as well as individual student information and we go into our system to identify specifically which race and our ethnicity our students belong to as well as service group, IEP, 
um, 504, do students receive free and reduced meals? Um, and so what you see is what we, we receive from our police partners. So yes, we have had some arrest of Hispanic students this year. However, it is not notated in this chart. Um, and so we will provide that information to police the Police is putting board. them into racial categories. So Hispanic, they'll say, okay, are you white, are you Asian, are you black? And they'll put it's, them into the racial categories, not ethnicity. It's not a reporting category for them, um, a federal reporting category for them, because it's not an identified race. And because we know that's not matched in terms of how we view equity and how we're looking at our students, we go the extra step to be able to identify. So where is that data yeah, exactly. that we have identified? Right. So we'll be able to provide that information to the board by weeks in, in terms of that data. We asked for this information at the yeah. presentation last year, and so um, mm -hmm. my expectation is that by this time around, we would have that uh, presented to us. Ms. Rivera Oven. Uh, thanks, I wanted to follow up on that. So, so then, just to be clear, um, we're not capturing capturing the data of the largest population in our school system when it comes to this kind of data. We are. They're, they're I mean, back mapping it from what the police gives them, and then they say, okay, Carla, according to our records, is okay. Hispanic, so we so have then So we have the data from last year, I guess. That's my, my So we have the data from last year. Um, and then would that change the numbers then? Because here, we, we, I mean, as Latinos, we look great. But I, I, mean, <laughs> I mean, we we do nothing wrong. But I'm just trying to then understand if your numbers then are going to change. So that's why I wanted to see a reference of last year, and I wanted um, to clarify to the people who are watching this um, because this reminds me of HHS data where Latinos never died. Um, we live on forever, yeah, um, because, you know, that data was not captured. So I just wanted to clarify for folks who are watching. And then what is the impediment, and maybe we'll ask the police when, when they sit with us, um, from them capturing that data. I know it's supposed to be federal, but so was HHS data, and now they capture it. So locally, what is the impediment for capturing that. Thank you. Dr. McKnight? Yes. So I wanted to ask the staff to clarify, um, Ms. Edwards, we started, when we started to collect this arrest data, this data is coming directly from the police department. We then disaggregate this data to share what they have collected uh, because they have the arrest data. Um, one of the things that we discussed in our board meeting last year or year before was that the arrest data that we, as, as we have to also have the conversation about how we're looking at arrest data. There's paper arrest yeah, that sometimes happens in the school, and then there are arrest of students that happen outside of school. So I want us to be very clear about that, because I don't want, when we're saying we're collecting arrest data internally, we don't have all of that data to give a clear picture. So I just I want us to be very clear about that because what we are bringing to the table is what we have, and we, you know, we, we are working with the police department on that. Now there are other sources of data that we have that speak to student wellness, whether it may be discipline, suspension, and all of those other pieces. And you know that all of that's segregated by student service groups. But we're having a conversation right now about data that is shared with us from another agency. So can we come back to clarify that part about what is the data that we're collecting internally to better understand this? Yep. Uh, Ms. Or the uh, connection Wolf to that. Ms. Yep. My question, of course, was going to be the paper arrest because that number looks very low to me, from I, just from what I read in the newspaper, I guess. So I was going to also ask whether or not these were arrests inside the building, or or you know, mm -hmm. were they arrests in the community? What does that encompass? That number. Also, when we did the. Um, I think it was the MOU, we had very specific categories that kids could be arrested for. So I was hoping that you could break down what the arrest was for. And of course, as you said, the Latino component was raised last year. So I was thinking we'd see that also. 
Which but is- these numbers just, they just, they're not quite matching for me what I'm seeing in the newspaper, so I'm trying to figure that out. Ms. Wolf, which is the paper arrest? There paper are- arrests aren't up there. Oh. They're not up there. The, the, They're included in that. They are. The DJS referrals and the citations are the notated paper arrests. The, and you're telling me we only had 15 of them? So one, so one point I do want to do similar to, I mean, going back to what Dr. McKnight said, is to share with the board the, the actual breakdown from MCPS. This is data that we receive. Um, once we receive the data, it is incumbent on us to make it match how we view our students, how we view situations, so that we can be actionable and then triangulate it elsewhere. The other component to it is, um, as we receive the data in terms of um, the time frame and when we receive it and when the reports are put in by the police. And so within the MOU, I think as we talk about the revisions for next year, this is work that we can look at in terms of how is it that I don't want to. I don't want to speak to what it could be, but possibly a shared database. But again, that's something that we would have to look out, recognizing what each agency needs in order to do the work that they do. Let me just let me just say that that was one of the requests that I know that I made last year that we set up a database to capture the paper arrest data because the police weren't capturing that kind of data. So I, did we do that? It's not clear to me that we did. Uh, Ms. Rivetta Oven and then Ms. Madraski and then Ms. Harris. Okay, so I'm new to this process right here, but um, I, I'm a little bit concerned, no, I mean, so we went down on the Department of Juvenile Justice referrals, but crime among youth went up. So I'm, I'm not really, uh, I'm trying to understand if these were referrals that were made from our system directly to the Department of Juvenile Justice with whoever partner, whether it would be the state attorneys or whether it would be the police department, or maybe before it even went to the state attorneys with the police department. So I'm trying to, I'm trying to dissect that number because it doesn't relate to the numbers that I have heard from, from the state attorneys or from the Department of Juvenile Justice in Montgomery County of the youth that they get from our school system. So. I guess what I'm asking is, um, how does this compare with the other agencies that have uh, that have the numbers of youth uh, who have been referred to, who are from Montgomery County system? Because I, I just, the numbers are just not adding up. not making sense, not adding up. Yes, thank you. Yeah, so uh, Damon Monsignoni, one of the associate uh, superintendents in school support and well-being. And just to, to clarify for those that are watching, the data that you see here on the screen, so if you see, if you're reading the newspaper and we know that there's an increase in, in activity in the community and we, we are hearing about an increase in arrests and certain tragic events that we see in the community, these data here represent um, police interaction with students within the schoolhouse right, on school grounds, okay? Mm. So that is a key indicator. So if a student engages in something, right, that is a serious incident, and uh, if there's reason to believe that that incident may cross the line into some sort of criminal activity, it's incumbent upon the school, right, to work with uh, safety and security and reach out to their, their CEO uh, or local police who will then make, who will ascertain whether or not this is criminal. If it is criminal, right, the school stands down, the police conduct their investigation, and the school pauses on any type of disciplinary investigation. So when the police do make that determination, then they'll figure out, is this gonna be um, something where it's a DJS referral, right, uh, historically known as an arrest on paper, um, or if it's actually going to be a, a fiscal arrest. So that's why that data may not line up with what you're, you've been reading about in the newspaper. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. Mrs. Madraski? Yeah, just a quick clar- clarifying question. And that's, so if they're saying that um, the Hispanic population is incorporated with the African American um, and black population. Or white or Asian. Or white or Asian. You're saying that if that information is disaggregated, 
the numbers will not change. The 1708 and the 28 is not going to change. It's just going to be about different in groups. Is that correct? That should be correct. Um, however, this is as of, I think, a week and a half ago when we shared this information. So, okay. okay. Ms. Harris? But that was my clarifying question. Just wanted to make sure that, that looking at the specific data related to our Hispanic students was not going to change, the, that the Hispanic student engagement in student arrest activity is reflected here. It's not going to be additive to what we're seeing here. Yeah, that's what I was just saying. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Ms. Rivetta Oven, and then we should move on. Okay. So, <laughs> so Latinos are all over the place. Like we're with in the different in the different groups. Like we were just like, hey, we put you in this group. I don't. I'm trying to understand how the police made Maybe. that decision to where we are. Like. I get, are, are we under white? Are we under African American? Or we're under Asian? I'm just trying to and see what our part is. Do we have anybody here from the police department that can actually speak yeah, to this we data? Do. And how how <laughs> it's collected? Because I, I just think, thank you for coming down. We are, we appreciate you because I, I don't want us to dispute right. the data when the data is data that we're receiving from another agency. Exactly. That's why. Nor and and just another clarification, as Mr. Montelioni stated, this is their referral data as well that we then receive. So. I just want us to be clear, it's, it's not MCPS data because it's not the data we collect. Yes. Thank you, officer. Uh, good evening, everyone. Jordan Stensky, I'm the captain of community engagement in charge of our uh, community engagement officers across the county. And I work with all of our police partners, Rockville, Gatesburg, Park Police, and the Sheriff's Office in this program and work with Mr. Monteleone, Ms. Edwards, as well as others in this project. It's been quite a year for me. I've only been here about a year. So thank you for having me in this position. Uh, like Mr. Monteleone said, the data you're seeing there as far as the, uh, the arrest numbers are reference this, what happens in the school. Okay, that's where the CEO is coming to the school and had to make an arrest for whatever that incident was. Or a as some people have called it, the old paper referral, we used to call it, which goes over to DJS. I think there's something also to remember. This year, what we could arrest for changed via legislation. So for those who were 13 and under, which is about, and I'm going to make up numbers, I wasn't a math student, about 70% of your population, let's say, I can't arrest them. So outside, for some, unless it's murder or a sexual assault, there's nothing my officers can do. DJS has no jurisdiction over them either. DHHS is working on, at the state and county level, of trying to figure out what to do. And this population of folks is no longer anything that the judicial system can handle or is allowed to handle. So we, that's one of the reasons why you're seeing different numbers. I know, uh, I think it was Ms. Wolf, and I do apologize if I got that wrong, uh, stated that those, these are numbers, she's seeing difference in numbers. One has to deal with the fact that these are incidents that are in schools, but also we are now not allowed to make arrests for juveniles for certain offenses. So things you would have seen in 2019, or let's say we had 100 arrests for assault over, why, over the entire county, you're no longer seeing that. You're seeing maybe 10, 15, just because of the differences in uh, the way we, the, the, the legislation. Um, the reason why we don't capture Hispanic, or the, the reason why people are asking this question, NIBRS, our national incident-based reporting system, which all law enforcement uh, voluntary reports to, but basically do it because you get grants because of it, uh, does not ask for this as a subset uh, category. They ask very specifically for broad end categories because remember, NIBRS is set up at the federal level and it's set up for the lowest common denominator of anyone, not meaning the person or the type of person, but the reporting agencies. Some reporting agencies, about 80% of police departments are 12 officers and under. They don't have the ability to capture data the same way, let's say, Montgomery County Police can or Montgomery County Public Schools can. So they just don't have the personnel, the ability. So they kept it very simple. Uh, we do have a block in our reporting system for ethnicity, but it's super subjective. And I will tell you, I shared this with Ms. Edwards as an example the other day. I went through and one of my officers had written a report, not a CEO, but one of my patrol officers wrote a report. And in there, the last person's, the person's last name was Ramos, and they were indicated as being uh, Caucasian and not Hispanic. When I went back in and looked and I looked up some more data just to double check to see where we were on this, <coughs> this person was Hispanic. So the data is subjective, and it's not good. And bad data in is bad data out. Um, Ms. Rivera Owen, Oven, I agree with you. There's a, a hole there. Unfortunately, for where I work and where I sit, I can't do anything about it at the moment. But Ms. Edwards and I basically found another way. 
So I'm giving her the data. She has the information at her system by the names and dates of birth to make those matches based on the in information provided by the parents, which is the most, uh, at least in my opinion and from the police department side, the most positive way to do this and the most secure way. And it takes out all that subjectivity, or at least, let me say, lessens that subjectivity. Does that make sense? Yeah, so we, so we do know. We just don't have it before us today. But I guess my question still is, Captain, are the Latino population captured in that specific data? Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. There will be no there will be no change in the number. It'll just going to break out as they figure it out. It's going to break out. And I will tell you, it's not Miss Edwards fault that she got this data. So like in the last week and a half, we've been working on some of our systems and had some fails. I apologize. I'll take it. I'll take the blame for that one. So it's my fault. She just recently got the updated information. And the last question I had was, um, so this is helpful for for us to look at that all these incidents were on school grounds, correct? Every single one of these incidents. I guess my question is, I would like to see um, comparison to the, the general data that you guys have of juvenile arrests, in other words, minors, in Montgomery County for the last year that were not, it's not reflected in this data. So you want to see the community arrests? I want to see the community arrests for youth. Um, for youth. So I will tell you the Department of Juvenile Services produces a report every year that outlines exactly that. I don't know where they are this year for that. Uh, if the 2022 one has come out, I'm sorry, yeah, 2022 has come out yet. Uh, I can double check to see if that's something I can provide or if that has to go through an official request, uh, but I will absolutely check on it. Okay. Thank Ms. You. Wolf, my, uh, Dr. McKnight, and then we'll continue with the presentation. My, my question is just for the public's own information. So this data includes Rockville City Police, Gaithersburg Police, and Tacoma Park. So I can't speak to Tacoma Park because uh, we don't uh, – that's not part of the program for us okay. uh, from the from the partners that I work with at the county level. But all of the agencies to include park police, everyone's in. Out, and again, I'm not speaking for Tacoma Park, are all inside of our report management system. And everything comes through this office when it comes to this. And the partnership we created with all the allied agencies allows for that. OK, thank you, mm -hmm. Dr. McKnight. And then we can proceed. Yep. Thank you, Captain Sitinski, for coming to the table. No, don't leave yet. May want you to stay up here. Yeah, no, can't get away. <laughs> May want you to stay here until we're done with the presentation. But thank you for elevating that because I, um, this has been a, a point of conversation we've been having about the data. And thank you for elevating the fact that we, we don't, I just want to be clear, we don't have the capacity to collect arrest information. So we have to work with our police department, which we want to, to get that information uh, to, to be as accurate as possible. I think what you and uh, Ms. Edwards have come up with most recently is a good way to actually do that. But I also want to say it's probably taking them this long to come up with a process like that because we are also then in that space, um, and Captain, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but we're then now making a uh, we're changing the data, I guess I would say, from the way that it is then reported to us. You understand what I'm saying? And so we just, ha I, we just have to be careful about that because we're using then the police department's data in a different way. And I think that's fine in terms of the agreement that they've come up with to do it. But that's something that we have to uh, just be thoughtful about, that we're still using their data, but we're using it for information uh, in a way that will be helpful to us. Uh, so I just wanted to... to, to um, Explain that, Captain, because we I know we just have to be very careful in terms of the sharing. We, we went through, and I, I elevate this because when we, swift, when we uh, switched our programs, a big part of what the board requested and that we believed in was important was data sharing. We're actually at the point now where we're sharing data. We were not doing that before. Um, and so we're creating a, a pathway that just never existed. And so I know we are used to just manufacturing the data in the way that we need to, but this whole space of being able to work with another agency, taking confidentiality and all of the rights that are considered in this is a very different path. And so I thank you all for being very creative and inventive in trying to come up with a way to do this so that we're not um, violating anything that we shouldn't. Ms. Thank you. Wolf, a quick question? Yeah, I hate to hop on this, but I just want to be sure I understand. So our schools that are in Tacoma Park, 
-hmm. The T Tacoma Park police don't respond. You they respond. Do. No, no, they, they do respond, and they do have a portion of our internal report management system, but it doesn't come to us. They're kind of sectioned off, but that's the entire police department. Uh, it's but, not just. But would they references. be in this information? Would uh, their data be potentially? In this but I, if one of our officers happened to respond, yes. Uh, but I, I haven't seen any of it pop up, to be honest. I just haven't seen it. So if a child is arrested at Tacoma Park Middle School, mm -hmm. it may not appear on this. There is a potential for that, yes. I'll be honest, the yes. Okay. All right. Is that something that we could work on, Dana? Do you know whether or not that's something that we could... Um... So, so yes for Gaithersburg and Rockville. For Tacoma Park, what we'll do is when we go through the data, we will look to see if there are schools identified within that area. Then we will triangulate back. Um, to be able to look through that, but the other locations are. So that's a, a subset of our population. Okay, let's continue with the presentation. Okay, um, I'll take it from here. If we could go to the next slide, please. Okay. So incidents involving hate, bias, and bullying have been, and we know, remain a key focus area for MCPS, our students, our, and our school communities. And indeed, as, as Dr. Kapunin stated earlier, it's inextricably linked to well-being, right? And oftentimes, a lot of the, the uh, issues around discipline are manifestations of how students are inside, which is based upon factors that are, are outside the schoolhouse as well. As indicated in the MCPS board policy ACA on non-discrimination, equity, and cultural proficiency, Acts and incidents of hate bias are not tolerated in MCPS in any way. And so to this end, we recognize that to address these issues, um, we need to be both proactive in fostering school cultures that preclude these from incidents from occurring, but also be responsible when they do occur. So in an effort to provide preventative well-being measures and resources, we did come before you all in the fall in September and shared some of the pieces we were putting in place around student well-being teams, bridge to wellness, and additional mental health supports. I just want to share out that there have been 4,693 student referrals uh, for all of our comprehensive mental health supports this year. 3,432 students have been served by a social worker, um, and 906 students were referred to our, our partners in HHS uh, through our Bridge to Wellness program. Um, in fact, 787 students self-identified or self-referred for support through um, uh, our student well-being teams uh, and Bridge to Wellness, which brings that Bridge to Wellness number up to about 1,693. However, as you can see from the data on the screen, we have seen a rise in bullying and hate bias uh, despite these preventative resources and measures. Um, and as, as has been well documented in the news, this is a national issue. Um, and of course, MCPS is not immune. But as we focus on the data, it's important to remember that there are various data uh, entry points for, for each of these um, numbers. So when a stakeholder makes a claim or an allegation, MCPS captures that. And you'll see that in this data as I'm about to explain, whether or not that claim or allegation is substantiated. So I want to be real clear on that. These are, a lot of these are claims or allegations, right? So if you look at the data, please note that the 237 hate bias incidents and the 1,330 uh, bullying incidents are those that have been claimed or alleged through the reporting form um, and through SSWB. But these have... Can you say the numbers again? Because I'm looking for those numbers where... Sure, sure. Sure, so you'll see 237 total hate bias incidents on the table, okay? And you'll see 1,330 uh, uh, bullying incidents. But what, um, what I'd like to do here is, sh is share with you the various entry points, right? These data are not collected through one clean entry point into one clean data point because in space because we want as many people to have as many opportunities and decrease the barriers for reporting these incidents. Okay, so at times a student might report it, a parent might report it, a counselor might report it, a staff member, a principal, so on and so forth. Um, okay, so uh, I was saying uh, the the one th so the 237 and the 1330 uh, are data that are claimed or um, have allegations through reporting forms and school support and well-being, but not necessarily substantiated through an investigation. 
Um, and again, this would occur whenever a staff or a student makes this, this claim or allegation. The 93 uh, bullying serious incident reports um, are those reported by schools to the Office of School Support and Well-Being, right? So every time there is a serious incident, whether it is a, a, a bullying incident or whether it is, uh, uh, you know, a case of violence or a fight or something or if a student needs medical attention, those are called into the Office of School Support and Well-Being. And only the bullying incidents that rise to the level of a serious incident, per the regulation COB-RA, reporting a serious incident, need or required to be called into school support and well-being. So I just want to remind those at home and the board in looking specifically at that regulation, um, these are the, re the requirements here. Any incident resulting in death or serious injury of a person on MCPS uh, would be uh, necessary to call in as a serious incident. Bomb threats, explosive devices, uh, a fire or arson, a request for medical emergency assistance, serious property damage that uh, results in disruption of the learning environment. Um, uh, substantial or critical malfunction of equipment, right? So if the, the water, he, the heater breaks down or we lose our, our HVAC system, serious abuse or assault, uh, weapons, things of that nature, or requests for uh, attention from the police. So what this means is not every bullying allegation is necessarily going to rise to a, the level of a serious incident per, per our regulation. So that is why you will see a difference in the bullying numbers for serious incidents and the total numbers claimed. And we wanted to be very clear about some of the differences in that data. Um, I do want to say, however, that all bullying reports, right, all claims should be entered into our Synergy database, regardless of where they come from. And that is where you'll see um, the higher numbers, right? So this school year, as you can see, of course, through the, the hate bias incidents in the, in the table, we saw, as you, I'm sure you remember, a serious increase, specifically over the course of January 2023 through March, where we received 108 reports alone. And we know that these reports included racial discrimination, such as the use of the N-word, religious and cultural discrimination, such as anti-Semitism, and discrimination against our LGBTQ plus community. And we recognize um, that we, are, we need to do continued work in looking at these entry points and thinking about how to collect that data um, in one specific place. Next slide, please. Mr. Montelioni, I yes. just want to comment on sure. what you just said, because I think as you go through the presentation and you highlight the types of incidents that come up at certain times in the year, let's always remember that what happens in schools, it's a microcosm of what's happening in our community. So as he just talked about um, those incidents, hate bias incidents that we were dealing with, we weren't just talking about that as a school system. I mean, we had our county executive, county council members, everyone in the entire county saying, hey, we have a problem. And of course, schools are never uh, separate from that. So I th thought that was important to elevate because we have to continue to talk about how we partner with others mm -hmm. in these issues that we're trying to solve for the benefit of our students, because it is oftentimes a larger issue that is beyond the school system, but the school system has to have a strategy internally to support a larger county strategy, whether it may be fentanyl, uh, uh, hate and bias incidents, just all the things that we've seen that are impacting us, our entire Montgomery County community. So this is why, again, that partnership and that agency with others is critical. Thank you, Dr. McKnight. Um, so before I get into the, this comprehensive approach on, on bullying and hate bias that we're currently in and, 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 and speak to where we're headed, um, I think it's important to share some key steps uh, that were taken over the course of the past school year to assess the roots of this issue, its current state, and to bring us to, to the comprehensive approach, which I'll speak to in a moment. Um, over the course of the year, but it's going, going as far back as October, we began engaging with key community stakeholders, including county council members, uh, NAACP, identity, uh, leaders in the LGBTQ plus community, as well as uh, Racial Justice Now and the Jewish Community Relations Council. Um, new guidelines were established in the format of a clearly 
articulated flowchart and a new MCPS reporting form 226-5 was developed um, to more specifically uh, identify details pertaining to, to, to targeted groups, right? So it's not just hate bias towards anybody. There's specific hate bias acts that are targeted towards individual student groups in, in our community. And it's important for our community uh, to be able to, to see that identified. Uh, we also reestablished communications expectations uh, with our communities to include transparency around those reporting sources and reemphasize our collaborative efforts with our, our police partners to contact the Emergency Communications Center anytime there is an incident of hate bias so they can make the determination as to whether or not that is a hate crime. So all of these are key steps that were, were taken. And as Dr. McKnight just said, um, uh, we held a, a press conference. The superintendent uh, spoke to our firm commitment on this issue, uh, where she stated what our, our responses um, and, and, and really clearing the runway uh, for how we would move this work forward. The last thing I would like to note that our student code of conduct was revised for the 23-24 school year uh, to ensure that specific hate bias incidents are no longer folded in with larger bullying and harassment issues, but called out specifically within that code of conduct and the disciplinary continuum. With respect to these, to the steps that we've taken, we are moving forward with a comprehensive approach to this issue instead of rather looking at individual pieces uh, in a, on an ad hoc basis. Um, there is currently an implementation team that is meeting, um, and so some of the key components of this plan, while not uh, visible on the slide, are around three major areas. And the first major area, all of this, I should say, has been informed by the anti-racist audit, domain findings and recommendations. Each action and commitment is aligned and linked to that report. And the first one sits around anti-racist, culturally responsive, and equitable um, parent engagement. Uh, we heard from our parents we need to reestablish trust. We need open lines of communication. We need to ensure that all of our forms and our websites are culturally and linguistically appropriate and that the message we send, messages we send out are not so text heavily and easily di digestible. This work is ongoing and a key component. The second piece is around district work, district frameworks, expectations, and communications. So consistently, um, consistent community and school messaging regarding what hate bias is and how you can report it. Ongoing data analysis, such as what we're seeing today, so that our community is aware of what's happening on a quarterly basis, for example, in our schools and what we're going to do about it. Allow, aligning accountability for serious incidents, specifically around bullying and hate bias, to the school supervision and school improvement process. And we have done that. We have a well being and a culture goal represented in our, our school improvement plan moving forward. The third component is building the capacity of school leaders and staff, and this is essential. Strengthening the knowledge of the compliance process, the training and reporting, ensuring that all of our work is done through an equity-based, anti-racist, and trauma-informed lens. Um, establishing a culture of bullying prevention, proactive conflict resolution, and then uh, uh, ensuring that our, our engagement with parents and students is always done through that anti-racist lens. Um, next slide, please. We could sure. Pause to um, answer some board member comments. Absolutely. And then Ms. Yang. Yeah, um, I wanted to know if I could get a breakdown by school of the hate bias incidents, and you know, identify whether they were race, religion, or LGBTQ. Yeah. Same thing with bullying. Could I get it broken down by school? And could you just star those where the incident was serious? As opposed, I know these are just allegations, but I'm looking for patterns. Thank you. So to, for for. I said, I know these are allegations, but I'm looking to see if there's a pattern, if we're, we're able to tell that there are more incidents at one school than another, mm -hmm. so that we know where work needs to be done. Thank you. One school knows more how to report than right. another. We know these are allegations, but it's, you can look for patterns to see, because there's always something behind the allegation. I mean, very few people, I think, are going to fill out. That's a very detailed form mm -hmm. if there's nothing. So I would like to determine whether we're seeing these incidents out of, you know, several schools more so than other schools, so we know where work needs to be done. Absolutely. We, we definitely have that data and can, and can get that to you. Sure. I, I have uh, two comments. Uh, one is um, our data is only as good as how well 
people know how to report, right? If we don't get it, we don't know. So um, there are, I'm sure, inconsistency as a system as big as 200, you know, 10 schools. So how we are making an effort that we have some consistency and people know that it's okay to file these reports, okay? Secondly, if we look at the data, I want to call our attention to the middle school data for bullying. Um, we noticed that is a sharp jump, and we have talked about those are difficult years for our students, and how to provide the support and uh, support for our students and the training for our staff to address all many of the uh, blatant or microaggressions among the students uh, is something that we as a system uh, should look at. Thank you. Mr. Verhoeven. So um, I'm also kind of interested in, 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 in the breakdown of it, but I'm also interested on, I know we talked about having a lot of these forums in Spanish and other languages. So I'm interested to know out of the total here, how many were filled out in other languages that we um, that we put out to, and how many folks used any kind of interpretation? Um, because if you think about it, right, we have about 163,000 students, and one of the things I constantly hear out in the community is about bullying, but how the access to actually doing the paperwork or so on is still still a barrier. So I think knowing geographically where these incidents are, I think whether they're farm schools or so on, but also knowing if they were filled out in, in other forms, especially, and whether in interpretation line or other uh, ways were used. Thank you. Dr. Minette, were you gonna say something? I was just gonna thank the board members for those uh, recommendations and comments, because I think, uh, you know, as we continue to look at the how we currently collect data, but even look at it even more specifically to see who's impacted allows us to be more intentional with whatever prescription we want to put in place to solve that problem or that that issue. Um, the middle school piece, um, Ms. Yang, that you brought up, we want to, we're addressing it from a uh, proactive and not just reactive perspective. A big part of the pathways to college, career, and community readiness and the competencies, if you remember when we first built that out, we said you know we were focusing on the experiences that we know we wanted to build in certain areas, middle school being one, and utilizing this type of data to say what are, the, what are those other power and soft skills that we put in their experiences to help them, because we know a big part of this is developmentally. Um, you know, where they are, but we have to give them the tools to better communicate, better know how collaboration and teamwork looks like among one another to create a more cohesive environment. So I wanted to share that with you because it was a, a question that shows uh, the crosswalk between this work and also the, the pathways. And so I, I've got a couple questions here to address, but I'm, I'm going to um, dovetail off of what Dr. McKnight said and, and speak to the middle school um, prompt there for a second. Uh, we realize that if you look at the if you look at at landscape what we have in schools to support students social emotional well being, you are going to see um, the lion's share of those supports currently at the elementary and the high school level. So at the elementary level, you're going to see Title I, you're, you're going to see um, community schools, you're going to see focus schools, you're going to see additional staff there, you're going to see linkages to learning. At the high school, we have put a lot of resources that is showing uh, f uh, bearing fruit. The social workers, the Bridge to Wellness program, the additional counselors that we put in, we put a lot of additional staff in those spaces. Where we are, and we, we, we recognize the middle school is, is a bit of a desert, and I do want to just note that that is consistent across the state of Maryland. We are not an outlier with, with middle school. Specifically, if you think about the impact of the pandemic and the kids that are in middle school and where they were developmentally um, over the last three years. Um, 
I will say this, in terms of middle school, in addition to what Dr. McKnight said, we were able to add uh, four additional social workers, right? And we have, um, we are realigning some social workers at the middle school level who will work specifically with individual middle schools and be able to cover uh, uh, access for middle and elementary schools through a new process that we're developing to, where, where principals can share those requests. Um, and we are also working on adolescent uh, training uh, and development through our RJ team and our social workers combined at that middle school level specifically to address that, that space. So I just wanted to touch upon that. Yep. Yep. Um, the bullying plan, you said it was three big buckets. Mm -hmm. Anti-racist parent engagement. Yep. The third was capacity for school yep. staff. Yep. Mm -hmm. I didn't understand the second. Could you just summarize it? Sure. So the yeah yeah the the, the the second one is what what how are we decreasing the variability across schools? What does the district expect all schools to be doing on a routine basis? What data do we expect them to look at? What data do, do we expect them to use as they're making decisions on on how to engage students on this issue at the school level? How are they working with their parent communities to hear parent voice so that they can incorporate that voice in their work at the school at the school level. Um, how how often and when is the system communicating out messages around hate, bias, bullying, harassment, and the resources that are available? What what information is available, for example, at the top of every school's website? Like we had the COVID and the well-being resources. Should we be putting very accessible resources there? So that's really district level work that will decrease the variability at the school level. Thank you, mm -hmm. and. Um, Sorry. Wait for a while. Um, okay. Ms. Harris. Um, just a, a couple things. So what you just said, bucket two, decreasing variability across schools. Um, I, one of the things that I would add that I don't think you mentioned was how are we ensuring uh, really well-trained staff who, are, who have excellent classroom management skills, especially at the middle school level, where uh, you've all have heard me say it again, we've got a whole bunch of students whose whose physical size and chronological age does not match their most social emotional development and mat maturity level because of the pandemic isolation. And so making, you know, resetting our expectations for that grade level students particularly, I think is key because we cannot expect you know, 2023 6th, 7th, and 8th graders to behave like 2018 6th, 7th, and 8th graders because of the impacts. Um, so that just a comment I would have. And then um, I'm just assuming that there's this is there's dramatic underreporting of bullying incidents for lots of reasons. Um, but that's what we hear all the time. Didn't know how to do it. I didn't think anybody would do anything, that kind of thing. One tool that we have, and I would be really interested to see what we're, if we're tracking up, you know what I'm going to say. Stronger student app. So this is a, a multilingual anonymous or not tool for students to report, to get resources, to, um, it's constantly updated with, you know, to, to make sure all the links and all the, on all the, the resources are up to date and current. Um, but are we tracking reports that we get through this, this tool? And in, is there any way that we are continuing? I talk to students all the time that are like, what? Um, how are we continuing to push this out as a resource that's very student-centered, student-focused, because it was student-developed? And um, are, we, are we tracking that uptake in any way? Um, I, we, I asked about it about six months ago, is there a way that we, because I think there is, a way that you can track the number of downloads? Um, and, and I don't know if we're doing that, but I would, you know, if, it, if the, we know how big our student population is, and if we aren't seeing a representative size of uptake and download of this app, I think we need to push it out more. So Ms. Harris, thank you for bringing back up the app. When we disaggregate, there were some requests around digging a little bit deeper into the bullying data and the multiple entry points. We can look at the entry point of what is actually coming from the app. The app was revolutionary because everyone's on their phone. Um, that's something that they have immediate access to. And so we can look at it, what traffic that entry point actually gives us but everything we receive 
we definitely take the time to be able to follow up on because someone is sharing that there is a problem with how they're experiencing their daily life in MCPS. You also talked about just do people know they can report? Do they know about the app? Um, one of the critical parts, and Mr. Monteleone can talk about this, we are doing, um, as Dr. Murphy likes to say, a level set across the system. One, through the lens of our leaders, um, what we saw in terms of the hate bias data, we saw our uptick at a certain point in the year because we put more of a light on it as well at that time because we wanted people to let us know. So one, we'll be doing that with supporting and sharing with our administrators um, and providing them the groundwork and the information to be able to do with the community. The second component is we have to look at students. We still have to make it um, comfortable for people to be able to share who they share and how they share that information with so that we can do the follow-up. Yeah, I think we should have a link to this on every school's website. Mm. You know, front and center, big red button, big green button, whatever. But every student and every administrator and every teacher should know that this exists, and I think that's not at all the case. Um, and then the last comment I have is just when we look at our the reports that we do get, one of my concerns is that if you look at these three big buckets, uh, race, religion, LGBTQ+, plus. The one of those categories that transcends them all is our LGBTQ plus community. So are we looking at, are, is some of, if, if a bullying incident could, could fall into more than one bucket, hmm. are we, how are we tracking that? So when, when it would come in uh, through the form, right, we would be able to, to see the details of, of what that is and through that, through that investigation. So are, are, if you're asking, are we currently, do we currently have a system whereby we are disaggregating for intersectionality? Uh, I, not to my knowledge on the form at this time. That would have to go through, and you know, that would have to be some manual data that we would collect, right, based upon the individual information that comes in through that form. But if we wanted to try to capture on the front end, right, it would be a just a retooling of what we're asking people to fill in, right, on that form. Yeah, and because I think, um, again, given that our LGBTQ students are the most likely to, be, to suffer anxiety, depression, suicidal ideation, suicidal attempts, homelessness, everything, they are our most vulnerable. And so um, everything we can do to make this you know, the ability for them to speak, um, I think is critical. Thank you. Uh, just one final question before we can move on. I'm assuming that the um, engagement that you have for August, this district-wide rollout, includes community, or is it just for the school system employees? So that's just exactly where I was uh, about to go with this slide, go. right? So, um, so, the, so as we launch, right, that comprehensive approach with those three big bucket areas that, that I spoke to a minute ago, the kickoff for that work will be um, on, the, on, on the August 16th mandatory training, right? So, and it's going to be for administrators and school leaders to start with, and it is mandatory. It is, we have two three-hour sessions, a.m. and p.m., um, and we will include not only information delivery, but tabletop scenario, right, uh, activities. So that we're giving folks something to wrestle with, and we're, we're asking them to wrestle with that situation in real time, and if this, then what? And we can provide ongoing coaching and, cl and clarification around that. And that is a, um, a, a, a session, that is a, an opportunity for learning that I just wanna say is to, to tie into what Dr. Capoon and what, and what Ms. Edwards said earlier, this is not one office doing this work, right? The, we're talking about school support and well-being. We're talking about uh, operations, district operations. We're talking about equity. We're talking about the chief medical officer. And, and there's so many more. So this truly is a district-wide approach and not just on one person's shoulders or one office. But within this, the key, the key areas, right, that we have heard time and again, uh, student rights and responsibilities, right, and the code of conduct updates, how to, like, staff and student investigation compliance investigations, OGC policy updates, uh, uh, le uh, legal updates, alternatives to suspensions, right? That may not, not be a part of this presentation explicitly, but we are focused on how to decrease suspensions in this district, incident and crisis response, and then of course the bullying and hate bias reporting expectations. And the one thing that I, I think it's worth mentioning
mentioning here. We have, we, every time we have a board meeting, we have wonderful celebrations of all our new appointees. Over the last five years, and we realize how many of those years, right, were within the pandemic when we didn't have students in the building. Um, over the last five years, we have hired 113 new principals. Um, and so we must, it is incumbent upon us, it is our charge to ensure that we have that level setting um, and that we ensure everybody's operating from the same place. Now, as I said, that is just the beginning. Um, there is much work to be done with the community and engaging the community at a district level as well as at the individual school level once we begin in September. So this is not just about training the staff, and okay, we're done, we did it once. There will be ongoing professional development touch points that we embed into established structures and processes that already exist, such as our quarter leader learning less, uh, sessions that are led by SSWB with um, operations and safety security plugins. There are spaces that we have identified to continue this work, just like we don't talk about school improvement in August and forget about it. We continue to touch points with our school staff throughout the year. So this is just the beginning, but we thought we'd give you what is coming in the short term to begin with. Thank you. Just encourage you to have the, the community roll out as well when you're ready for it. Thank you so much, Mr. Monteleone. And to close this section out, um, just around safety and security, we look to the infrastructure for next year because as we have done our work throughout the year, we have heard just in terms of how can we look at our buildings and kind of bring our buildings up to speed with some of the things. We talked about the elementary camera program, and that was a key component. We've broken this down into three phases, really looking at how we utilize our capital improvement funds to really support the work that needs to happen in schools. And as we come back to schools, um, a couple of things that we'll look at. We are going to upgrade, or actually, um, when we did our assessment of the lighting in our high schools from the fall safety plan for our athletics. So we will come through our high schools this year and make sure that the lighting all matches our, all of our um, parking lots are brighter. Our high schools, Ms. Wolf, we've talked about this throughout the year. Our high schools will move forward with the repeaters starting at the beginning of the year. That gives us that opportunity that if our public safety partners come into the building, they will be able to utilize their communication devices. And then we did pilot our ID badges this year at the high school level, and we've met with much success. We've heard from those six schools. We've heard from our other high schools in terms of bringing that forward for next year as an implementation in all of our high schools for our students to be able to utilize the ID badges. As we move throughout the next couple of years, a couple of things that we've seen in other school systems we really want to be mindful of are exterior door sensors so we know if our doors open that aren't the main door. Moving to a keyless entry throughout our buildings instead of an actual key. So using the swipe card that we use here at CESC, um, being more modern and up to date. And then one of the biggest things that we will be investigating, we'll look at uh, putting out an RFP for this, is an emergency building management system. Our high schools are huge, and so often things may take place throughout the school, and an adult or a student may want to let someone know. And so there are ways in which um, staff can be able to alert the office, alert other staff within the building if help is needed, um, almost through a... Um, a response system that they would wear on their person. So we've been investigating that, but we've also looked at other things to kind of give us a smart school feel, for lack of a better word, being mindful of that. And of course, as we do our new construction, we want to make sure our schools are outfitted in the proper way, hence our elementary schools coming forward with all of the cameras. As we close out this section, um, as we shift into the next section, we've talked about the things that are happening within our schools and communities that come into our schools. Um, as Dr. McKnight said, our communities, uh, um, what we see in our schools are sometimes a microcosm of what happens within our schools. Captain Satinsky came to the table um, talking about just the work that we've done this year and really thinking about the engagement that we've had to do across our agency to make the CEO program work. If we remember last year uh, in this room, as well as across the hall in the auditorium, 
as we started to consider what it looked like um, coming off of the Magruder shooting, how is it that we build that sense of safety and security within our building? What we knew was that the SROs, the SRO program was not what we had in our buildings, but we needed something else to be able to put in place. And so we, we started with the CEO 2.0 model. And so if we shift to the next slide, I just want to go back to a lot of what we heard from our community um, after engaging several different stakeholders around this was that a model was needed. Yes. Am I? Finish your sentence. Oh. I, no, I have a question, but finish your sentence. Sure. A model was needed. However, there was a heightened sense of the unknown and or fear in terms of what police would bring into a school community, especially for students, staff, families of color, um, people who have experiences that they were bringing into that space, and how could we make this program actually work? And so hence, uh, you'll see some of the key components that we focused on and really kind of shifting from SRO to CEO, um, some of those key components are that the CEO is not stationed in the school like the SRO was stationed in the school. Um, the CEO had specific things that they come to the school for um, and not are involved in the daily interactions and or the discipline of students. That is the school's responsibility. And so we wanted to make sure in hearing those themes and understanding that clearly, clearly defined role that we were able to do implementation. Ms. Wolf, I'm so sorry. That's why I stopped. <laughs> Okay, it's a, I, my question was just on the last section before you oh, I'm start so, from that. Sure. It, it was on slide, well, I'm referring to slide number eight. When, when um, Dr. Handy came up, she mentioned needing security assistance at the elementary school. And I noticed that um, there were a lot of touch points, and you said the security rovers their service, they covered the elementary schools. But I guess what I'm wondering is, do we need actual security in the elementary schools? And if so, can you break down the school incidents so we can tell where it's most important to put a security assistant? And that's not something you have to answer right now, just it's information that I'd like to get. Thank you. Not a problem. So I'll put that as a part of our follow-ups. Thank you. Um, Ms. Edwards, just a clarifying questions for slide number nine. Um, we have the 2022 to 2023 serious incident data. Have we, because I just learned that the legislature changed, so our police data uh, change because partially due to the legislature change. So have we in the system changed anything about serious incident data collection? Procedure wise. Uh, if I'm hearing your question correctly, are we collecting our serious incident data differently this, by level? Yeah, this, are we collecting the data, the method we use to collect the data, or the way we collect data uh, uh, and the instruction we give to the school this year is the same as last year. Are there anything changed? Uh, have anything changed? No, we haven't. Um, okay. We have provided the same information um, in terms of how they report the data um, and how we collect the data. Um, however, in hearing what we just heard, it may beg for us to take a look at that, but we do have to have an account of what's happening at the individual school level. Thank you. Yeah, I would just, just, just to add briefly onto that, so we will report the serious incidents. If there is cause to believe that the incident may be, right, rise to the level of, of criminal activity, immediately we, we contact our police partners. They make that determination. As we heard from Captain uh, Satinsky today, if that student is, is under 13 years old, then, then once it gets to them, their process has changed, but that has not changed how we report our incidents. So all I want to know is this little square here that we have not changed any procedures. Thank you for that affirmation. I had one follow-up, and that is, 
State training, you mentioned training under here for the security assistance. Have we completed the required training that the state required for all of our security assistance? Or I, I know at one time we didn't have the luxury because we didn't have enough to cover the schools for everybody to go. Have they now all been trained? And if not, when will they be through with that process? Because this is a question that was asked by the county council. Thank you for asking. At the beginning of the year, we trained 71. We had 71 staff members who had yet to be trained, and we made sure that they attended those trainings. Um, we just had 23 of our staff who finished the training. We have about 12 staff members who need to conclude their training, and that next training is offered in October. And so they are signed up for the training to be able to attend. Um, we have put a process in place so that it, when someone is hired um, and we're tracking people very closely when they're hired, we're automatically, as long as the training is open, signing them up. I want to go I want to go a little deeper on that. Ms. Edwards, could you please explain, or um, mm. I can quickly share, some of the challenges that came up in uh, that when this, came, this topic came up at the county council meeting um, and it said that we had staff that were not trained. There were a number of challenges. The training is actually only offered several times a year. Mm -hmm. And so that means if we hire a staff member in a, a security position in October, the training is not then offered until January, mm -hmm. then that is going to leave a period in which they are not trained. So it's not that we're being negligent in making sure that people aren't trained, but that we, we the training is offered by the state, and the state dictates how often. That's exactly right. Um, and so I know we've worked with the state on remedying that and trying to get them to offer um, some flexibility and offering the training more often so that when, as we cycle staff in and hire them, they can try to get trained more immediately. So that was one, one uh, point that I wanted to make sure that we raised because, you know, it's possible that we will always have a few people who are not trained um, because they're waiting to get into the next round of training that's being offered by the state. Uh, now, I was referring, I, and I understand that, mm -hmm. I was referring to those people that we already employed because this training question actually came up two years ago. Mm -hmm. You remember when I called you about it. So I was trying to figure out, has everybody that was already on board been trained? Because I think that's their real question. Right. Because they've been asking this at least one person for a couple of years now. So, I, yeah, I'm glad you, you, you shared that, uh, Ms. Wolf, as of now, and correct me if I'm wrong, but we've, we have the people who have been on staff trained. Correct. The only people who are untrained are people who have come on board and been hired and been waiting for the That's training. Good. We've already closed the gap of existing staff who have been here who needed to complete the training. We're not out of compliance. Thank that you. is correct. Yes. Ms. Rippert-Aubin? So, um, very quickly, and, I, and, and I'm sorry that um, it's just my brain's becoming a mush. It's been a long time. but So sorry if I didn't ask this question earlier. But I'm just curious, So, because uh, when we look at um, on page 8, those are the serious incidents, right? So those are the ones that are serious incidents. So my question is, how many calls or how many calls were made from MCPS to the police department um, by elementary, middle, and high school? Mm -hmm. And do we differentiate between police department and fire department? So, or is it the same? Or is it this? Or is part of the same? The same number of calls. So, it's for instance, if you're having a kid who's having an issue because they don't have their IEP uh, and they have to have medical assistance, that would be, I guess, a fire. EMT call versus a police call. So do we have that that data? Mm -hmm. So can we follow up with you to provide that information? Because what you're asking, if I'm hearing correctly, is people are calling non-emergency, mm -hmm. the non-emergency number, as well as the entry point to contact the CEO. So again, some of this is data sharing between the two agencies, and some of it is information that we have that we would have to go through and identify that. Yes. I may identify that as a good one that we can look at because I do know that we do collect that information because whenever schools have to call, we require they report a serious incident in the Office of School Support and Well-Being. So if they have to, if there's an incident that, that is engaging at a school, they, the administration has to make that call. So that information is coming through to us, but um, I think it's a good opportunity for us to look at 
our serious incident data and Versus, then and yeah, the agencies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Harris? Yeah, just a quick question. No, nowhere to put this because our question we're kind of going um, in lots of different directions. But uh, back to the security cameras and the, the widespread installation and the increased uptake. Um, we heard from our ITSS folks back um, when we were talking about budget issues that there really needs to be some dedicated uh, members of the ITSS team that really don't do anything but monitor those security cameras because there are so many of them. Um, you know, maintain them, uh, troubleshoot them. And right now, we don't really have the people that are dedicated to just that job, and it's, so it's a little bit erratic. But with this great expansion, and I think those positions, we, we, we had some of those positions in the initial operating budget proposal. I think they got cut. Um, and I'm wondering, what is our plan? So it's one thing to, to install, but what is our plan to make sure that they are being accurately monitored, that if they, you know, something goes wrong or goes offline or breaks or needs maintenance that we have the people on site regularly to do that because they don't help, you know, they're not helping us if they're not working. So, Ms. Harris, I will need to follow up with you in terms of the monitoring of the calendars that will, calendars, oh my goodness, mm -hmm. cameras, <laughs> it will be by staff at the school level because they will be within their buildings to be reactive and or proactive to what they're watching. In terms of the upkeep, you do bring forward a question that I do want to follow up with our team about as well as to work with our partners in other offices. Okay, we can move on. All right, I'm going to shift to CEOs, but please feel free to go back <laughs> and ask other questions. Um, as I already shared, if we want to go forward a couple of slides, um, one more. So as we implemented this program, um, it was really important because what we have heard from the community, students, staff, and alike, was that basically this MOU needed to work. Um, and one of those pieces that was important in going into this year was to build that trust between MCPS and MCP. And not that we didn't have it, but in terms of how we work together. I think a prime example was Captain Satinsky just coming to the table on demand um, and knowing that he can, call, he can call me on demand as well. Right, exactly. Um, and so it was critical that as we approached this work, it was through communication, collaboration, and coordination. And so so if something was working, we could high five. If something wasn't working around the data, then we'd figure it out and we'd, we'd take our time to be able to figure it out. We did this by meeting weekly and being very clear around the roles of CEOs, the roles of schools, what we needed to go back and communicate out. We brought our PLC leads in from elementary, middle, and high school to be able to engage with the leadership of our CEOs. That was really important. And when we had to do hiring, when the, when the police were hiring their CEOs, we had representatives from MCPS, a part of the interview committee. That was critical because we're working together. And not that we could sign off on who the person would be, but we had input. And on the same side as us, we wanted their input because it was a true partnership around it. And it all came down to we wanted to make the implementation of the MOU work as much as possible. So when we got to this point for revision, we had had a lot of the conversations, and it was a, just a matter of how we levied it. Our CEOs were critical parts of the athletic safety plan in terms of the communication and being on property during the day as well as in the evening. And anytime we have a community incident, the ones that you just looked at in terms of our serious incidents, we are working together around that, around what is the coordination, who else do we need to bring in from other county agencies um, and making sure that we have a fine balance of our needs, their needs, but recognizing we have children in the middle of everything. So that's the critical part that's right there. We started last summer with our Summer Safety Summit. And at that point, we brought together police, fire and rescue, MCPS, our security and our administrators. That was our first time ever doing that. And that really set the stage for the work. And we continue that throughout the year. Um, the police always laugh, but we did quarterly luncheons with all of our district commanders, as well as our CEOs throughout the year. 
it was lunch, and yes, they know I will feed them, but the, the biggest part was the conversations that we would have. How were we being attentive to what we were seeing in certain districts collectively? Who else did we need to call in and how we were learning about that? We, we also had our school directors invited to, to, I think, the last two of those luncheons that we held, and that was a good, powerful tool because we were all having the conversation together. So as we approached this work, it was important for us to be able to do that, to really be able to support what we knew we were seeing and hearing, not only in the community, but within our schools. So this takes us to the end of the year at this point where we needed to really look at the implementation of the MOU. And we purposefully waited all year because things happen all the time and we wanted to work out all of the nuances. If you go to the next slide, in the, in the, in the spirit of just plan, do, study, act, we really wanted to study at this point to understand what this looks like. And we did a couple of waves of input. We focused on um, a large portion of our groups we focused on were our students. One, because they were leaving the school, but we wanted to be able to really harness their input. We talked to all of our principals. We gave an opportunity for all of our principals at all levels to be able to share with us their perspective, their part of the implementation. We also engage with all of our security staff members because their perspective is really important because they are mainly engaging with our CEOs as well within the schools. And then we used our advisory group that we have, our student well-being, our, our, our school well-being and advisory group. And we heard from some of our families who are also members of many of our parent groups and advocacy groups to really just kind of hear their perspective. Um, you see some of the quotes on the screen, and what we're seeing is that they'd like to have the CEOs for support and not necessarily punishment. That's very clear within the MOU. They don't kind of cross over. That's that role and responsibility component. Trust is important. And then the relationships there, and you will hear that as a theme from all of the stakeholder groups, that the relationship with the CEO, the visibility of the CEO, is not really what it should be. But I say it's a double-edged sword, and I'll tell you why. We implemented the MOU. We heard from our community, we heard from our students and our staff what this program should look like, but it kind of took away the essence of what it really means, which is the relational component, having someone in the building you can focus on and really work with and be there for proactive and reactive. And we created some of those opportunities, but it was not a through line. So I wanted to highlight those um, components um, there, and that's from our... Uh, a few of our families, and that's one area that we definitely have to build off in terms of the next leg of feedback that we would get, but from our administrators as well as our security staff. If you go to the next slide, we spent a lot of time with our students, and we approached the student input in two ways. We wanted qualitative and quantitative data. There were eight high schools who opened their doors. We were able to see 200 plus students within that space and really spend about an hour to an hour and a half with those students to understand their experience, not only with CEOs, but also with law enforcement overall. We asked for principals to be able to provide us students who are in leadership, students who are rising 10th, 11th, and 12th graders, as well as students who always follow expectations and students who sometimes follow expectations in schools because we wanted the perspective of many of our students across the buildings. Quince Orchard, um, at, when we went to Quince Orchard, not only did we have lunch, but we also hosted the session in Spanish. And that was very important for not only the Quince Orchard community, but it was also important for us in terms of access because we had heard from our students, um, our Hispanic students and Latino students, as well as our African-American students, mm -hmm. that interactions with the police look mixed but it was a level of fear. So we wanted to be able to engage at that level. So you'll see from our students some of the feedback that they provide in terms of, especially through the focus groups on the right-hand side, 
they want to know their CEO, but they want to know the purpose. The students at QO actually had ways in which how they would introduce the CEO and bring them into the school and put them on TV. Um, announce them at different um, places. And so we thought that that was really important. One of our students from Wooten said, I feel a lot safer with CEOs and police who look like me. And so that's a, that's, a, that's a qualifier for some of our students in terms of do I visually see someone that I can actually, um, that represents me. And then on the flip side, for the eight schools that we didn't go to, we asked for our high school principals to send out a survey, again, rising 10th and 11th and 12th graders, and we received about 1,500 surveys back. We did them in English and Spanish. Again, we wanted the access for our students to be able to participate. And it was really important in hearing from students, not only interaction with CEO, but what is your perspective and interaction with law enforcement as well as that background. A couple of themes from those responses. Our students who responded to the survey have a respect for the police, but they have a limited interaction with the CEO. They are unaware of the CEO program, and there's still a wariness of having police presence in schools, but students also felt that if relational trust is built, if there's representation, and that our police partners receive race and hate bias training, they would be more open to really trying to figure this component out, but they want their voices heard and to be a part of the process. So I share this with you as kind of our, the student data that we wanted to gather before students left. It was at the very end of the year, and people say end of the year data, you're either not going to receive as much or you'll receive exactly the gut honest truth. We believe we got some of the gut honest truth here. Um, but we also know that we have to finish that engagement with our staff as well as our community. So our next step with this, um, Captain Satinsky has gathered feedback from his CEOs around their experience this year. We have to look at the MOU um, because we wanted to implement in year one and really think about does it work, does it, doesn't it work, and what are the revisions to kind of really make it better to support um, the school system. So I wanted to share that with the board in terms of where we are in that process as we continue to do this work. The good thing about having the rising 10th, 11th, and 12th graders, these are students we can continue to return to as kind of our, our landing spot from remember when you shared this with us this year. We have a question from Ms. Wolf. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, thank you for that. I guess what I would say is that um, I'm not clear how it's working. Um, and I've been out in the community and, you know, there's still a lot of safety concerns. People don't feel safe. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to ask you, since you collected data on site at various schools and you did a survey, if um, I'd like to see meetings around the county, four different points, north, south, east, and west, to get community input mm -hmm. as to how this is working for them. I, I think that's very important because, yes, the students are a customer, but so are the parents, so are the administrators. And the administrators I'm talking to are very, they don't feel safe in their own building. As you know, several have had to take out peace orders and other things to protect themselves. So I'd just like to get a feel for, is this program doing what it was designed to do? And do people have suggestions about how we could make it better? Or do we need to think about something else? Because there is the movement of the return to SRO. I'm not sure that, that this has been in place long enough to want that, but I do think we need to gather more information than is here because I, I, I don't get a feel for what it is, how it's going. Thank you, Ms. Wolf. We will um, move forward with your suggestion. Mrs. Madrowski? Yeah, thanks. Just kind of along those same lines, you know, I too hear a lot of concerns and McCap testified this morning, or was that this morning, afternoon, whatever it is, um, feels like forever ago, um, about feeling safe and, and, you know, and I hear a lot of, I've always kind of felt like the 
downside to our old SRO program was the fact that they were um, stationed in the high schools as opposed to the middle schools and spending more time in the elementary schools. And I love the fact that you guys have worked so hard to build um, and improve on the relationships, both at the school level, central office level with um, MCPD. But um, but I, I feel like the thing that's been lost more than anything else is the opportunity for the connection. Um, and the younger that we can make our, our youth understand that this isn't just a punitive situation, that it's a it's about relationships, it's about being, you know, when we were young, we were told, you know, if you ever get lost or whatever, you have a problem, you go to the police. And now I know that that's not the same for everyone in terms of feeling safe to do that. But if we could build relationships at a younger age, I think that that, that goes a long way in terms of making children feel more safe and respected. And um, so I don't know if we're looking at any of that. Um, I really still don't even understand where they're located if they're not headquartered at any of our schools. They just kind of hang out at the police station and wait to, for a reason to go. Like, I just, I really, it just feels like this is just very incomplete. And um, so to Miss um, Wolf's point, you know, I think that um, maybe it's not going back to the way it was, but I still think that we maybe threw out the baby with the bathwater a little bit, so. Ms. Harris? Um, yeah, I just uh, thought as we're talking about, you know, police in schools, and I've done a pretty deep dive on the nationwide uh, research, both qualitative and quantitative, and, you know, it's very, very mixed. Um, and and no, most, of, but most of the data do, does not support at police and schools as being a, a good thing for a positive learning environment for students. Um, and my concern is that th this increased real request by people to put police back in schools um, is definitely coinciding with upticks of students not being able, not behaving at ways we deem age appropriate based on our pre-pandemic expectations. So yes, we're seeing more incidents in schools That's because all these students have had their social emotional development and their ability to self-regulate negatively impacted by the pandemic. And the answer to the challenges and struggles those students are facing and trying to learn how to regulate is not harsh discipline or necessarily law enforcement. So I just, I'm, I, I, you know, I look at those two things together, and yes, there's a, more of a demand to bring police back, but it's also contextualized in circumstances that are beyond the control of the students who are, whose behaviors are causing concern, and what we need to be doing is getting to the root cause of those behaviors. So. Ms. Yang. Yes, hi, thank you. Um, not taking away any comments on the table, I'm looking at our data. We have about a thousand serious incident a year uh, that's collected this school year. So I'm very interested in, you know, clearly student safety, staff safety is our top priority. So I'm very interested in looking at that we uh, maximize all the tools that, that we have and how can we best use all the tools we have student mental health support, safety personnel. So um, I, I support that we should have um, this extensive engagement with our stakeholders, staff, students, and, and the outside agency's perspective. Uh, and so they are all stakeholders. So it's, I feel it's important to hear everyone's view so that we can use every tool that we have to the best of what it can offer. I have uh, two questions before we move on. Um, I'll say them both and whoever wants to answer. I've, I've heard from people in the community say that um, school staff are not reporting things because it makes their school look bad or it makes the principal look bad and there's, so there's under-reporting. Um, how do you prevent that from happening from being a, I don't know if it's true or not, but I've heard it multiple times. Um, 
how do you prevent that from happening so that people feel it is what it is? It's a, maybe I need more support rather than I am disciplining children or calling the police too soon. Um, and then my second question is about this, the MOU with the CEO program. Um, and you, you've said we need to look at the MOU, but uh, I, I guess my question is, what are you, what's working well and what would you like to see improved? I'll start with the last question. So um, I'll go back to why we waited until the end of the school year to gather the data. We wanted to really know what was working well and what needed to be improved. Um, a couple of things in terms of what's working well, I would say um, having an MOU having clear established roles around what our police partners can do and what they cannot do in schools in terms of what they should be involved in as far as the disciplinary component and the role and responsibility of the principal, as well as the sharing of training, as well as the hiring process in terms of us being a part of that hiring. What works well to an extent is the data sharing. I think you heard some of the challenges that we have there in terms of trying to match how we look at data, how we gather data, how our police partners gather data and they look at data, especially because we're receiving it from them. So that's an area that we do need to be very mindful of in terms of smoothing out. The second component is I think what's not working well or what I would say would need to be refined what we know is that our students, our staff, our families as well, relationships are critical. Who we can trust, what we can do in the moment. And there is a plus that happens when there is more access and we're not just looking at law enforcement as law enforcement. Um, and same thing with our security assistance. We are clear that the relationship is critical because we want our students to be comfortable. We want our staff to be comfortable. And I think the last component I would say that is working well is we have a shared interest across the table in terms of Montgomery County Public Schools and our police partners, as well as DHHS and the other agencies that we work um, with. It is about our students and our families. How do we keep our students safe? What do we do when they're not safe? Um, and how do we do it as quickly as possible? Um, and so those are like the shared interests. So as we think about revising the MOU, the areas that I talked about that aren't working well are the ones that we'll have to kind of determine how we bring that about for year two to not only have a technical piece of the work work, but also how do we make it work for kids? You know, the MOU are words. We have kids that we're working with. So the theory to action. I'm happy to, to take the second question. The first one? The first question. <laughs> <laughs> or you can take the second one. Well, what it, um, so I think uh, it, there's always been this question, right, of, of underreporting, um, going back as in, in, and why or would folks underreport or is it malicious intent? going back to even when I was coming up through the ANS process here in the school district. I think there's really three ways that we have been addressing this and that we continue to, to address it. And I think the first way is through um, through the school supervisors uh, and folks in, in, in well-being and student, and student services is that we're creating this culture where it's not a gotcha culture with principals. It's truly about um, being able to provide support. So, for example, when there have been many schools, right, that have received additional staffing for security, one of the data points that we look at when we're making those decisions is the, the incidents that you're having, what's going on in your community, right? So it's not about you're in trouble because you're reporting this number. It's these numbers allow us to increase our support for you and your community. So that messaging has been in place going back to when I was a principal. And I know that um, that Ms. Morris and the school supervisors are continuing that message because I'm in the in the room, even on my side with well-being, uh, hearing those messages. I think the second piece is is really about um, it's, it is about consistency um, and means of reporting. And it's not that somebody is saying, well, I don't want to report these numbers. It's is every school reporting in the same way through the same mechanisms in a timely manner. 
Um, and so that is something that, that I'll be transparent and say that we are working on ensuring is, is, is enhanced. Um, and I think the last piece, which we've really done a lot of work on with school supervision and school monitoring, is through the administrative, uh, excuse me, the school supervisory visits, right? So our school supervising directors and our directors go out. We have consistent questions that we're asking our principals around data points. The, these data are now data that's included in addition to literacy and math. So there's a constant conversation about what's going on in your school, what data we're looking at, how we can support you. So so there's, there's really three ways that we're addressing that. Thank you. I appreciate that. Ms. Roberta. Sorry. Uh, just very uh, quickly, because um, I know this is uh, the CO is different than the SRO, but uh, and maybe this is for, for the police department. And correct me if I'm, if, but I heard um, the folks who took, uh, who were active in the SRO programs were police officers who volunteer to um, to be SROs who wanted to to be part of the SRO system who you know so and then I heard that the CEO program is more that they are um, they are they are told what schools to cover versus volunteering to actually be part of the schools and I think um, it's been a transition for a lot of the schools because uh, for many years, the community had developed relationships with some of those SROs that were close, mm -hmm. that were close relationships, and I think that has been a challenge uh, uh, in talking about building building the trust. So I just would like to to just have that clarification, um, and then out of the twenty five officers that we have in the program, I would like a breakdown of the diversity. Um, of those officers and whether they're also bilingual to some of the schools that they are assigned to that have uh, a high bilingual uh, language gate, you know, population. Hi, Captain Stensky again. Ms. Uh, Rivera Owen, to answer your question, uh, I want to make a couple points real quick, if you don't mind. And I know you all have been here a long time, so I'll go as fast <laughs> as possible. <laughs> and I saw your agenda only goes till tomorrow, so you're fine. <laughs> um, <laughs> The, uh, the selection, so CEOs don't volunteer, they're selected. There's actually a, a hiring process internally within the police department. Uh, this is not one of those jobs lots of people put in for because I'll tell you, it's a lot of work. Uh, and I'm not trying to disparage any police officer, please don't think that. It's just a different thing. Like, not a lot of people want to become homicide cops. Not a lot of, a lot of people want to work sexual assaults. I get that. You know, this is one of those specialized areas. And it requires a lot of not only police knowledge, Willing to, willing to work with your community and be out there in front of your community, kind of like what I'm doing now, uh, and being able to take heat sometimes, you know? And that, they have been through the ringer over the last couple years based on not only a local, but a national narrative. I'm not indicting anybody here, that's just what happened. Uh, they really, really care about these kids. So I will tell you, my background is not this. My background is majority of my career was violent crimes, whether it was sexual assault or homicide. I didn't do this work. Uh, when I came here, I had known a very different side of police work. And when I walked in through the doors and started to meet these officers and talk to them, it was very different. And it was a side of policing that I hadn't seen since I was a young cop. These guys, and I don't just say this because I sit in the division, I work with some pretty amazing folks that really do care. Uh, so much so that they sat through the program when it was getting torn up. And I don't mean by the SRO to CEO, I mean by the national narrative going after, these, uh, going after this job site selection, to, this job uh, opportunity. They stayed and they worked and they kept working and they kept doing their thing. Their biggest complaint about this whole MOU, and I hope I don't get in trouble for this, is uh, those relationships. Just like Ms. Edwards talked about earlier about the elementary schools, like they're hiring more security assistance for elementary schools to create what? Relationships. Why? Because like you said, ma'am, we lose it. You know, I remember my, my SRO, I grew up in New York. I remember my SO, SRO from when I was a kid. He is still an SRO now and he's like 9,000 years old. <laughs> but and he's, and he's very shocked. He's like, they put you there? Uh, but I still remember him, and I still talk, and I still talk to him. No, it's it's okay. The the breakdown of how we respond also is very different. So from when the first inception of this program, when we had educational field officers, I believe we called them, to when we went to SROs, as we mentioned earlier, they were all stationed in the high schools because that's where the majority of the incidents were occurring, and that's where we thought we could affect the most change, the most positive change. As I went through my research on it, um, when we went to this new cluster model, I now have one cop responsible for a high school, two to three middle schools, and I don't even know how many elementary schools in some instances. 
because there are 220 something schools in the county and I have 25 cops. I have beats in beats patrol areas that my cops, the patrol cops work on that have 10 people that work in areas that are less populated than the one officer that I have in this major cluster setup. So we lose out on response times. We are sitting out in parking lots. We are sitting at stations sometimes. We're writing reports. But when they respond, they respond for a police reason. And if they determine there's not a police reason to be there, they work with the principal and the security team leads there to help abate whatever the situation is. We are not, and I have been very clear on this with my staff, we are not the disciplinarians, nor will be drawn into it. And they've been told that if they, that if any, and Ms. Edwards knows this, if anyone tries to draw them into it, they're to call me right away. I don't care where they are or where I am. And so far to date, that has not happened as we've worked through a lot of this stuff. And you know, for both of us, especially for me, this was new. I didn't, I walked into this after its inception and kind of had to pick up and run with it. And I had some good help. And it has been a learning curve for a lot of us. And we've made mistakes. I have. Uh, Ms. Edwards, yeah, I have definitely, and I've learned from them. Uh, I do believe there is a great deal of room for improvement here. I do believe the national narrative is switching. Uh, I do believe that some of the some of the studies that are referenced to SROs as far as how they are in schools and their impact on students, uh, there, there's statistics can be made to make it what you want to, to make them, right? And I don't like saying that, but it was hard for me to say. But they can be, because I'm a data guy. Uh, and there was a narrative, and all these things propped up, and all of a sudden now it's switching. And I'm sure we're going to see new ones. So I'd listen. I'm all about listening to the community and finding out what they want. And I've heard it. I've heard it from parents. I've heard it from a PTA president in the southeast part of the county who doesn't know their their CEO, and was shocked. And here is the the PTA president, and the school she's at has one of my favorite CEOs for the whole county, and he's like, I, I can't believe she doesn't know who I am. And it's because we don't have those relationships. Thank you. Know. you. A quick follow-up question for him, just really quickly. Okay, because we need to finish yeah, the presentation. Yeah, I just, you said there's major improvements, and I heard you. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I would just be interested as a member of the board and, and as um, a member of this community, because um, that makes me sad that there's somebody who is a PTA president that doesn't know who their CEO is. So obviously, there's a disconnect. Um, and how can we improve that? how what what would be the remedy for that so that's something for I think that's Edwards a, and the yeah police that's a bigger discussion that's not something for me to weigh in on it figure but, out sorry. as we improve the relationship for the upcoming year so let's continue with the final three slides and just as we close out and thank you um, as always um, as we close out we're just going to round out the last five minutes of the presentation just theory into what it looks like um, we do want to just provide one of the interest points was just what does a school response look like to emergency incidents so if our school team could come down from Brown Station Elementary School in the last five minutes of the presentation, just as we remember, um, we've talked about how we work with our community partners, how people get emergency preparedness training. Unfortunately, they did have a community incident, if we all remember. There was an explosion of an apartment complex. Um, and so I do want to turn it over to um, our principal, um, Vilma, as well as uh, David Adams, who is the director of the school, to share just a little bit more about how all of these these things kind of coalesce together. <laughs> hello, good evening. Hello, hello. Um, so yes, I am currently the acting principal at Brown Station Sorry. Elementary. Um, my name is Vuma Nahera. Um, and on November 16th, um, the Brown Station community experienced a major incident that was about 50 feet away from the school. So imagine us here, and it's pretty much where the parking lot is to CESC. There was an explosion in one of the condominiums directly across the street. And at that time when it happened, it was around eight. The kids were coming. The patrols were going out. Um, our staff was going out to do their morning duties. And when this happened, I was on my way to a training for the TWI training at Goody. Um, so this happened around 8.30, 8.40-ish. And as soon as that happened, the assistant principal who was on site, Jessica Mundaval, was quick and immediate in her actions and called a shelter in place. 
So she brought everybody into the building. Um, once that was initiated, she called me to let me know what had happened. I called my director, um, David Adams, to inform him. And simultaneously, at the same time, our security cluster coordinator, Ms. Donna Sutton, was calling me. And she's like, I'm on my way. So we're, we're headed toward our school. Um, so thoughts, right? All the things that are going on. There's a fire. There was an explosion. You're like, what? <laughs> so then, you know, in my mind, I'm getting off of where Crown is and the Rio. You see the smoke all the way from over there. And in my mind, I'm like, oh, my. <laughs> So fortunately, that fall, or in the fall, we did our emergency preparedness refresher, um, which included the review of the emergency response process map. So I had a clear understanding of what I had to do and what the emergency um, response process map was. It's like a flow chart, a chain of command and a process that we went through step by step by step. So in case of an emergency such as this, unpredictable, we don't know, um, you have an incident command, you have the incident commander on site, the principal is the one voice, and then when the director's in, it's communication between, it was very clear what we had to do. Um, so as soon as I got into the building, um, we all got into the building, of course, you mentioned um, safety, right? And you send your babies to school and you want them back the way you do. So it was like, who's here, who's not here? Attendance, who lives in that building? I need names, names of all the kids that live in that building. Um, and like a good daughter, because <laughs> I am my mother's daughter. She works for the system. I emailed her, mommy, estoy bien, I'll call you later, because she was going to hear about it. Um, so I say that because that's how we lead, right? It's our babies need to be okay. And we didn't know we were gonna do the parent reunification, but they needed eventually to get back home. So we huddled. The on-site emergency team huddled. And what that group of people are, are pretty much our admin, core team, secretary, all staff available to come in and we huddled and we, attendance. What do we know? The timeline that we're taught, right? At 8.30, we did this. At 8.35, and I'm, I'm foggy on the numbers, but it was all written out. So then we decide next steps. Um, and this is when we start talking. And at this time, so picture it. There are trucks, like police cars, smoke, flames coming out of a building. We're right directly across the street from, from that. There's people coming in and out of Brown Station. Um, people, firefighters, different people, like all the things. <laughs> and then there was a lot of voices in the room, but Director Adams did collaborate directly with our community agencies, police, fire and rescue, central office folks. And how it worked was he's on the phone. We're like near each other. Everybody else is available around us, right? And so... He says, Vilma, I need this communication to go out. You got to do this. Make sure this. Check. OK. And then other people will come to me about what's going on at the school level. You are on the phone, handling all things on the phone. <laughs> um, so during this time, um, we also had our police come in to help us out. And this is all going to tie in. There's a lot of themes that we were talking about. So the system sent our CEO from Gaithersburg, the Gaithersburg cluster, Officer Ovalle. She was amazing. And I didn't have a chance to work with her. She was not my CEO, or she's not the CEO of the Quince Orchard cluster. But I do remember seeing her at different spaces. Um, one, just knowing someone who kind of knows school and who kind of knows how things work was like refreshing. And it's like, OK, I don't have to explain too, too much. And then the fact that she spoke Spanish was critical. Because she was out there and um, helping us out with the community, with parents, and all that. Um, another critical moment. So we're at the school. Things are moving. Things are flowing. But there was a point where we didn't know what the cause of this explosion was. Was it gas? Was it this? Do we need to evacuate? Are we in danger? All the things. And so as soon as that communication came through and that we weren't in danger, and we were fine, but we did make a decision to evacuate. And that's where we initiated our parent reunification or our parent-child reunification. 
And what that is, is that's when we physically take everybody out of the building um, to another off-site center where we then communicate with parents to come and pick up their children. Um, we did that in about, what, 10, 15 minutes? It was, it was that quick. Um, so throughout all that process, um, and that parent reunification went really smoothly because of the wonderful staff at Brown Station, and it's, they knew what to do. We practiced this every, at the beginning of the school year, and we practiced it in the spring, and we have scenarios, but it's not real till it's real. And they truly stepped up, and the relationships that the staff had with students and families was also critical. So we were going out there, they had their phones out, they're sending the group text or the class text to parents, English and Spanish, uncles, tias and tios, and everyone, are, they're coming and picking up children, and they knew everybody. So that was also very essential and, and very helpful for us. But throughout all that, right, throughout all the, all the moving parts, it was the partnerships, it was the silent sort of support that we got from central office. DHHS was there, um, Stephanie Izzard, Kyle Potter were there, and that's the first time I met them. <laughs> but they were such a support and such a relief, and they were truly checking the pulse and the temperature of what was going on at Brown Station. Um, they were our, checking our blind spots, checking on staff, checking on the social emotional well-being of the kids, looking at what, how the kids were reacting, how staff was reacting, even how leadership was reacting. And I know at one point, Stephanie was like, are you good? And I was like, yeah, I'm fine. It's like, no, are you good? And I was like, I got this. Like, we're going to go make it through. But throughout all that, um, just the attentiveness and how the process and knowing the process and having something in place that we could work off of. And I think November 16th, I was one month and 16 days in as a new principal. <laughs> um, you were three months in as a new director to the system. And so we don't really have a close relationship, but that made us real close. And um, so all that. And I think that the county, our partnerships, our community agencies, we really came together. The attention to well-being, just the attention to just the child. And then after that incident, students got home to their, to their families. The next day, the wraparound, right? DHHS came back, they came back with psychologists. We had students who saw it, who felt it, who felt that heat of like that explosion. Um, educators as well, they came back. They provided time, one-on-one -on -one time with teachers. Sub plans weren't even an issue. There was someone who went in there from central office and was with the children while teachers were with their students or with the psychologist. And that went on for two days. So it didn't just stop one day, and then the therapy dogs came, and that was that was a nice touch. And then just the gentle notes, you stopped by, like, like, like family came, and it was sort of that, like, we got you, we're here for you, and it was a nice sort of, and I said it at one of our debriefs, it was like a system hug, right? Like, oh, you're good. So that is sort of all the things I think that I was listening to and all the questions and all the, there's themes, right? And you can't predict what can or cannot happen, but it's about having a plan, being prepared, these partnerships that we need, the trust in, in the system, and just doing your job and doing what you got to do. Could you describe the communication to families? So the explosion happened. What so, did you say? When did you say it? Okay. So we are, I don't want to say trained, but the process is to communicate every 10 minutes to 20 minutes. So we provided updates. So the assistant principal, myself, we have the Connect Ed. So our laptops are open. The communication, we're still waiting. Um, we're still in the school. A decision for evacuation will be made shortly. We'll keep you posted. So Spanish first, then English in my community, right? So that went out in Espanol, and then in Inglés, you shoot it out on the connected um, through emails. And then that's, so you have your laptop up, your system is open, and every time there's an update, you get the queue. Now you gotta update the community on this, this, and that. And in the end, there was like, it's just continual updates. And if I can't get to it, the assistant principal can, and if not, the admin secretary can do it as well. Ms. Yang? Yes, hi. Actually, thank you so much. Um, I, 
It's good that you are here, and I can personally thank you for that day. Um, both uh, board member Rivera Ovens and I were actually on site that day, and it was a very orderly um, discharge. We went to the community center. We saw the our unification portion. But after that experience, I, I also saw central office staff, the emergency response team that went to the site. But after that day, when we were talking, and I was thinking there's a suggestion I would like to make. So Brown Station is primary um, Spanish-speaking students as a second language other than English, right? But in every, in all of our school, there are always some families that speak a different language. They might be a very super minority. But during an emergency situation, you have no time to, to find a translator, to get a language line, you know, to do all those uh, steps. So I would suggest our central office emergency response team will include, you know, at least all the major language um, personnel that can be dispatched on each side. Because even just one or two or 10 family in that distress situation when we're trying to find, uh, you know, Google Translate or whatever it will be, will be very traumatic for some of our students. So I would really like to make that suggestion. That's why I, I think I heard someone earlier say mm. plain English communications. Um, it's also important, so simplify yes. so everybody can understand. Ms. Rivera Avin? Uh, Vilma, gracias um, for, be, for being here because that day um, you were actually volunteering at the Up County Hub and <laughs> we were one of the partners that was called by HHS to come and support with formula and diapers and also baby food and other things. Um, so it was like, you know, double double hat wearing that day. And um, your staff was amazing. Not only did they did that, but um, one of your teachers actually went into the building to rescue a baby and a mom. I mean, like they went beyond the call of duty. Um, just a testament to the incredible staff of Brown Station. But I do, uh, do would like to make a couple of, of comments on it. Um, as Julie said, I think the, the Spanish version was great. It was email. I hope in the future we use texting as well. Yes. Um, because I think texting is, is, is especially for a lot, a lot of our parents, they're, they're working. It's not like they're checking their email, you know, and their desktop. They're like really working, like hands on. So, so there I, is a text option. Um, and we tried to be concise. Yeah. And I don't know how to text like the yeah. codes, you know, like, <laughs> like cut out vowels and keep it, yeah. but you're limited to about 60 characters or something. Right, like and, I, and I hope that the, you know, our IT system or whoever it is in the system looks at that to use it as a tool. Um, and, and that way you, you can hit you know, Mandarin, you can hit French, you can hit Spanish, you can hit all the major languages that our community um, speaks and, and it could be even a different ringtone, I don't know, but I'm not an IT person. Um, but saying that, um, I think the communication was great. I think where the breakdown came was with the other partners in um, fire and rescue when they were making updates to the community. So they were a couple of press conferences that were had, and it was led by the department, um, by the fire department, and I believe police. And in that venue of communication, the majority of the parents that were surrounding this press conferences were mainly Latino parents. And the Latino media was there, and they were eagerly waiting for anybody to say anything in Spanish that to know if this was, you know, a gas leak, to know if this was safe, to know where <coughs> would they go, is there going to be school tomorrow, what should, should we do? And at no point there was that... Um, that synergy with it. And I wish, because y you really are the face of that community in a sense, that I don't know how we can make this happen. So to learn from this experience that in the future, when you do have those press conferences, 
right? And you do want to get to that community that's most impacted, that somehow MCPS is involved, or you do your own press conference and you communicate with the parents and let them know, you know, whatever it, it was said. So for me, that was that was a disconnect that I even took aside um, Chief Goldstein and said, I'm, you know, I, I'm, I'm really upset that you have said so much to the community and what to do and, and where to go and who to call. And the fact that we have a shelter, right, that people don't know about. So we went around, we were, I was there till 1130, letting families know, because some of them were going to go with, and I was like, we actually have a shelter set up at Boer Park that you guys can go with no questions <laughs> asked. You don't need to let us know your status right or any of that um so so i'm hoping that you know from that we we can actually um have a very synergy with some of those uh, partners and it wasn't hhs it was mainly our, our our fire department really um which i know we do have some challenges uh with language access so thank you for highlighting that and as we prepare for the coming year and we prepare for unfortunately situations like this or similar we do that collective work across the board so we debrief the situation but we'll bring your source of feedback into our um, our planning for the coming year okay. mm -hmm. if we could cover the the final slides if we're done with this section if not yes and we just go to the last slide I think the biggest component is this just uh, concludes our presentation I do want to thank Brown Station for what they brought to the table to kind of bring all of the different points together C critical components that we walk away with today is that all of us work together around school safety and security. It is our schools, our responsibility to move forward, and that we do have many places in order to build upon as we get ready for the coming school year. So I do want to thank the board for the discussion, the recommendations, and the request. And I definitely want to thank Brown Station Elementary School for coming in and reliving what occurred, but also talking through it from the standpoint of what was needed and what they received at the time. Absolutely, thank you so much for coming and putting all of this into a reality, right, of a situation that actually happened and you had to live through whether you were ready or not. And it was great to hear uh, all the support that you received and how, um, you know, there's always lessons learned, but um, you all want, handled it very well and appreciate all the hard work that you do. Um, before you all leave the table, I just wanted to, I know this is a, almost a two-hour presentation. Um, clearly, safety and security. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this, is, this has been a lot of discussion. Um, a few things I wanted to highlight. Um, Captain uh, Satinsky, thank you for being here. And when you elevated that relationship piece, uh, Chief Jones and I met with the former SROs and CEOs when we were shifting the program and out of their mouths, and it was a room full of them, they said, we're losing the relationship here. So to the board members, to the comments that you made, I do think this is something that we have to uh, figure out a path for it. Because when I think about our students and their need to have more people that they can go to in their lives, it's just an important fact that we have to create those environments for them. And I also want to say we have a law enforcement program at Edison in which we need students um, who want to go into that. And we also have a need within our county to have those who desire to go into that, that force, that workforce, to take advantage of the diversity that we have in Montgomery County. And so all of that starts with relationships. And um, so I just want to thank you for, for elevating that today and for being here and explaining a lot of the information um, that we share. As we talk about safety and security, I, I saw some in the room. I see KB, I believe Steve was sitting there a minute ago, Cedric. Kevin, um, the, these are central office uh, security people who are out in our schools and they're supporting as rovers. And I have to tell you, when they, this year I've seen it myself, when I go out to the schools, the staff knows them and they appreciate them, it's especially in our elementary schools because it's just been simply new for them to have that. And so they are out there working and representing the work of safety and security in this district. And I just wanted to, to shout them out because they've sat here patiently, listened to this discussion, but they are a big part of implementation of, of that. Um, I thought that was Allison Baber, but I don't think that's her. But uh, she, I mean, she's another one. And so, yeah, they deserve a round of applause because they, they, 
they, they do a great job and with a smile all the time. Um, and that is consistent. Um, I know he is not here. Ed Clark has been pivotal in helping with safety and security over the past few years during COVID-19. I wanted to acknowledge him and his work and contributions to the district um, and working with the safety and security team. Um, and I'm excited about our new chief safety officer, Ms. Wheeler-Taylor, who, might I add, has been here since 3, 3.30 at our appointment. Um, and just her commitment to stay here to hear all of our comments. I have to tell you, Chief. I can call you that now. We appointed you earlier. Um, it, it was so good. And thank you for just sitting here and listening into this conversation so that you can be able to help us vision out what the board has set forward for us today and how we continue to build these partnerships. So um, we do look forward to your leadership and, um, and just thank everyone. Because if our children are not safe, they can't learn. And we want they, that's a necessity. And thank you for all the contributions to the conversation. Thanks again. We're going to move on to our next agenda item. Oh, I'm so sorry, Mr. Kim. No worries. I did have one more CEO question. <laughs> so sorry. I was saving my question till the end. No worries. He's not gone yet. I'm gone in three days anyway, so it's like not a big deal. Um, I, I would still like to hear um, a little more specifically uh, the plan to address a very, I think, prominent dispor disproportionality in student arrest data. Um, I, I know the data that uh, we looked at on slide nine wasn't the full picture, it wasn't fully disaggregated, but to me that, that still is a clear picture of disproportionality, um, it, which is really just a, 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 another step in a long time trend we've seen, certainly nationally, certainly in the state of Maryland, but even in our own Montgomery County, that has been uh, the long time uh, data that we've observed. And, and to me, it, if we're going to say that we're doing everything we can to keep students uh, safe in our schools, uh, yet um, we see that black and brown students continue to be um, arrested at disproportional rates, you know, to me that, and, and, and we see that and fail to address it, that to me that is putting these students at risk of being arrested and, and not really um, maybe we're taking the steps we need to to make sure that they are truly safe with this initiative, uh, which isn't to say that uh, it's impossible, like uh, cops should not have a role in schools at all, uh, that, that um, it's impossible to have um, a meaningful way for community partners, police, uh, community partners across the board to uh, work with us to, to contribute to student safety. Um, but to me, because that is so prominent, I, I think we need to take um, very conscientious, conscientious um, meaningful, impactful steps to address it. Uh, and again, I know you mentioned we're in the process of continuing to, continuing to garner feedback and um, revise the MOU appropriately. But to me, because this is just such a long time trend we've seen in our county, I, I would like to hear more about um, the plan right now to address that. And so through the CEO program or just in general? Um, I guess specifically the CEO program. So I think one of the components with the CEO program, um, the arrest data does show from what you see exactly a disproportionality in terms of the arrests. There are a couple of layers there. That is in response to an action by a student. What Mr. Monteleone described was one component in terms of the wellness component, um, being proactive with students in advance, learning what their needs are so that we don't move into a reactive stage or are moving into a portion of when there could be a uh, behavior or an action that would lead to something such as suspension and or an actual arrest. The other piece that we do have to look at is students' grounding and engagement with schools and also the consideration around what and how they're learning. So I think there are multiple components. One of the biggest pieces with our CEOs, um, as well as with our security assistance, one of the components we talked about with the safety summit is having the training and the understanding in terms of race and bias. And so I know through the police department, they do their own set of training around race, 
bias training and equity, but we also have our expectations here in MCPS in terms of how we deal with students. Um, one critical component I also see moving forward um, is how is it that we have students engage with our CEOs, maybe outside of school time, having that opportunity to have conversations, students who may not look like the CEOs and or from our data where we've seen our students of color who have been impacted the most. Um, so as we kind of, I would say, dig deeper and triangulate it, I don't think it's one particular thing um, overall, but we've talked about a bunch of different things here at the table that would support. I understand, um, and, and I think that certainly those preventative measures will go a long way, but it, you know, if we continue to make these efforts and have police continue to play a role in schools, um, and perhaps that, that training you speak of is certainly um, what might be meaningful, and I, I hope it is, but if, if we continue to make this effort, then that data, that notion of this, again, longstanding trend of disproportionality in that data needs to be at the forefront of the decision-making and the conversation. Um, and, and again, the whole point of this is to keep students safe, and, and the question is posed, if we know black and brown students are at risk of being arrested at higher rates, then are we really keeping them safe? Um, so I just hope that as improvements continue to be made, um, that this is something that continues to be closely monitored and remains at the forefront of the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Evans. Yes, I was just going to um, comment. My comment stems from Mr. Kim, and it goes back to you know what we stated very early on in the presentation. Um, I love how Dr. Computin pointed out the social influencers of health and education and also how this has to be an a community approach. So we talk about whole school, whole community, whole child, that we really have to tackle what we're dealing with in our schools um, with our community partners. So I, I appreciate you bringing that up. And I do, um, the presentation today was, um, it was good, right? Uh, I feel like the community needs to see how in depth we're going with this work. And when you were talking about, you know, the work that's being done or has been done around educational, like around the trust, establishing a foundation of trust and all that work that's going on, I feel like through those, um, while it sounds like it's a lot, 40 weekly meetings that you've had and you, you're feeding everybody, that you're, it sounds like you're around the table having discussion like we are right now, trying to figure out how to tackle this, how to approach it. I do think that as we do these community conversations that it will be important to, and not saying that you're not going to do this, but just reiterating the importance of kind of going back and letting the community know all the work that has been going on throughout the year, right? Because uh, we want to quickly have an MOU, but when I listen to all the things that you've said that you've done to get to the point that we're at now, I mean, this is important and we need to not, I don't want to say take our time, but I think it's important that we take the time to make sure that as we do whatever it is that we're going to do as we revisit and think about CEO 2.0 or um, bringing back in um, more security, making certain that we make it everyone feel safe and secure, that um, people understand the work that it takes and the work that we're doing to continue to ensure that um, not only our students but our staff feel safe. Um, but I was going to just, and not to say we weren't going to do this, is there some consideration to when we have these community conversations, bringing some of our CEOs so that people can see them, hear from them, hear what a day, like what a day is like for them, but also just to have people up close and personal mm -hmm. with the people that are engaging with our students in our schools, right? So Captain Satinsky doesn't know this, but that was the next step. I was going to ask for him okay. to join me on the road oh, show. Um, so. Sure. <laughs> um, no, we like want that. you there. Sorry. We yeah, want I you like there. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. Have him join me on the road yeah, show um, only because, like you said, we can only speak to it sure. as much, and it also makes people see them as humans um, and approachable, and that's really critical with this. And then I appreciate us having um, Ms. Nahetta here today um, to really help our parents hear that um, our administrators, our staff, we're thinking about our students as if they were our children mm -hmm. and how she says she texted her mother to let her know that she was okay, but she was thinking about attendance and, and, and who 
wasn't here, that could have been in that building, and just how quickly that they responded, that they acted. So I know I'm probably reiterating what um, some of my colleagues said earlier, but I do think it's important. I, I think that when you're, I'm a parent, right? I have a kid in the school system. I have a graduate of the school system. And when you think about emergencies, you don't instantly think about all the things that are going through the administrator's mind as to what they're doing to help keep your students safe and secure and the staff as well. And I appreciated um, hearing that uh, Ms. Izzard and other people were asking about her well-being, right? Because it's a lot that they're going through, and, and they're most importantly thinking about getting, making our kids safe, but making certain they respond really quickly to the community because they're, um, you know, um, at their wit's end trying to know that everything is okay, right? So I just appreciate the presentation today because it, it really went in depth, and um, we mentioned early on, too, we didn't point it out, but there's progress monitoring, right, that's happening that um, is important that people know that we're keeping a check and we're keeping an eye out on things and um, trying to be proactive and not reactive. So just wanted to thank everyone that came to the table today for all the hard work that you do and that you will continue to do on behalf of our students and staff. Thank you. Thank you so much for the presentation. Um, we are going to skip the recess and move on to agenda item number nine, preliminary plan presentations. And uh, we can start with uh, Joanne Lelick Elementary School. I don't know, Mr. Hall, if you have any opening remarks, so if we could go straight to Mr. Adams. Yep, we'll just welcome Mr. Adams uh, and the team to the table and let him take it from here. Sure. So, so thank you. Um, so with me today are, are Dr. Howard Barber, uh, principal of John Lelick Elementary, as, as well as Jim Detterman, um, principal of Craig Galding Davis Architects, just to make sure I didn't get it wrong. Um, so, so I will just start, and, and I know it's been a long day, um, but, but for the Northeast Consortium, this is a tremendously important project. Actually, the, the two next um, preliminary plans uh, are tremendously important. Just to give you background on Joan Lelick Elementary School. Um, we started this several years ago. We started out with two additions um, scattered, you know, within the Northeast Consortium to try to manage the the, the overutilization at Joan Lelick. At that time, obviously, there were this was pre-pandemic. They were approaching 900 students at that school, um, and they are 80, close to 85 percent. We were talking earlier, 85 percent walkers. You know, so this this idea of you know how we would manage um, you know transportation impacts the families around just doing boundaries associated with with moving kids to to, to other schools um, became very impactful. Um, so we we actually took a step back. We we uh, we spent quite a bit of time working with the community, and I would say through the, this is the testament to Dr. Barber's work. Um, this is the largest amount of feedback input that we've had in one of our projects in a very long time. Um, we had a very different approach to how we, we navigated translations. You know, we, we had experts in the, in the field to be able to communicate and not do the, the choppy translation process. Um, and we had incredibly impactful feedback. And that feedback was important because obviously we came, we're coming back to you with a, with a revised plan, which is constructing a brand new school uh, but also would move students to a holding facility during the construction. Um, again, that's very impactful for, for a community that's um, overwhelmingly walkers, but uh, it's one that we received that feedback. We talked it through, the, the, you know, the positives, the challenges associated with that, um, and worked through it as, as a team, and, and we're excited to, to show you a really, really great project um, that took a lot of hard work to get here, but uh, we're, we're very excited to present that. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Barber to talk, talk a little bit about um, the school, and then we'll dive right into the, to the plan. So good evening, everyone. I um, want to thank you for this opportunity to speak on behalf of my school community about this very important um, investment. Um, something that's very unique about me, I actually grew up in the Lella community, um, and then I've been principal of Joanne Lella Elementary of Broad Acres for the past seven years. During the past seven years, I've worked with my school community to advocate for different things that we thought that um, was necessary um, for our students to continue to thrive in their education. Something that's unique to the Lella community is we have a lot of our parents who are undocumented, but through the partnerships and relationships that I've developed with them, they've been able to actually advocate for things that they need for um, our community. Primarily, um, a new building. 
want to talk about this investment and how this investment is not just an investment in a building, it's also an investment in our students and also an investment in Montgomery County. Um, one of the major challenges that we've had was um, space. We have over 14 different portables spread out throughout our campus. At the point, we're at the point now where we cannot add any more portables because our facility actually backs into um, parks and recreation. Another unique thing to our um, current school site is we have two portables at the center of our drop-off loop where the buses actually drop off students. And my major, one of my major responsibilities is ensuring that um, safety first for our students. So I personally lock the gates after the um, final bus comes and leaves to make sure that our kids are safe because our kids literally have to cross between the portable, the, the, the two um, portables that are directly in front of the building um, to enter our building back and forth. So again, that's a safety issue that we um, need to have addressed and the plan that we have now is temporary. We need something more long-term to address that. Another concern is um, the school is seen as the hub of the community. We've had a lot of incidents, such as um, several incidents of um, homicide that's taken place throughout the community, but parents know that um, the school is a place where their students can feel safe and secure um, against any other incidents that may occur within um, the um, school, within the um, community. Another thing that we've had um, um, as a result of our work advocating and working together is to address the physical condition of our school. We've had incidents of mold um, over the last several years and also concerns about the indoor air quality. And we've worked with central office staff to address those, but the things that we've done so far are just temporary. We need something more long-term to address um, those um, concerns. And then um, finally is our growing population. We've dipped in terms of um, our numbers due to the pandemic, but we have a very transient population and um, our numbers right now are steady around 823, and I anticipate those numbers um, continue to increase as well. We border, for those who are not familiar with our community, we also border Prince George's County as well, so we have um, families who are constantly moving from Prince George's County over to Montgomery County, and the major apartment complex within our school community, Northwest Park, is actually split between Prince George's County and Montgomery County. All right, well, that we'll, we'll dive right in and we'll, we'll start to show you some of the, uh, the, the great architecture that has come through this process. So if we go to the next slide, please. Um, and, and I'm just, in the interest of time, I'm just going to walk us through the, the, the floor plans and then Jim will, will walk us through the, the renderings and the flyover. Um, but just, uh, if, you, if you all recall, the, uh, the site is very small. It is, uh, if I remember correctly, around six acres. Um, it borders a park. Um, We've we've tried to see if we could take a little more of the park property than what we currently have taken over, and that that definitely did not uh, did not result in, in um, you know fruitful conversations. But we we persevered and came through with a really good plan. The other part to this is that um, the access road. Typically, when when you think about school sites, we we try to have an access on two sides, at least two sides, so you can have a bus that comes in one one side and cars that come in the other. With this, there is just one small uh, roadway uh, that's um, borderline private road that, that goes to the school as an entry point. So, so we spent a lot of time really thinking about the site, and as Dr. Barber talked about, really you know, making sure we prioritize that, that, that outdoor pedestrian student um, family safety aspect of, of this. Next slide, please. And, and again, this just shows the, the floor plan. We, uh, because this is a um, predominantly walker walking school, uh, we can reduce the bus loop um, and focus on you know the parking and circulation. Although it is a predominantly walker, we do have quite a few um, parents that drop students off. So you know prioritizing that that loop and making sure that's efficient and and safe was a, was a big goal. As you can see, really just tucking this in, maximizing uh, as much as we could of the property. Next slide. And just to zoom in, so this is going to be a large elementary school. Uh, the capacity is 925, so much larger than our 740. But as you heard Dr. Barber talk about, that the uh, the numbers have approached 900. Right now, they're they're a bit lower, but we do we are forecasting them to uh, rebound at least into the mid to high hundreds. Um, so we put a lot of thought into this around adjacencies, around what spaces make sense. 
Um, we've heard from some that large schools are, are difficult, sometimes difficult to manage, but Dr. Barber's been managing 900 students for quite some time in a school that's built significantly smaller. So again, in our, in our d discussions and review of this, it, it just made sense to, to prioritize the community as a whole versus start to build smaller and, and do boundaries. But you can see, you know, just from a floor plan, we, we, this is going to be a multi-story site uh, school with, um, as, as you start to get into the Title I, you get into the community schools, you start to see the number of kindergarten classrooms um, start to grow. So you can see the first floor is predominantly kindergarten pre-K, um, as well as our first grade. And then obviously at, at the elementary level, you know, core space like the gym, the multi-purpose, the media, um, all that makes sense to be on the first floor. So there's a lot of competing interest for that first floor, uh, but the architects, um, Jim and team did a really fantastic job of, of tucking all that in and maximizing space. And you can see to the top right is part of the, the health and DHHS, that's the, that's the, you know, the partnership that we have with them, where they will be constructing that school-based health center that's, that's currently there. So it's a reconstruction of that key community space. Next slide. Again, as we go up to the next floor, you see the, you know, predominantly all second and third grade classrooms with some supports. Next slide. And this will be a th three story s school with, um, you know, fourth and fifth up on the top floor. And, and with that, we jumped one slide. So we're going to jump right to Jim. <laughs> so the, uh, the imagery of the building is really about the things that Dr. Barber wants the school to foster, which is academic excellence, community, inclusion, social-emotional learning, and wellness. So at the very front of the building, we want it to be an empathetic building, understand where you're going to go in the building. Don't, let, let's make navigation easy. So you see the very colorful entry, the tall glass entry lobby with all the flags of where the students are from to get that sense of pride and inclusion, and then some little bit of awe. We like to have some awe in the front lobby because awe is, is a great beginner of wisdom. And then the majority of the building is really uh, some uh, natural palette, and then we just focus the points of color where you need to help navigate or enter the building. Next slide, please. So there's the three-story classroom wing, which is really right next to the, to the forest the large forest right next to this site, which is the forest buffer to the northwest branch of the Anacostia River. So we took a lot of the vertical elements from the forest, little peaks of sky that you see when you're in a forest and you look out, and we tried to take the order of the forest and help make the building a sympathetic neighbor to it. Next slide, please. We also have two courtyards that we're able to have in the building. This is the media center courtyard. We all like these little refuge spaces that students like to huddle in by themselves. So why not put that out on the piece of architecture facing the <laughs> courtyard, facing what will be a quiet, serene park in that courtyard, and put on display neurodiversity and inclusion in the media center. Next slide, please. So this is the, what's facing the park, the, cafe, the multi-purpose room, the, uh, the gym, the, cafe, the, 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 the gymnasium, and lots of color, lots of energy, because that's what's happening right in front of it, color and energy and kids. And they get to look out of that transparent uh, 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 the cafeteria and look at all of the, the trees of the forest buffer in the park. So I think that may be the last of this. And let's do the fly, flyover. Oh, you've already seen it. <laughs> oh, so this really mimics the, the walk to school in the morning that, that the kids will have right up that promenade that's right in access with the front entry. You can see the big glass box in the entry with those colored LED lights, that, that little bit of awe that's there. And then here's the community space. So parents walk their kids to school, and they stand out front, but they don't talk to each other. Now they've got a space to have community, and what can we do for the school, and let's meet the teacher, and let's, you know, the, the food drive and the clothing drive. We've got a secondary entrance for the kindergarten, the pre-K, and the Head Start kids so that they're not, you know, bumping elbows with the older kids going in the main entry. A little softness with a green wall right next to it. Uh, we can do some inexpensive lights and a little bit of architecture to make that look pretty cool. Then here's the three-story uh, wing uh, facing south, so we've got some solar 
shading uh, on this building. Uh, we are we are designing this building to be net zero ready. Uh, so we're uh, we've got those ver that vertical graining uh, that hopefully helps it sit as a sympathetic neighbor right next to the forest. I've got my deep forest colors in the middle. Uh, so we, we, we have a, a little bit of softness and there's the, the pre-K play space right outside their classrooms. Lots of stormwater management, uh, highly landscaped, so lots of great views to landscape and what a healthy benefit that is for a, a beautiful uh, rustic site like this. Then we sit right next to the forest buffer, so uh, we're going to take a little walk right through the forest and uh, take a look at the west side of the building. Uh, the, the vertical circulation is that pop of color, so I'm going to know how to navigate this building. Wherever I see that strong color, that's where I go up and down. Now we can take a little, uh, little fly over into the courtyards and give you an idea. These are not wasted space. This is safe, quiet learning outside. What a healthy, great way to learn on a, on a, on a wonderful day. And then here's the small courtyard, that serenity, that quiet. Maybe it's an adjunct to the media center, or maybe it's just a little learning space. But here's the feel of that learning space right outside the media center. There are those portal uh, cubbies, individual cubbies, for students to sit in and have a great view of nature while they have their quiet private study. Um, the building is primarily masonry and metal panel. Metal panel where we need that pop of color. We've got three uh, vertical circulation spines, and that's the pop of color, so I, I know how to navigate this building. That's art and music classrooms here in this courtyard and another opportunity for learning space outside. Perhaps it's a, a sculptural a sculpture uh, uh, display out in the courtyard that's safe. Connectors from the three-story classroom wing to the core spaces. There's a music classroom that faces the forest. What a great view that's going to be. And then here's the, uh, here's the gymnasium as we come around to the north side facing the park. The gym with the play space out in front. Strong color on the gym, just like the strong, all the colors of the uniforms and the kids playing in the, in the fields across. And then there's the multi-purpose room with that energy, that high energy and that color and that great transparency to the trees. We tuck in the service drive. So we're not wrapping that all the way around the site and kids have free access to not have to cross a vehicular drive aisle when they're going out to the fields. Rainy. It's a rainy day, so we get a little bit of reflection on the, on the floor, on the ground. Yeah. Um, there's the entry to uh, the uh, H, uh, HHS rooms, the linkages to learning, and the school based health center is, is right there. And then here's the, act, the uh, admin building. It's, it's just a quiet building, just with all eyes on the street. A little bit of reflective glass up there so that you're at the building's actually reflecting nature. And then back to the community space in the front that will be so heavily used for the 150 people that attended our community meetings. Uh, they've got a space now uh, that really is going to make the school the center of their community. Beautiful. Thank you. Any questions from board members? Ms. Yang and then Ms. Evans. Hey. <clears throat> hello, hello. It looks really, really beautiful. Um, I do have um, some questions. So it's predominantly 85% people are walkers. Okay, so I see you have space in front of the building, but I want to understand how wide are the sidewalk leading to that space? How wide are they? Oh, it may be too many lights. I'll turn. Uh, sidewalks leading to the school are six to eight feet along the road, and that's going to lead you right to that center promenade that's very wide. Okay. Uh, that sort of all the buses get off, the, the vehicles get off, the kids from vehicles get off, and all the walkers go straight up to the front of the school. Okay. I'm, um, the reason I brought that up is I know standard sidewalk is five feet, but... We're talking about elementary school students. They walk with their parents. Their parents might push a stroller. So that five feet won't do. So I'm glad to hear that you are taking into consideration that the sidewalk needs to be wider for student safety. Now, um, another thing to consider. So I'm looking at your, your front door here and then your parking lot there. So it's a predominantly walker uh, school, so that parking lot is for staff mostly. 
So I try to understand why is it in the front, and how do people, if a parent is going to park there, what is the walkway pattern for them to get to the front door? Do they have to cut through the or walk with the cars behind the cars? What what is the traffic pattern for walkers there? Yes. So that's really two part questions. No, it is. So so with a school that's um, again Title One, a community school, the the staffing levels are are, are are pretty large at these elementary schools. We have to plan for you know parking for that 125 to about 150 um, staff members only. Uh, so so when you're thinking about staff, you know that circulation loop. How we organize it is that the. Um, for the loop itself, the drop-off loop, that is dropping off at the curb, and it's a long loop because, again, one of the things that we found here is that short entry of roadway, it, it stacks up. So we want to be able to get these the, the cars on site. But when you think about staff parking, staff are there before the drop-off happens. So staff are, are, are obviously, you know, navigating that parking lot. Visitors that come after school's in session or, or during school's in session, you know, they, they, they have those basically crosswalks that will cross the, the, you know, the walkway, put you on the sidewalk, which is directly adjacent to the school, and then take you to the main entrance. Um, it is a little different than, than high school secondaries, I mean, particularly from, from just arrival and, and circulation navigation. But what we really wanted to do was to get the cars off that road and onto the school site so that it's not blocking things up. Because what we find is the, un the most unsafe conditions happen when cars are, are getting boxed in, you know, called an intersection, you know, people are rushing. So to make that an efficient operation, uh, we feel is the best case scenario for, for pedestrian safety. There are also, um, there are only two buses that serve this school because there are so many walkers. Oh. So, and it's a very tiny bus loop. So the students only have to cross the one bus entry to get to that major promenade in the front to get up to school. That was going to be my Next question is because really I see answer. the bus loop and the pedestrian uh, sidewalk is very close together. But you are saying because there's only two buses, so it's not a major concern. You can also walk around the bus loop without even crossing it to get to the front entry. Mr. Sarkis and Mrs. Harris. Oh, Mr. Adams, with the headlight on. Did you want to talk to me before I show? Okay. <laughs> okay. So I would. So thank you. Uh, so I, first, I was going to say, Dr. Barber, I'm so glad that you started off by saying that you are from that community. I was going to share that. I just learned that last week. I think that is awesome that you are from that community. So you know, like what your community needs, and I'm sure they appreciate that. And Ms. Yang sort of, like, she didn't ask my question, but my question is going to be related to parking. But you addressed it, talking about how much staff that there is, and. Um, because I didn't see, I missed part of the flyby, so I didn't see the parking. I was just going to ask, do we have adequate space for staff? Because I'm sure they're all in the neighborhoods right now. I just wanted to make sure that that was there, but you addressed it. So that was, I just wanted to acknowledge it in regard to parking. Thank you. Ms. Harris and then Ms. Wolf. Yeah, thank you. I, I love this design. I think it's ingenious. I've taken all kinds of notes in my packet here. But just a couple uh, things. First of all, thank you so much. Looking at page 17 on the sustainability, really appreciate the attention to that. Um, I'll be really interested to see how we can move from net zero ready to net zero. No pressure. <laughs> well, well, really, all that means is we just have to put solar panels on the roof and we will be net zero. So so, so while, you know, that's one of the things that we're, we're working towards is do we, um, do, do we enter into a, a basically a purchase agreement to to have the power on the roof and we purchase from it or do we own the panels? So that's what we're working through right now just to but there will be solar panels on this on this roof. Okay. And that's for sure. Okay. Okay. Um, and looking at page 19, really interested looking at the mechanical systems. Um, particularly looking at um, and I know this goes to our net zero work um, and sustainability uh, looking at a uh, ground source geothermal and just wondering so I know we do have some geothermal in some of our schools um, particularly I think of like Matsunaga Longview and there have been challenges with that um, that school though is more than a decade old now and so I'm just wondering what we've learned from the Matsunaga Longview that makes it uh, you know makes geothermal here 
um, a good choice and one that we've we've kind of done all the troubleshooting that we need to do. And, that, and that's a great point. Matsunaga came online in 2003, so it's two decades old now. But um, you know, it was our first geothermal system. Uh, we we did run into some some problems, as a lot of our geothermal systems they. Uh, it's supposed to find equilibrium, you know, but we know we, you know, we have more, um, you know, cooling degree days than heating, so it's not necessarily equilibrium, equilibrium. And now that we spend more time in these buildings in the summer, it actually makes it a little more difficult. So, you know, we, we are sizing them differently than what we did 20 years ago, um, you know, but we also look at that in terms of worst case, biggest impact to the overall site. So when you when you do put a geothermal system in, it's incredibly impactful from a site disturbance. And so we plan for that in advance. Um, that's the first sort of take of, of how we would look at that that system. The other part to it is there's a lot of there's a lot of state law, a lot of legislators um, at the state level have put in um, state funding. Uh, criteria tied to geothermal systems. So we obviously, the first step is to try to maximize our state funding. We look at geothermal, um, but as we go through the process it, itself, as the design process move forward, if, if we find that it's not the best um, application uh, for this particular site, we, we do have alternative systems that we, we would transition to. Okay, thank you. And then the last question I have, you, you know I have a very long standing interest in the um, inclusivity in building design and inc including restroom design that systems like St. Paul Public Schools have been doing, um, both um, for the privacy it provides to students um, that our current restroom designs do not, and the, um, the safety, the anti-bullying impact of those designs. And are we looking at anything similar to what um, the kind of pioneering folks in St. Paul have been doing? Here. Yes. So, so we actually we bring slides just queued up just in case you know these these types of things. So, so we wanted to to show um, the pilot projects that uh, are happening at the high school level. I think we've talked about that before. That we are we're creating we, they're, they're they're essentially in, inclusive restrooms, but it means they're single occupancy restrooms um, with obviously appropriate supervision. So as this is, this is our standard, um, group toilet restroom, as you can see, you know, it's, it's usually divided, um, by gender and, you know, it's, it's somewhat isolated from the corridors. If we go to the next slide, um, you'll start to see what we're looking at, at, uh, this particular one is at Poolsville High School, where it's open to the corridor. There's single occupancy, um, restrooms. Uh, the, obviously, the, 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 the sink stations are, are out in the open, you know, it has full visibility straight through. The only caveat, obviously, is that um, students then have an individual space to enclose themselves in, which is a good thing in, in a lot of ways, but it's also something that we're navigating from a safety security standpoint. So um, it's, it's something that we're looking at at the high school level as this pilot. Um, but what we've heard, and again, we've talked about this a lot of times, you don't have to reinvent the wheel all the time. There's a lot of positives that come out of a, de a restroom design like this. Um, and quite honestly, overwhelmingly from all students, um, we hear that restrooms are the worst part of their day. And so uh, a, a restroom that provides a, a bit more privacy, um, you know, we're, we're hopeful that that is the, the wave of the future to transition from what we've been accustomed to. If you go to the next slide, there's just one more that shows, um, you know, sort of a different, uh, again, a different element. The one on the bottom right is, is one that, again, is open to the hallway. So supervision-wise, it's, it's, it's very visible to all those that are there. Um, and it's, it's one that, again, gives a level of privacy. A lot of technical details that go behind the scenes on this one that I won't go into, but we want to just show that these are some of the concepts that we're exploring from a pilot standpoint. I appreciate that. And the thing that I, you know, have done a deep dive on the work that's been done in other systems, and the, when the adoption of these inclusive designs drops their, their bullying and incidents by 95%, because these aren't tunnels anymore. These aren't caves where, you know, there's one way in and one way out. And there, um, that, and the, as you mentioned, that you know, there's no place to hide in there. There, except for when you go into your bio business, and we know students all across the system talk to about the lack of privacy that they now experience. And so, I do so appreciate that we are looking really creatively. And again, you know, places like St. Paul have been doing this for almost 10 years now, so we can learn a lot. Um, not reinventing the wheel because they've already done all this work. So, I, I thank you very much. 
I just want to say I love it. I love the two courtyards. And Seth knows what I'm talking about. And Dr. Barber, you can be really proud because I've been to to your school. And while it was spotless, it was crowded. Mm -hmm. It was crowded five years ago when I visited you. So I know that you're looking forward to this. And I remember you telling me, I know you're from the community, but didn't you tell me your sister and brother actually graduated from this elementary school? (laughs) So you can be very proud and have them come back and look at your work. So great job. Mr. Van Alvin? Um, I just really want to commend uh, Dr. Barber for um, the process of listening to how you included the families in this community. I would like us to replicate that with other communities. I think, I don't know if it was Seth who said that this was, you took a different approach than the cookie cutter that we have been doing for decades and then wondering why people don't don't participate. But you went the extra mile. I don't know if it's because you are from that community and maybe, you know, that's an an important ingredient. Um, But I just wanted you to know that um, that really empowers um, this community not only to be more involved, but also um, just to take kind of ownership of their kids' education and relationship that that builds with you in the future. And and maybe, you know, the, the older siblings are coming through and then you're going to see the next set of siblings coming through and, and hopefully that's going to even build a better and more trustful relationship because I think it's really hard for a lot of folks to understand that part of the dynamics that a lot of these communities, especially immigrant communities, face and deal with. And it's not that they are not interested or want to participate. It's how you make that space available and and just a, a space where it is safe to share whatever these parents have. So I don't know if you have some words of wisdom, but I just personally want to say thank you because I know that um, you are a very high farm school, almost 95%. You're a community school, and you're almost 88% Latino. So, you know, for you to have done that, it really means a lot to me. Also, another thing I wanted to share, um, I'm also, my family is also immigrant family. We come from um, Freetown, Sierra Leone, so I actually understand the story behind um, our families and what they're dealing with coming here to this country and also um, wanting to create those opportunities that I had in hopes that we'll have our kids actually come back to the community and do similar things to what I'm doing in, in the future. You're welcome. Ms. Yang? Uh, yes, thank you, everyone. Mm. And this is uh, related, but not about this particular schools because we just talk about the bathroom design. And I think it's important to uh, include many communities' voice, um, and uh, we have received, the board have received emails from different communities with different needs. So we're dealing with a large school system complex issue. So um, like um, the Muslim community has talked about their girls need to adjust their hijab in the restroom. So I want us to take, have different options and take uh, into consideration of many needs. Thank you. Oh, Mrs. Madraski. Yep, thanks. So I, too, want to express my appreciation for this. This is really spectacular. Y'all did a very good job. I'm so grateful for the outreach you did to the community um, and really focusing on important ways of targeting those who this is going to impact the most. This is what we would have loved to have seen for Gaithersburg Elementary School eight years ago. Um, So it's just really, really impressive. just a couple of quick questions. Um, I appreciate you mentioning the, the solar panels because I know you. I messaged you earlier about solar-ready inf- infrastructure, making sure that that actually means we're not going to have it in case we want it, but we're actually going to do it. Um, is there any um, green aspect to the roof, you know, the vegetation or whatever? Or is it just, or is it going to be all solar panels, which obviously... So there's so much uh, 
uh, competition for mm. roof space mm. uh, between mechanical uh, systems that are going to be up there as well as photovoltaics. We also have a three-story building that is to the south of a one-story building, so there's some shading studies we've got to do to see how it's going to receive sun that we really anticipate. We did, we did some studies about how much roof we want to maximize the photovoltaic area for the roof. So we're, we're able to do that and have the mechanical systems too, and I think that's probably it. Okay. That's fine. I was just curious as to. And, and I would say, you know, we, uh, we, when we look at the new vegetative roofs, mm -hmm. you know, putting them on the top, floor, top story of a three story, only seeing it from Google Earth doesn't, doesn't <laughs> help from the education element of the sustainability policy that you all pass. So we, when we do it, we look at a place, do it in an area where students can be engaged in it and understand it and be part of that, you know, sustainability education element. Okay. I appreciate that. Um, Love the bathroom concept and everything that Ms. Harris said about it. Um, but at an elementary level, what happens if a kindergartner or first grade get, grader gets locked in to the bathroom? And what are we, what kind of practices are we putting in place to make sure you don't have six kids all in there with their door closed? <laughs> They've only been doing it for eight years. I'm just saying. So, uh, there are toilet rooms in the kindergarten and the pre-K okay. Head Start. They have a special uh, teacher unlock. Oh, good. If somebody goes in there and it's locked and they can't get in, then there's a special way for them to get in. Same thing with the, the toilet rooms that we looked at there. Uh, if somebody's in there for too long, uh, you, we have ways of creating a signal that can go to somebody's cell phone. Like, so oh, you've been in there for 45 seconds, that's a little bit too long. So here's a they have a special tool they can get in if someone won't let them in. So there's, there's ways okay. of making it work. I just looking out for the safety of our young, our little ones. But um, I think that was pretty much all I had. I just, it's a great looking building. I'm sure it's going to make your community feel very, very proud. Oh, I did have one other question, though. They're now going to a holding school. Seth, how far away is the holding school that they'll be going? And how long will they need to be there? So, so we are looking at this as an 18-month process, mm -hmm. so construction. So um, I believe when we, we worked with the community, it was about a seven mile drive, but with traffic, you know, could take upwards of 20 minutes. Um, but that was fully, you know, dis discussed and reviewed with the community. We even okay. talked about how to get to the holding facility should parents not have, you know, the transportation right. access that, that normally have. So we, we walked through what the public transit looks like and, and obviously, you know, talked about coming back with more transportation options as, as we get further into We're not going to provide buses? Oh, yeah, absolutely, for students. Oh, okay. I, I guess I'm more talking about for pa parents. You know, oh, uh, we, right. we, we are thinking through those, yeah. you know, if a, if, a, if a child is sick during the day, how do you right. get to, you know, to that child and, and those sorts of things, so. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, Mr. Adams, do you have a resolution or do we, we're voting. Yeah, so, so it would be a, a motion to approve the, uh, the preliminary plans and then ultimately a vote. Uh, so Mr. Adams said we need a motion to approve. Well, I was, was going to move, but we don't need to read the resolution. I mean, the resolve part, or no? Mr. Yeah. Adams. Why don't we just go ahead and read the I'll resolve. just move it. Oh, okay. Okay. I'll read it. Okay. <laughs> I was like, do you even have it? <laughs> um, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Education approve the preliminary plans report compromise comprising the proposed schematic design documents for the Joanne Lelick Elementary School at Broadacres Replacement Project developed by Craig Galden and Davis Incorporated. Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hands. That's unanimous with those present. All right. Congratulations, Dr. Barber, and thank you for mentioning that community connection you had, because I was going to make sure I did that, but you do an amazing job there. And uh, Dr. Barber's staff, I have to say, if you have not had a chance to visit to go they truly are a model community school in how they connect with their community. Thank you so much. Okay, so up next we have one more, right? Greencastle Elementary. Yeah, so I'll just jump right in. This is the revised preliminary plans presentation for Greencastle Elementary. Um, and I'm joined by uh, Principal Ops, I'm a, these are tough names tonight. So, Ops Garden and Ops Garden. Ops okay. Garden. <laughs> Long out. <laughs> Woo. All right. Um, and also, uh, as you recall, um, Shiho Shibasaki, that's going to join me from uh, facilities. 
Um, so again, this is a revised preliminary plans. We were here once before, so I think we're gonna we're gonna make this a little abbreviated from the previous one. Um, but if you if you recall, the uh, this is an addition project. Um, but also tied to this is what we discussed with the, the county council and obviously here at the board um, was how this is also connected to the Burtonsville Elementary School project. Um, and the idea that when we construct the new Burtonsville Elementary that the, the, the older Burtonsville Elementary will go through a form of renovation for early learners, which include PEP, which include pre-K. Um, so one of the, the, the pivots that we've had with this particular project um, was again from a design standpoint, we 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 scaled back the design slightly, which means it went from a two-story to just a one-story addition, uh, with the idea that you know those um, four classrooms, four classrooms of PEP and one classroom of pre-K would ultimately transition up to the old Burtonsville to create that East County Early Education Center. Um, so I just wanted to, to highlight that because that is a, a, a deviation from when we first started out with this. Um, one of the things that uh, was discussed at the last um, presentation was just this idea of um, the what ifs. Okay, if there's a delay, what, what are the, the impacts to the students going to be? So if we could go right into the, to the slides, I'll, I'll highlight a couple things here. Next slide, please. And again, this is just the site, the overall site plan. Um, you know, one of the things that we talked about was the the idea of enhancing parking, uh, but also what what becomes of that black the back blacktop area, and is there an opportunity to create an outdoor learning environment? Absolutely. So, so the reference to the courtyard before was the, the idea that a courtyard is a really good element to have in schools. But I'll just be honest with you, courtyards are are constructed for more for daylighting than they are for creating a courtyard. So this particular model of school, um, Greencastle, which is a, a, a prototype, a repeat design that we have across the county, was not one with an interior courtyard. But we do have options to, to again, create those outdoor environments, um, which we will, we will do here. And you can see back by where the portables are, once those portables come off, that will be you know, a primary location for us to create that outdoor learning space. Um, it's 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 nestled next to the to the wooded area. It's it's in a good place for supervision. It is ideal from that perspective. So not a courtyard, but it is definitely a an ideal outdoor learning environment um, that we can create. So if we go to the next slide, we'll just dive in. Um, this is the existing existing plan, just for everyone's reference. Um, let's just go to the next slide, and we'll dive right into the floor plan here. So, so this particular plan again is is to create an addition out front. The um, the Ronald McNair Elementary is again the same school uh, as as Greencastle, same construction, and we've had success building out towards the front. Waters Landing uh, is again the same school, but we built out the rear of that particular addition. This this siting plan does make more sense to us to construct out front. So that's why you see that in that blue area where that addition will go. Um, it makes sense to construct there, and it also makes sense to construct the DHHS partnered linkages and learning space out there as well to provide that parking. Um, and as you can see from the top, the, uh, the expanded parking, uh, more efficient drop-off um, loop. We talked about that from the last slide, but the, uh, or the last presentation, but a more efficient drop-off loop does make uh, the efficiency of arrival and dismissals so much, so much better and more efficient, but more importantly, more safe. And for anyone that's visited the school, which I think many of us have, uh, I've ended up parking out on the street. So looking at um, parking to you know fully support you know the staff and visitors uh, for this particular school. Next slide. Um, again, this is existing floor plan. You can see in the front, and I'll just highlight this, and, and we'll get into it from the next. The the front pep um, uh, classrooms they were originally constructed as the kindergarten classrooms. Uh, so in all the other prototype schools, they are the kindergarten rooms. Um, and that is where you have, in the kindergarten, we have the, the restroom facilities. You can see on this particular site, because of the, the larger PEP um, program, uh, you know, the team has had to shift the kindergarten up to the upper portion. Uh, the, the kindergarten is in, you know, an old music room. It was in a repurposed uh, first grade classroom. So. Uh, and then the pre-K is up there as well. The pre-K does have a restroom that was retrofitted, but the others are traditional, what we would consider tr traditional, you know, one through five classrooms. 
And again, this is an existing floor plan. Next slide, please. And so when you get into the addition, um, you know, one of the, uh, one of the areas that makes sense, obviously, is to construct more of our kindergarten classrooms. And so we would construct the three kindergarten classrooms, which are traditionally what we construct, kindergarten with an interior classroom. And, and we're showing on this plan existing kindergarten classrooms up, up on the top plan north here above the, uh, you know, the media center in, in their current location. What we did not show at that first presentation was retrofitting restroom facilities in those spaces. But this plan, we are coming back to add restroom facilities in there. Even, even though, you know, we will, trans, once the PEP transitions out, those kindergarten classrooms will move back into where you see PEP here, um, which was traditionally where they were supposed to be. Uh, but, but through the discussion and, and, you know, from the board, it, it does make sense to retrofit those spaces to add those four restroom facilities uh, for the school during that transition between when they are finished and when uh, the new Burtonsville Early Education Center opens up. So I just wanted to caveat that. And you can see um, up on that plan, they, there, are, um, there, there, there are restroom facilities in your preliminary plans. We have a, a zoomed in version at the back of your brochure. But, but we will create those four additional restrooms as part of this overall project. All right, next slide. And, and again, the second floor remains untouched. Uh, it, this is really is a, an addition out the front. It will be occupied, um, you know, so students will be at the school. Uh, this obviously is part of the program we're working through right now to, to re-look at the way we roof, the, the look at the materials we use. So that will certainly be into consideration for us as we move forward. Um, but that's it from an update. I don't know if, if I want to turn, if you want to say a few words about the, the process or Greencastle Elementary. No, I mean, yeah, I, I was just here a month ago and certainly shared all of our needs at that point. Um, the one thing that I do just want to say to the board is to thank you for the opportunity and for your advocacy. Uh, we heard a lot of great feedback from our staff, from, the, from parents, from the community. There were great questions that were asked last time, and people really heard that as advocating for our school's needs and our, and our community's needs. And, you know, inviting Ms. Wolf out to come see our school and tour the building and see our needs. Uh, we just want you to know that the Greencastle community really appreciates um, the time and consideration of this. So thank you. Uh, we don't. Ms. Wolf, and then we'll hear from Ms. Yang. I, I, I didn't see the order, so. I just want to thank you for taking into consideration our comments from the last board meeting. I was really pleased with my visit there in being able to conceptualize what the adjustments would mean and whether or not we could actually do them. So, I, you know, I really want to thank you, and I want to thank Seth for, for really hearing my concern about the difference in treatment in neighborhoods, so thank you. Ms. Yang. Yes, um, I uh, trained as a teacher and worked in elementary school before. <clears throat> I wholeheartedly support our effort to put in these restrooms in the kindergarten classrooms. However, I have a question. I was reading through the documents. Am I correct in understanding each of these restrooms cost $80,000? Uh, is that the estimate? It's, it's probably a little higher than that. Um, uh, even yeah. higher than that. And, and it, we are using existing pipes, like, already there. So I, I want to have an understanding. I'm in the middle of uh, getting quotes to renovate my, my own bathroom <laughs> at home, right? And this price is scaring me, because I was thinking with this price, I have jacuzzi, uh, fountain, shower heads, you know, all that good stuff. So just, just tell me, you know, um, you know why? why the cost is so high. So, so I, I know, you know, a lot of times when people compare the construction that we do to residential construction, the, the two couldn't be further from, from each other. Um, the amount of codes uh, that are involved in the work we do from ventilation to exhaust, um, Somewhat similar to residential, but very different in terms of educational classification. It, it, it does change the, the the scope and magnitude of what we have to do. Um, so each one of these restrooms, you know, obviously is uh, is is a renovation. It's it's you know 
going below the slab. It's an existing slab. So again, you, you typically a, a, a house doesn't have a, 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 a one foot piece of concrete underneath the slab that has to be cut and, and we have to, to, to make the connection. So, so it is a very complicated and expensive endeavor to add restrooms. But I would say we add restrooms in, 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 in a lot of our facilities over the summer to accommodate you know, our special education programs, to accommodate pre-K. This is something that we're, we're used to, to navigating. And, and while the price tag does sound high, it is something that I, I feel that we've, um, we've spent a lot of time to really refine what we do to, to be the most cost effective uh, as possible in going through these processes. Um, I appreciate the answer. So um, my whole point is, we sign up for this big project with this firm. I understand this is an add-on component, um, but in MCPS, we have lots of school on the waiting list, you know, to get work done. So I just want us to be very mindful of, um, you know, that working with our architects and construction to bring the cost down um, so that we can get to more schools and more needed populations. Thank you. Okay. okay. There's no other Everybody, discussion. I'll read the resolution. Yep. Right. Therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Education approve the preliminary plans report comprising the revised schematic design documents for the Greencastle Elementary School Addition Project developed by Profit and Associates Architects. PC. Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hands. And that is unanimous. Right. Congratulations, Principal Hops Gardner. Thank you very much. You and your community. Thank you so much. Our next item is uh, agenda item number 10. We are going to have a COVID-19 vaccination mandate uh, discussion. Uh, Dr. McKnight? Um, yes, so we'll be bringing forth a resolution to the board. Uh, Really quickly, in September of 2021, uh, the Board of Education adopted a resolution mandating that all Montgomery County Public Schools employees uh, provide verification of the COVID-19 vaccination. Um, that was a recommendation at the time. We followed suit, and that was documented. And we also put in a provision for those uh, who could not be vaccinated to have a medical exemption. And we requested that they do that by October 29th, and that was back in 2021. Um, so at this time, we are returning to our first school year, um, system-wide, in-person, not under the conditions that we've had to deal with in the past few years of COVID-19. Um, and we also have, you know, a number of changes have happened since then. We've had our younger children who have uh, availability to vaccination as well, um, the rapid testing has been available to families in ways not only coming from the school system, but the government, federal government, being mailed to homes. So a lot's changed, essentially. And so now that we have more knowledge about COVID-19, we've put a number of prevention and treatment things in place. Um, we believe that the health and safety of our staff still remain absolute priority, but we are no longer in the state of a national emergency. So with that, we brought forward a resolution um, you know, sharing that we should recommend considering that if COVID-19 vaccination be transitioned from a requirement of the employee to being a highly recommended personal health choice for employees. And so Dr. Kapunin is here if there are any questions, um, but we do have a resolution. No, read it. Any questions? Okay. Dr. K, shall I read the resolution? Just the resolve. Okay, um, just the resolve. <laughs> so this is the resolution for the COVID-19 vaccination mandate for Montgomery County Public Schools employee employees, and therefore be it resolved that the Montgomery County Board of Education rescind the COVID-19 vaccination requirement for all Montgomery County Public School employees and transition to a highly recommended health action determined by personal choice, and be it further resolved that the Montgomery County Board of Education supports other COVID-19 mitigation strategies, including health communication, access to vaccinations, and other preventative measures. Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hands. And that's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kapoon. <laughs> Great job. So we are at agenda item number 11. This is a year in review, which, you know, it's intended to be a celebration 
of the culmination of all the, uh, the, the successes that we've had throughout the year. I know it is getting late, so I ask uh, that we uh, be um, efficient in our, in our comments as we hear this, again, presentation is intended to be a celebration. So with that, I pass it on to Dr. McKnight. Yeah. Thank you, uh, President Silvestri. So this is um, clearly what it states as President just said, year in review. Um, this is something we look to do moving forward at the end of every year, just to provide a public snapshot of some of the accomplishments that we've had this year. We sent out our Roundup newsletter to the community to share it there, but we also wanted to, again, make some specific highlights in our, brief highlights in our board meeting. Um, much of what you'll see reflected in the accomplishments you'll see from our high schools. Many of you had the opportunity to visit our graduation ceremonies and, and just see our young people be acknowledged for the work they've done in the K-12 model and then celebrating what they're going to continue to do. But many of them were noted for making achievements in academics, in extracurricular activities, athletics, you know, just leaving the school system with so many different experiences. And so as we celebrate these milestones, it's important to constantly remind ourselves that they don't happen in isolation. Um, and that these milestones that we celebrate at graduation really reflects students from, in many cases, pre-kindergarten to graduation. Um, you know, I mean, they, they come to us this tall and, you know, they leave us with the life ahead of them. So. One of the big reasons we launched the Pathways to College Career and Community Readiness, and that was for us to be able to make a collective commitment to our students about all the things that we're going to intentionally continue to do as a school system to make sure they are ready for all of those pathways when they graduate. So as we look at the presentation um, today, just keep that in mind and also know that we should be very proud of the support that we've, you provided as a Board of Education to our community and to our students um, and the staff in terms of helping them to be successful and asking us to remember that behind each number of student, when you think about the student IDs, there's a face, there's a name, and there's a student who is filled with hope. And it's up to us to continue to, you know, to reinforce that um, so that they can continue to have that hope to reach the aspirations that we know they have every potential to accomplish. So with that, I'll turn the presentation over to Dr. Murphy. Well, thank you, Dr. McKnight, and um, I want to also start out by saying thank you to all of our staff, our principals. Uh, one of the things that I found uh, very refreshing is that we had all of our elementary and middle school principals at each one of the graduations. They stood and were, were recognized, as well as the faculty and staff. And so I think the message there is this is a pre-K through 12 continuum. While we get to celebrate it at the high school and see the seniors across the stage, it's really a team effort for us to be able to get there. I also want to preface, as Dr. McKnight has and Ms. Silvestri, you're going to see this information again. This is just a snapshot. This is something that we should be proud of. And as I sit in graduations, I wonder, wow, this is pretty impressive. I wonder what this looks like across the district. So that's giving us a sense of what that looks like across the district. So this year we had 12, next slide please, we had 12,722 graduates walk across our stages. Um, the largest graduation that we had was at Montgomery Blair. Thank you, Renee Johnson. They had over 700 students cross their stage. Our students earned over $262 million of scholarships, and both of those are in athletics as well as in academics. And that's really to provide them for a variety of pathways. This is connected to the blueprint. This is connected to college career readiness. And so they may take paths such as the two, four-year institutions. They may go straight into careers. I do want to highlight the 50 students that are moving into military service. They were recognized and stood at many of the graduations that I attended, um, and that's cumulative across the district. So thank you for their service and also th that recognition. Next slide. We're going to then look at advanced coursework, and uh, while we've identified the different uh, particular areas, I want to do a little uh, combining of information here. So if you take the first two areas of advanced placement in international baccalaureate, and this is, there are some duplications of numbers, so if you add my numbers up, they're going to, they're going to be different. But we had over 24,000 students enroll in at least one AP or IB course, and collectively, these students enrolled in over 58,000 
courses. So that speaks to the idea of rigor. Uh, if we look at that um, and disaggregate that by um, ethnicity, we had over 5,000 students who identify as Asian. We had over 4,000 students who identify as black or African American. We had 4,800 uh, students who identify as Hispanic or Latino. And we had 8,700 students who identify as white. So uh, there are some areas for growth, but there's a pretty good distribution among that. We also had about 1,200 students representing about 5% of the population who identified with two or more races. For students, uh, the predominant class that they take for the advanced placement is the government and politics, and that represented approximately 6,300 students. In addition, we had se over 1,700 students participate in uh, dual enrollment courses, uh, and this was highlighted at one of the celebrations we had at Montgomery County. And together, those students earned over 22,000 college credits, 279 students earned over 50 college credits, and 238 graduates from uh, MCPS were also Montgomery College uh, graduates and had earned an associate degree. So um, that sends a positive message, also something I think we can build on in, uh, as far as how students then transition. Next slide, please. So we know that uh, student service learning hours are part of our graduation requirement, and it's part of giving back to the community. It's also preparing students for those career experiences. And this year, our students earned over 1.5 million <laughs> service hours, giving back in some way to the community. At the graduations that I attended, uh, which were several, they ranged from students being recognized uh, between 700 and 1,000 uh, service learning hours for one individual. So while they may exceed the requirement, there are individuals that um, really enjoy giving back in some way. Many of these service learning hours are earned through courses, but they are also earned through some type of work with community partners. And again, I think our students benefit, but also it sends a positive message to our community for their involvement. If we move to the next slide, we look at worst work-based learning opportunities. Uh, and this is getting uh, students ready for some type of career readiness uh, programs. We had over 200 students in healthcare or education, uh, child development. We had 100 students enroll in some type of information technology path, and 75 in business, finance, and hospitality, and tourism, with the balance in law enforcement, art media, plumbing, uh, and engineering. One of the things I'd like to highlight that's part of this that many of our students are experiencing this summer, uh, 900 of our high school students are represented uh, in the 65 plus career industry or um, that, that are sponsored by over 185 employers in the region of Pennsylvania, Virginia, Maryland, of course, and even California, and you folks know that program as Summer Rise. And so there's another avenue for them to begin to earn those service learning hours, but also become integrated into the community. Next slide, please. So now we look at career and technical education. We had over 16,000 students who enrolled in some type of CTE course experience of those earning industry certification, close to 6,000 students earned those industry certifications. There are over 51 programs and 11 CTE uh, clusters uh, for students to be a CTE completer, and we're gonna bring that data back to you in the fall because they're still tabulating it, but just for your knowledge, they have to have a concentration in a particular uh, cluster area of somewhere between three and five courses, depending on what the a particular area of concentration. So look for us to bring that data back to you. We also recognize, next slide please, that along with our academic uh, programs, uh, we have strong athletic programs to give us a sense of the, the various championships our uh, students have earned. We have over 22,000 students who have participated at the high school level and 4,500 students at the middle school level who participated in uh, over 44 team sports um, at the high and seven team sports at the middle. Um, one of the highlights I think we want to underline is with the recent adoption of the budget, uh, we are now going to be hiring uh, specific to Montgomery County Public Schools 25 certified athletic trainers 
And those athletic trainers are going to be important in supporting our students to make sure that they're safe on the field uh, and they get the, uh, you know, the appropriate attention uh, when they do uh, suffer any types of injuries. And then finally, uh, looking at scholarships and, and um, awards, uh, many of us saw that students had either some type of medals or cords, and I think the predominant one is the uh, Maryland Seal of Biliteracy, which we had over 1,800 students earn that certification, as well as over 900 students earn the Maryland High School, um, the Maryland uh, Governor's Merit Award, uh, and that's awarded to students who are in the top 5% of their graduating class. We had a wonderful celebration uh, sponsored by Ruth and Norma Rails and former board member Patricia Neal, where students received a $10,000 scholarship. Uh, approximately 194 of our students received those scholarships, and that was because, uh, at a minimum, they had earned a 4.6 um, GPA, uh, and those are for low and medium income families. 20 of our students were recognized for National Merit Scholarships, and 524 of our students received College Board National Recognition Program Academic Awards. Um, I think part of this speaks to the fact that this is a return on our investment. We constantly talk about the investments we make uh, and how proud we are of our students' progress. While these are um, specifics to uh, numbers this evening, I think behind each one of these numbers, there is a story. Stories about individuals and the resilience they, they have shown. Probably the largest message for this graduating class was the consistency that these students, if you recall, entered when we were just about on the threshold of the pandemic. So they have had um, a uh, very different high school experience than many of our students have had in the past. Um, and hopefully uh, they can grow and learn from that. But I think it speaks volumes to the investments the community is making and the outcomes our students are showing us. So thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. I think, as you said, we're going to uh, visit all of these topics throughout the year in different agenda items. So look forward to that. And what a great way to end our last board meeting of the school year. So. Can we give a round of applause? <laughs> Amazing students. Mm. Moving on to our final, well, almost final agenda item, consent items. Board members, do you have anything that you would like to pull? Ms. Harris. Uh, yeah, I would like to pull item 12.1, please. Anything else? Um, could I just, Ms. Ms. Modrowski? Yeah, I just, 12.2 uh, and 12.1, but it was already said. And I just have a question for clarification. Is there an ACES contract in this consent item list tonight or not? ACES contract. With, with, with I didn't see one. Oh, I, I have to abstain for that contract. And in the, um, in the board docs, there was a list that included ACES. So I, I just, I need to abstain if there, if there is. I didn't see one. In my that that we're get, that we're was no. from the last board meeting. It was the the wrong um, notes were provided. Under, yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, so can I get a motion to move uh, twelve three to twelve twelve? Sorry, to what? Fifteen. To twelve fifteen. Twelve fifteen. Twelve fifteen in block. So moved. Second. All in favor? Raise your hands. That's unanimous. 12.1. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I just like, I would like to get some more information on the uh, contract tips, TIPS 210903, cafeteria point of sale, um, uh, $433 million on, um, he says a meal viewer menu system, and got a little bit more detail on that. And, you know, primarily I'm channeling the students of MCPS who still, every time I'm out in schools, are talking about the fact that the central menu items that are broadcast are very rarely actually present in their pool cafeterias. And even as late in the year as May, um, equitable di distribution of the things that students want by the fourth or fifth lunch period, nothing's left. 
Um, so wondering if this is going to help get around some of the issues with apparently supply chain. Can I just um, clarify something? You, Four hundred and thirty-two thousand dollars. Oh, sorry. What did I say? A million. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, mm, I, was I don't think so. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. Okay. sorry. 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 Thank you. Thank you <laughs> very much. It's late. It's late. <laughs> I was like, what? Good evening, everyone. I'm happy to answer the question. And yes, not 444 million. Sorry. <laughs> My heart dropped a little bit. <laughs> yes, you are right. Um, so we're really excited. The, the contract says cafeteria point of sale because we do own the um, software for the Heartland program. So Heartland has a ton of K through 12 food service programs. And so for us currently, we have our new in point of sale program. So where the kids, you know, put their ID card or swipe their badges, that's part of our Heartland group. They also house our farms applications for Heartland and also the My School Box, right? So we already have three software programs that kind of fall under our cafeteria point of sale. And so this one that's added on, all comes under that umbrella of Heart, Heartland, and so it does two things. So one is the front of the house, so just like you were saying, for schools. So digital displays in every cafeteria around this size of like a TV screen with a meal viewer, but also that meal viewer is available online. So rather than having to post our cafeteria menus, it's hard to find on a website where people are navigating many things through the DFNS website. The meal viewer will come up and be available not only in the school cafeterias, but it could be desktop, you know, Chromebook, phone, Apple Watch, all of that. And then within that, as we load our menus, it helps us do our nutrition analysis. We previously had software for nutrition analysis, allergens, and so we'll all combine into once. So when we load our menus, the meal viewer will then load allergen information, which also is posted on our website, but then parents and students would have to go separately to go ahead and look at that. And so students can kind of favorite their meal and take a look at the different menus. But on the back end of it, and really our back of house, it allows us to track production records, see where schools are ordering too much, where schools are ordering not enough food, which results in maybe not getting your first choice in an elementary or secondary school. It helps us look at production costs based on how much you know is being consumed or wasted in our schools. And that it also includes um, vendor orders, invoicing, routing. We currently have separate programs for them, but they go back to 1997, 1999, and so, and they're all old, outdated software that doesn't integrate well with Heartland. So it's not just the meal viewer, it's the meal viewer in the front of the house for the students, but the back in the house to analyze as well. It could help increase meal participation and things like that. Um, it really directly co correlates to our strategic plan, just in terms of our operational ex excellence, in terms of DFNS, being able to see what's happening in real time and being able to troubleshoot with our schools. And then just our students' well-being, being able to see the allergens and the nutrition information in real time as well. So is there an inventory control feature that would help with um, expired? So we did have a lot of you know kids sending me screenshots this year of expired, you know, products that they were getting at in lunch. Would that help with that? There's inventory control, um, vendor ordering, school will order directly from that software. They use outdated, I mean, it's, it, 1999 is the, the vendor yeah. um, information they use now. So it'll all route together under one umbrella. And is there a way, um, so for students to, first of all, indicate, you mentioned they could make favorite mm -hmm. things, but does that data go to their cafeteria manager so the cafeteria manager adjusts ordering to the preferences of the students yes. in that school? Yes, and it will give you suggestions under the product, production records in the same program because it's all fa falling under the same program. So it says cafeteria point of sale, but that point of sale where the students are purchasing is going to the front of the house, so helping cafeteria manager, and then back of the house with the production. So if the schools, like a manager is trying to order order things, the production in the app or the software will actually stop and say, hey, your data does not support ordering, you know, you're doing too much or too little okay. in terms of that, that piece of it. Interesting. And is mm -hmm. there a way for students, you know, around the ad advocacy they've been doing and they oftentimes don't really know the most effective place to direct it, um, take it to the principal, take it to the cafeteria manager, what, but if they're noticing, you know, two months in that they're there's still this mismatch. The kids in the fourth lunch period never have any choices. Is there in, something in here that would let students sort of speak to that? Absolutely, they would be able to see that 
because the data is transparent. So the manager would be able to see it. The man manager can share with the school, the community, and anyone. And just it's right there at your fingertips. And this it, will be de deployed in all 210 of our schools this year. Correct. So what we'll start, what we'll start off doing is this summer. So this is a one-year contract to start. It also includes the professional development and tech support for 12 months which is key. So that will include training for our cafeteria managers, training for our supervisors, training for the central production facility staff. So we would anticipate the cost would be lower if we're continuing, which we, we really use so many of the Heartland products that we've been happy with. So I imagine we would continue, but at a lower price point because I believe we would not need the training and support you know, in year two. So it's really just that rollout plan this year. Okay, and so you said year one. So what happens next year? Well, year one, the training and support comes directly from Heartland. So okay. we'll train to be trainer, train them, trainer models. We'll develop training materials in house along with the Heartland support staff that will okay. just carry us over until the. Year. So this won't be a repeated contract that keeps coming back to the board. The Is contract it? for the software will come back, but not. We won't include the professional development and training past year one. Okay. All right. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. I think it seems like that's a good price compared to what we're really excited spend on about. some other things. Oh, no, we were really excited. <laughs> and about compared that. to the four hundred million, <laughs> but um, yeah, suddenly you made it feel like a bargain. <laughs> um, so that was one of my questions, and um, so you already addressed that. Um, in the interest of time, um, Ms. Hazel, I'm not going to ask you to address this now, but um, four eight. 8.3.1, the literacy and mathematics intervention materials for middle school. It reads um, evidence-based tier three literacy and math intervention programs. That's great. I'm going to vote for it. I just would love to get some information um, in terms of the evidence-based part, because I think that's what I've been looking for in different programs. Yeah, thanks. And then my um, only other question is um, 9442.4, Energy Management Systems Contractors Pre-Qualification for like what, roughly a million dollars. What is that and why do we need it and why can't we determine who's qualified? Or isn't there like a state agency or something that makes determinations on qualifications? Can someone answer that one? <laughs> coming down. So this is to pre-qualify um, the energy management providers to, to work for. Essentially, they're contractors. So mm -hmm. um, the energy management systems are, are the ones that control all of our HVAC systems ac across the district. You know, many of them are antiquated, so these contractors come in and, and will help uh, replace parts that that we we are unable to manage. They'll 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 come in and do uh, smaller scale you know repairs. Mm -hmm. We bid out separately the full replacements, but these are the pre qualification for the contractors to work on on existing systems a across the the two hundred ten schools. We don't already have a list of qualified people. Y you have to you have to continually pre qualify. So uh, typically it's a it's a one year with multiple year extensions. When you get to the end of the extensions, you have to re pre qualify. That seems crazy. <laughs> it would seem like the state or somebody would make those determinations as to who's qualified. But if that's what we have to do, that's what we got to do. All right. Thank you. Can I get a motion to move 12.1 and 12.2 in block? Can I um, ask about 12.2? Oh, yes, I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, the computer adapted student testing system, if I could just get, I feel like, again, this is one of those where a contract after contract after contract comes up about student data stuff, so I'd like to understand what this one is. Sure, not a problem. So um, probably very familiar, you've heard the term map testing that we test. That's for map testing. Um, so we do map testing uh, three times a year in grades three through eight. It is a um, computer adapted test, meaning that it, it, it adjusts based on the student's ability. It's built into our pathway and our evidence of learning. It's also uh, correlated to student performance on um, the MCAP assessment. So it's one of our primary assessment tools that we use. For student learning. I somewhat didn't also understand the request to bridge the contract between Cecil County Public Schools and Northwestern Evaluation Association. 
So we're, what, we're, what we can do is we piggyback on contracts. Oh. Um, so we, when we piggyback on somebody else's contract, normally just just to know the, the cost savings that we got out of this too is that normally this is this should be around 2.5 million. Oh. We were able to get it down to 1.3 with the piggyback of the contract. Okay, cool. Miss, did you have something? You want? I just saw you push your button. <laughs> okay, go. All right. Can I get a motion to move 12.1 and 12.2? So moved. Second. All in favor, raise your hands, and that's unanimous. Thank you. We are moving on to item 13. Can I get a motion to move 13-1 and 13-2 in block? Move in block. Second. All in favor, raise your hands, and that's unanimous with those present. 13.1, appointment to ethics panel. Mm. Can I get a motion to approve? I move approval of Stuart Rick. Second. All in favor, raise your hands. And that's unanimous with those present. Any new business items? Mr. Kim has his light on. He must have a new business item. No? <laughs> he's, he's waiting he's for the, the second for agenda. I mean, uh, for adjournment. <laughs> item 14 is for informational purposes only. Can I get a motion to adjourn? Move adjournment. I could not be more proud. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, it's your last meeting. Yeah. Oh, look, it went late for you. <laughs> That's unanimous with those present. We are adjourned. Just make sure you don't. <laughs>